Silverstone, the home of British motor racing, is the venue for the second race in this year's Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup. And with over 50 cars on track, it promises to be quite a spectacle. It was too at Monza, and it began with a bang as Guy Smith went for a gap from the second row of the grid. There was contact with the front row starting Lamborghini, and drama ensued. It left a number of damaged cars trackside and a race stop to make sure that everybody was OK and to clear the circuit of debris as well as damaged cars. The race, though, when it restarted, would turn out to be a battle between Lamborghini and Ferrari. Up front, the Grassa Racing Team number 63 car led the way. Other Lamborghinis from the AM Cup, such as Ben Ardelhe's car, not so lucky. Robert Renault was going rapidly in the Herbert Motorsport Porsche. Fisichella, Giocchi, Calado, Ferrari was another one, creeping its way up the order, battling with the surviving Bentley, number eight. Others were showing signs of damage from earlier on, the Aka ASP Mercedes having been involved in the battles. And so too was the Kaspersky Motorsport Ferrari, and it battled on. In Pro-Am, meantime, Ahmad al Harfi was going strongly with the Aston Martin, the main opposition, the Kessel Racing Ferrari and Michael Bronizeski. The Herbert Motorsport Porsche was soldiering on in class as the SMP Racing Ferrari started to show its hand for overall honours. Great battles raged across all the classes. An 84 Mercedes from the HTP Motorsport team was another one making its way into contention. But so too was the Giocchi, Calado, Fisichella Ferrari, and that would be there or thereabouts come flag fall. Bentley number eight, busy working its way up the order, getting ahead of the orange team Lazarus Lamborghini as it ran wide going into the first chicane. Ahmad al Harfi's Aston Martin was still looking well placed in Pro Am, but there was no stopping the GRT Grasser Racing Team Lamborghini up front as Matt Parry became very defensive in his Nissan. And when Johnny Adam took over the TF Sport Oman Racing Team Aston Martin, he had one task in mind to win the class. The ISR Audi had run well all weekend and was still in the mix, but gradually the Davide Rigon Ferrari started to drop back and in a big hurry was now number 15 Ferrari. Alessandro Pierguidi installed in it as Johnny Adam dived up the inside of the Kessel Racing Ferrari to take over the lead of Pro-Am. But up front there was just no stopping the leading Lamborghini and it would come through to secure a win. Christian Engelhardt, Andrea Calderelli and Mirko Bortolotti, an Italian car winning at an Italian circuit. And three delighted drivers on the podium. So now to the UK and Bentley keen for a home win. Andy Suchek, one of the drivers aboard number eight. We didn't really have a very easy start of the year. Um, our hopes are obviously to have both cars uh, right at the top uh, and uh, finally be able to fight for, for the podium with uh, both of them. Uh, as you said, it's uh, weather depending and uh, you never know what Silverstone can do, but uh, if it's dry, I'm sure we will be competitive. Another British brand on the grid is Jaguar, the Emil Frey Racing Jaguars. Two cars and one of them driven by the rapid Spaniard Albert Costa. Car is great, we, we never show the real potential because I we've been very unlucky with some different issues of just bad luck. As in Monza that uh, we had a problem in the in the engine and I had to stop when I was driving and already on top 10. So hopefully this, this weekend we, we change the, the bad luck in a good luck and we can finish in a good result finally. A winner a week ago in the DTM, Jamie Green is here as a GT racer this weekend having to adapt to a very different sort of race car. I'm not underestimating how tough this championship is, it's very close, there's a lot of cars on track and it's very different in you know, having 60 cars, there's going to be traffic. So I've still got a lot to learn as a GT driver and as an endurance driver. So I'm not underestimating that challenge. But Stuart finished second last weekend with Robin Frins and um, Jake's quick. So I think we've got a strong team and uh, we can challenge for, for the podium. Silverstone tends to be a fairly kind circuit as far as Nissan is concerned. There's always the possibility of a victory here outright for Alex Bunkham and he's eager to do well on home soil after a very frustrating start to the season at Monza. Well, we're looking to come back strong in uh, car 23 uh, here at Silverstone this weekend. We had a, a very poor weekend at, uh, in, you know, in Monza for the first round and it all just stemmed from our qualifying really. We just couldn't get the pace out of the car, which is really strange because uh, historically we've always been, you know, extremely fast in Monza. You know, last year we were, we were P2 on the grid and this year we were P30. Lamborghini enjoying an excellent start to the season, not only in terms of sprint race wins, but in the Endurance Cup as well. And Mirko Bortolotti comes to Silverstone with hopes high. It's obviously our goal to, uh, to keep the lead in the championship. Uh, Thanks to two very good weekends uh, in, uh, in Brands Hatch and Monza, we managed to, to get in the, in the 
in the points lead. So obviously that's our our main main goal is to continue uh, on that way. Even though it's still a very long uh, se uh, season to go, we are still only at the let's say the, the initial part of the season. So every point counts for us. That's clear. Uh, we want to be on top of the of the of the standings at the end of the year. But uh, obviously we are not complaining to be leading the championship at this stage. Spanish driver Danny Jukidea has made the move away from the DTM to GT racing, still for Mercedes, and has found a very happy home. Every championship I join I want to do the best I can and uh, that's of course winning. We are racing in a pro car, we are racing, I'm racing with two strong drivers, racing for Mercedes-Benz, uh, which is a strong, strong car in the field I have to say. And, uh, I want, to be, I want to be at least a contender of both Blank Pinch and T-Series Championship. Johnny Adam was one of the stars of Monza. His excellent final stint giving him the fastest lap of the race and a Pro-Am win. So, one of the chances of another here at Silverstone. I think obviously having a bit of circuit knowledge around here does help, especially when the weather is mixed. Um, lines in the wet, you know, offline, places like that really make a difference. But this is our home home circuit for Aston Martin at Silverstone. And it's a circuit that the car normally goes well at. Last year we had our first podium in Blancpain uh, with this car. So normally the circuit does suit the strengths of the Aston really well. And it's just nice to race in front of the home crowds here at Silverstone. There's an extra car to look for this weekend in the AM Cup. This McLaren doing the Silverstone race by way of a test programme for the Spa 24 hours. It should go well here, it should go well there. And one of the drivers behind the wheel is motoring journalist Chris Harris. The objective feeling of driving the car is that it's a great racing car, built agile, it's light, it's responsive, it's everything I'd expect it to be. It's got loads of downfalls at high speed, but it's very good in low speed corners, doesn't feel like it's got too tight a differential, all that stuff. But most importantly, I'm sitting here and I've got McLaren on the jumper and I'm driving a, road, you know, a proper McLaren racing car. I never thought that would happen, so I'm a bit kind of pinch myself. Is this happening? Opposition to the McLaren in the AM Cup comes inevitably from Ferrari. And this car has behind the wheel of it, David Perel. And Ferrari, hard to beat last time out at Monza. I love driving, but what I love more than driving is competing and knowing that I'm competing against the best GD drivers in the world. That sort of measurement for me best things ever. And so the scene is set as we get ready for the second Endurance Cup race of the season here at Silverstone. It's the full drawn pre-circuit that we're using. It's the old pit lane, if you like, the heritage pit, so the conventional start and finish area. The sun is doing its best to shine. There are still a few clouds. We had a little bit of rain uh, this morning, lots of rain on Friday. But as far as the teams are concerned, they've had dry running all weekend. And now we get set for what promises to be another enthralling race because we've had some great racing thus far in both endurance and sprint. And with 55 cars set to take the start, anything can happen. We've got this great battle between the brands. Bentley is a previous winner at Silverstone, and both numbers seven and eight, the Continental GT3s, hoping for better fortune here. McLaren, of course, looking to go well. So too Aston Martin, as the M Sport team push the car through to the front of the grid. And at the very front is the pole sitting Mercedes. Danny Junkadea did the time. Let's hear from him, along with John Watson. Daniel Junkadella, stunning pole position, but Daniel, at what cost? <laughs> well, I mean, all out. Daniel, what I mean is, did you use two sets of tyres, new tyres or one? Yeah, we did, we did use two sets of tyres and, uh, you know, at Silverstone you have to go all out. I think we, we had a, a good car, strong car for qualifying and we don't have such a strong car on the straight line to overtake, so I think uh, getting the max out of qualifying was, was a good decision and we'll see if it pays out. Well, starting in pole position can't get any better, but Tristan Vautier, you're going to be in second or third? Uh, third. I'm last, so hopefully... Hey, hey, has he left you any new tyres? Are you going to have to be the best of the rest? Uh, maybe I will have new tyres. I'm not 100% sure, but hopefully these guys have a big lead when they give me the car and I have it easy and I can just bring it home. Uh, we'll see. Maybe it will not be that easy. Uh, but no, it's good. The car's been strong. Danny had a mega lap, very clean, uh, fast, strong lap. So, so we'll see. Really looking forward to the fights. We look forward to it too. Many thanks. So the two Acker ASP Mercedes drivers get ready then with Felix Sarales being the start driver in that car. Chris Harris making sure that his McLaren and all the other uh, Stracker racing cars are in good order. Very casual at the moment, still in civvies ready for his stint. So uh, stint two or perhaps more likely stint three. Chris Harris no mean driver 
as the national anthem is played in the background here at Silverstone for the sole British endurance round. Of course, the Sprint Cup was at Brands Hatch a week ago, and this a very different form of race, but it could still be a Lamborghini win like at Brands Hatch. Let's catch up with the GRT team and Watty. Mirko, front row of the grid, but I had you down as my pole man. What went wrong? Well, it's super competitive, super close. Uh, it's not always pole, but first row is still good for us. Uh, obviously, I would have liked to be on pole. Catched a little bit of traffic in the last sector. I think I lost a little bit there. I don't know if it would have been enough. Um, but OK, it's a good starting position. We will try to, to go for it again. OK, tell me, what was the rationale in having you start as opposed to maybe doing the final stint? Uh, well, we have a solid, strong driver's lineup. So at the end of the day, it uh, doesn't matter who starts or who does which kind of stint. Uh, we are, you know, in a good shape. And uh, we just took that de decision to, to put me in the car for the start. I've done the, the most blanc pen starts, let's say, in the, in the championship. So uh, I, know, I know how it works and uh, try to make the best out of it. Bet you will. Christian Engelhardt, were you in second or third? We have to find this out just to... Yeah, we have to find it out. I think... Do you know um, where you're starting? Are you second or third in the car? Uh, we, we, we have a plan, but of course, you can always, always change the plan also. It's a flexible plan, and we don't want to share the plan well, with you everybody. You told your team at Andrea, do you know where you're second or third in or not, Andrea? I'm flexible like him. <laughs> Two flexible boys, front row of the grid, sounds a good deal to me. Yeah, trust as well. You happy with it? Yeah. Andrea? Yeah, for sure it's going to be a hard race, but uh, with, the, with the strategy we have, I think uh, we can do a very good result. From the flexible Lamborghini 63, have a good result. Thank you. Good try, John. Well done to try and get the driver rotation out of number 63 so uh, the only confirmed thing is that they use one set of tyres in qualifying but we know that it's Mirko Bortolotti who will start on the outside of row one third on the grid he's going to be Font Pereira in the Mercedes we'll have a walk through the grid when it's empty of people and just completely full of cars 55 of them stretching a long way back and looking out of the box window on the outside of Woodcote Corner I can't see any gaps on the grid but we've not really had anybody in the walls particularly other than Oliver Morley who's Mercedes AMG was in the wall yesterday but was repaired and out in qualifying this morning so all good there let's have a walk down the grid a bit further and go to Pro-Am where Jules Gounon starts on class pole position Jules Gounon it looks to me like you've inherited your dad's jeans <laughs> yeah. and I don't mean his Levi's yeah no I mean if we if we we talk about the quality we are quite happy about what we did and now we are just uh, we, we need to, to do a clean race. We are running in Pro-Am, I mean, so we don't need to fight too much with the Pro. Just going straight and try to do like my father. Good job. <laughs> well, absolutely, but lead Pro-Am car, very impressive. But in reality, you still want to have a pop at the leading cars, the Pro cars, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt the Sector 1 was purple and from my from my lap. So, I mean, quality is done. We have nothing to do about that. So, just now, head, head, and let's see what we can do. Well, get in and enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you inherited his father's speed and his very musical way of talking as well and uh, Jules Gounot, son of Jean-Marc, gets ready to go in number 87, 23 is going to be started uh, by Lucas Ordonev who was fastest in his qualifying session in Q1 but uh, frustratingly for Alex Buncombe out came the red flag when he was on a demon flying lap right at the very end so the car unable to really progress up the order so uh, we'll see come the opening stint what progress Ordonez can make through the traffic and this is part of the problem I know it's a three-hour race and therefore you could argue you don't need to be at the front but you do want to be away from all the cars around you look what happened at Monza somebody else's moment can trigger all sorts of dramas for you so you'd like to be as far up the grid as possible and away from any potential trouble number 59 McLaren could be another one to watch Jasmine Jafar starts and he won here last year when he was a Mercedes driver so the Malaysian will take the first driving duties just over his shoulder is 58 which will have Rob Bell to start number eight Bentley there Vincent Abril will go first and just behind him is Jamie Green starting in number 17 Merce uh, number 17 Audi now there's Bentley eight for Bentley seven Stephen Kane always one of the stars he's with John Stephen they say there's a nicer class of people at the back of the field but I'm happy seeing you up here with the seven Bentley yeah it's um it's obviously great being up at the front um we're starting in a pretty good position um, we know that we're pretty good in the race, so hopefully we can translate it on our home race here at Silverstone. Bentley won here, I think, two years ago. Yeah, it's good memories, and to do it here in a Bentley and the BRDC is great, but uh, we need to do it again today, and obviously Guy's the right man to be starting, and uh, all he's going to do is first race with us, and uh, it's going to be great. 
what's it going to take to win this race? Because competition is so intense now. Yeah, it's the you know this championship's become really competitive. You know, there's so many good drivers, good teams, and you know it's going to be a whole team effort. No mistakes, um, good pit stops, and good strategy, and you know pumping in them lap times when it's needed. So you're going to have to pick up the bits for the last stint as usual. Well, we'll, we'll we're all triers, and I'll definitely be trying at the end. I know you will. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. <laughs> so Stephen Kane makes his way off into the pit lane as you look at the two Jaguars for the uh, Emil Frey Racing Squad, which will both be pretty competitive, one hopes, around here. It was at Silverstone, they got their first ever uh, podium a couple of years ago, and then uh, come the end of that season, uh, managed to take a class win at the Nürburgring. So it's a place that has happy memories, and of course, Jaguar, a British brand. There's the Kaspersky Motorsport Ferrari in the hands for the uh, opening stint uh, of... Uh, Marco Ciocci, he was also the driver that was out in the first qualifying session in that car as well. There's the Pro-Am winning Aston Martin from Monza. Johnny Adam just giving last minute uh, guidance to Ahmad Al-Hafi, the Amman driver alongside his Bentley 7, which will have Guy Smith going first. Guy was saying to me before the race that they uh, they used two sets of new tyres in Q3 for Stephen Kane, so he's going to have to start on old rubber, and the, the tyre does seem to drop off after four or five laps, but then it's relatively progressive. So tyre management, I think, given that 31 laps can be crammed into a stint, could be quite important in this. We'll see how those that have used lots of tyres already fare. We know that the Lamborghini has an extra set at its disposal just because they were quite happy to sacrifice Q1 and Q2, uh, and then it was in Q3 where the work was done. So we have... Three hours ahead of us, five minutes to go to the start of the formation lap. And let's have a look down the grid where you see Felix Serratis, Mercedes on pole position and Mirko Bortolotti alongside. Then it is the uh, Font Pereira Mercedes, Victor Scheitas Ferrari on the outside, the third row. Jules Gounon in the Mercedes, Alessandro Pierguidi in the yellow Ferrari. Go back a row, there's Adrian Amstutz starting in the yellow Lamborghini with Yelma Berman's white Mercedes AMG alongside. Eduardo Motara's Mercedes is next and alongside is the green Ferrari of Daniel Karlwitz. Then you'll find the Aston Martin, number 97. It's Ahmad al Hafi who goes first and alongside him. The Bentley, number seven, Guy Smith at the helm. The Kaspersky Ferrari comes next. Marco Ciocci at the wheel, and 22 is Struan Moore alongside. Then Christian Klein in number 114, and the sister car started by Stefan Ortelli. The two Jaguars with behind them, Fabian Schiller, and alongside in 89 is Daniele Perfetti. Then it is uh, the Mercedes, the Lamborghini rather, of the orange team Lazarus, Andrea Piccini alongside, ahead of Dries Vantor and Lucas Ordonez. Jasmine Jafal's McLaren comes next alongside Kenneth Heyer. Then it's Frank Stippler with Rob Bell lining up alongside. Vincent Abriel in the Bentley with Mark Rostan in the number 26 Audi for company. Jamie Green is next with Mike Skeen in the Mercedes AMG alongside him. Bertrand Baguette for Lamborghini is alongside Philip Eng's BMW. The sister car of Marcus Paltela has Nick Homerson alongside. He's got a server stop go early in the race. We'll come to it in a moment. Giorgio Maggi as Lamborghini and Robert Renault's Porsche are next ahead of David Perel and Konstantin Lendudis. Then it's Christian Metzel's BMW, Leo Machitsky in the Lamborghini ahead of Michael Bronizeski and Stefan Richelme there in the green and silver Audi. Then it's Johnny Kane with Miguel Toril alongside in the blue repaired Mercedes AMG. Oliver Webb's McLaren and Pierre Eretz Ferrari next ahead of Ezequiel Perez Compank and Stefano Constantini. Josh Cagill's Audi is alongside Ishikawa Motoaki. Then it's Scott Heckert in the yellow Mercedes with Alexander West's McLaren alongside. Emmanuel Vinca is on the inside of the penultimate row with Matthias Henkeler alongside and Bernard Delhay rounds out the grid. That is 55 cars. Now you can understand why everyone gets so excited about the Blancpain GT Series. That is a quality grid and with two drivers in some but three drivers in most cars uh, it's like a who's who of GT racing and the grid now being cleared of the final engineers at the very front uh, of the pole sitting car stands the race director Alain Adon with the green flag and he will wave the cars away then he'll make his way up towards the gantry for the end of the warming up lap and switch the lights to green assuming he is happy with the formation of the grid when they come out of Luffield and then will be good to go racing promises to be Another fascinating race, this, and we've seen the best of the Mercedes. They've been good all morning, and lots of them up at the pointy end of the grid, not just in terms of pro, but pro-am as well. John making the point that Jules Gounon fifth is on the pro-am pole, and we will see how he fares in his opening stint of the race up against the likes of Fort Pereira and uh, Felix Arales, the Puerto Rican driver, who in his Formula 3 days had quite a nasty uh, off here. 
was forced wide over the curb and did his backside injury. So uh, Felix Rale is hoping for better fortune now that he's in the GT car as the field it works away. Off the grid, down towards Cops Corner. So the final warming up lap, the green flag lap underway. A last chance to get some temperature into the Pirelli tyres, get the pressures up. Not the start of the race, that happens next time around. They will bunch up into the 2x2 two two formation as Felix Herrades goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mirko Bortolotti on the front row of the grid. Front Pereira and the Russian driver Victor Shahita are alongside on row two. Then the third row is Jules Gounon and Alessandro Pierre Guidi, who is starting this time in number 50 Ferrari. Behind him will come Adrian Amstutz and then Yelma Berman. And there's one car, is that the Garage 59 McLaren that's not got away? The Alexander West car, yes, I think it is. The grid scrolls through, we'll come back to that in a second, but number 188 McLaren, by the look of it, is going to have to be pushed off the grid, and it is 188. If it starts at all, it will have to start from the pits. So, Alexander West, a pit lane starter. The rest of the field are already down at the end of Vale. Just picking back up on the grid, Fabian Schiller lining up with uh, Nicholas Polas, Lamborghini 19th on the grid. He will be alongside Andrea Piccini. Next row is Dries Vanthor and Lucas Ordonier. Then you've got Jasmine Jafar and Kenneth Hyatt. Hans Hyatt's son on the next row ahead of Frank Stippler and Rob Bell, who's going to be in a big hurry to make some progress up the order. Jamie Green a little bit further back. And uh, then we will have also another man to watch, Bertrand Baguette and Philip Eng, in fact, alongside him. Uh, two more guns who will be looking to make good progress early doors. Through they come out of farm. And there you can see the pole sitting car, the uh, number on the windscreen, just in case you've not followed an endurance blanc pan race for a while, is the Lumirac display. So it's not the car number, it is the class position number. So it's where they are in class. And the idea being, of course, as the race goes through the pit stops and there's plenty of lapper, you can look at where uh, the car is in its class by the identification on the windscreen. It's not the overall position though, it is the class position and different colors for different classes. Still the grid scrolls through. We've got as far as Pierre Erat, who's 46th, alongside Oliver Webb, having his uh, Stracker Racing McLaren debut. And then Ezequiel Perez Compank next as the field worked through. Josh Cagill, former bike racer, turning his attention to international GT racing uh, this season, is uh, another man to watch coming up from the rear of the grid as they now accelerate their way in this two by two formation down towards Brooklands. So there, Alexander West makes his way to the end of the pit lane. He cannot join in until everybody else has gone through the first corner. And we are about to go racing then. So we're looking at about 31 laps to a stint. He can't do more than 65 minutes unless there is a safety car. And from what we've been told by some of the drivers, the tyre does start to drop off after four or five laps. Then you've got to manage it and it will after that drop off slowly and gradually but there is uh, a little bit of deterioration so the drivers have to cope with that the temperature's not too high it's still a bit blustery outside as well all of these different factors plus inevitably traffic and the different battles with the different brands and how the BOP will affect certain cars around here we're about to find some of the answers to those questions as to who can come out on top of round two of the Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup at Silverstone on pole position Felix Sorales makes his way up towards the timing line he almost leans on Mirko Bortolotti we wait for the lights to go green which they will do any moment on his toes he's from Pereira on the second row of the grid they blast away now down towards Cops Corner and the clock has not started I don't think the race director has given it the go ahead, he hasn't, so because of the way the cars were coming up to the line, the race director not happy, an extra formation lap. Indeed, and there is a new curriculum in town, and the front two cars have been clearly advised that they must not, at any point coming up to the lights going from red to green, exceed 90 kilometers per hour. Ideally, it's between 80 and 90 kilometers per hour. The grid very, very tightly packed indeed, as you saw. The 88 Mercedes coming across in the 63 Lamborghini. Well, that wasn't in the script. There is race director Alain Adam. And as a follow-up from what we've seen in Monza and what we had in Mizano, any kind of driver ill-discipline is going to be pounced upon. So everybody is on their toes from the race director's office, the stewards, to the competitors. So all that adrenaline that was literally pouring out of every pore in their body. Watch again. Look at and see. The 84 Mercedes slightly out of position, but the 88 particularly, it's a full car width towards the left, where it should have been a full car width back on the right-hand side of the track as the driver was here. There's the Aston, that's the BMW going wide, because all of a sudden it all backed up, contact with the Mercedes, 
Is that one of the bar well Lamborghinis as well? Just, just yeah, so. very, very, very light contact. Now, everybody has spread out. Still in the formation lap. And the clock has started as well. It didn't initially, but it has now started. So the race is actually underway. Uh, effectively so, but this is still counted as a formation lap. I'm assuming that when they get to Wellington Strait, Felix Serralis will have to slow and get Mirko Bortolotti back up alongside him. So the cars counting this lap within the three hours, but it's not a proper racing lap, if that makes sense. It is a lap within the race, but you can't overtake. You are meant to be still in grid order. And I would imagine, as we saw at Monza, that the plan would be for now the drivers on Wellington Strait get themselves in the two by two formation. That would be the assumption, but certainly uh, they're doing anything but that right now. They're just over halfway around the racetrack coming up towards Aintree Corner, then onto the, the back straight. This is the field filtering its way. The field is probably about the best part of half a mile long. Here they are, they are side by side. And so the drivers make their way. They're now down towards Brooklands. The teams are being advised that the drivers must drive over their white, well, it says pit boxes. I think it means grid boxes. In other words, the markers on the track. So you've got to stay in that side-by-side -side formation. You can't do as, for example, Serrales was doing, moving across one way, Frank Pereira going another. You must remain in that two-by-two -two proper formation, not dart left or right. So that was the untidiness that prompted Alain Adam to not release them. This is a lap that has counted within the three hours. We'll try again. They come up to Woodcote and take two for round two of the Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup at Silverstone. Felix Serrales and Mirko Bortolotti on the front of the grid. The second row from Pereira and Victor Scheitar. They come now then through Woodcote corner. The back of the pack still trying to catch the front in a sense. There's a big gap about sort of two thirds through the order. But are we going to be good for a start this time around? The lights on red go green. It is blast off and a good start by Bortolotti from the outside of the front row. Charging through from Pereira, but Bortolotti sweeps around the outside. Felix Serrano slots in behind him in second place. Third is going to be Pereira. Fourth is Shaitar. And this is Stephen Kane, who is on the money straight away, trying to work his way up through the traffic. The Bentley powering towards Maggots as third. On the inside there goes Victor Shaitar ahead of Front Pereira. Next up is Alessandro Pierguini, but Mirko Bortolotti leads the way. Clean start, got the advantage into Cop's corner. Planned on somebody's skull off in the middle of Beckett's. Can't see whose car that is. But it is an absolute motorway traffic jam as one of the Lamborghinis jumps back on track Adrian at Chapel Kirk. It's the Barwell car. It's the that Amstutz was a car that was on the third row of the grid. Fourth exactly. row of the grid. Yeah, so row four for Amstutz. Indeed so. So he's got a lawn mowering. But Amstutz is back on as the leaders work their way. They're now through Stowe Corner for the first time. And it is Mirko Bortolotti leading the way. Felix Ferrari second in third place then. You've got Victor Shaita in the SMP Racing Ferrari. And they hustle their way to the end of our Marco Ciocci there, dropping back a little bit in the Kaspersky Ferrari. Ahmad al Harthi tucked up behind him as they now start to work their way through Club Corner. Speed building. So this is the exit where you can get caught out, an opportunity to get alongside another car. Take away the Nissan. Is that the 23, 22 Nissan? 23. 23. So that has taken the position. So they are looking at this earliest opportunity. They were disappointed Alex Buncombe didn't get to complete his flying lap on a set of new tyres because of a red flag. So he's trying to make up ground as quickly as possible on a set of tyres that are pretty fresh. That's an advantage, certainly in the opening laps. But Mirko Bortolotti has already pulled the best part of maybe a second and a bit as we look at the 84 Mercedes trying to slide down. Yes, it does into Brooklyn's good clean pass, but the 50 Ferrari as well, Pierre Luigi, or Alessandro Pierre Guidi, in the 50 Ferrari, he starts the race for the AF Corsa entry, also making it a two-way Ferrari battle. And we've got drive-through penalties already. One of them is number 36, Matthias Henkeler. Another is for the number 16 Mercedes of Miguel Torrell. That's the Oliver Morley car. Yeah, these are penalties that were dished out after the end of qualifying, but are now being served out once the race is underway. So it's a little bit of housekeeping to ensure that the penalties are actually having a meaningful effect it's a new regime, as I say, a new order. And also, I touched on it on the grid, there's a drive-through penalty going, sorry, a stop-go penalty going the way of Pete Homerson for being involved 
being the cause of the accident that put the Oliver Morley Mercedes in the barriers yesterday. That's at the race director's discretion. So he will announce when that is to be served as the leaders come down Hanger Straight then. At the end of lap one, Bortolotti led Serrales by 1.2 seconds. Their third is Pereira. Pierre Guidi at the inside. Can't do it. Victor Scheintag closes the door. The two Ferraris run together, both out of the AF Corsa stable, but the SMP racing car keeps the spirit of race entry at bay. Sixth is Jules Gounon, seventh is Yelma Berman. But John and I got here bright and early this morning, and about half past seven, there was a lone Yelma Berman Dutch flag in the grandstand opposite the pit, so he's got some support here this weekend. Eighth is Carl Vitz, ninth is Guy Smith, and then tenth is Drew and Moore. But this is the battle of the Ferrari, the Ferrari and the Mercedes, and that will get a little bit feisty because they're fight battling. To get, they need to get clear. The key is in these opening laps to get that clear air on board with the 333 Ferrari. Currently, that is done in eighth place. Daniel Kilovitz behind the wheel. Drive through being given to Daniele Perfetti, and the stop go now being announced for Nick Homerson as there. Pierre Guidi ahead of Shaitan, moving up into third, into fourth place rather. That starts to try and bring down the gap against Front Pereira up the road. But Mirko Bortolotti. Doesn't matter whether it's a twisty place like Brands Hatch or a fast open circuit like Silverstone, whether it's sprint or endurance, the Lamborghini at the moment is the go-to car, isn't it? Absolutely, but Jules Gounon, look at him also in the 87 Mercedes, trying to dive down the inside of the Ferrari. He's got company behind him, he needs to be very careful not to leave a gap for the number four Mercedes to take advantage. But now that Alessandro Pierguidi has got clear, I would expect to see the gap between third place Frank Pereira Fourth place, Alessandro Pierguidi, currently one and a half seconds. That has to close down because uh, Frank Pereira, he's involved in his own little battle for that top position. So we're on to lap number four then. The first lap being another formation lap, so not a proper racing lap as the cars file through. Gunon leading in Pro-Am. There, look in the Mercedes with the uh, yellow strip across the top of the windscreen. Daniel Carvitz and the Ferrari next. And then third in Pro-Am, where's the Aston there? Arman al Harfi goes through, so the... Mercedes AMG GT3 to give it its full title in the hands of Jules Gounon. Leading the class there is 23, which is the Nissan. Lucas Ordonyev starting 17th here. You're on board with him now. So down hanger straight, and he's going to hang in there as best he can. He's got Yasmin Jafar ahead of him in the McLaren. Straight line speed probably favours the Nissan. The McLaren, of course, mid engine car, slightly different BOP. But uh, the sister car, the 22 car, Strawn Moore currently in 10th place, so Nissan, they didn't get the best qualifying misfortunes because of timing, but they're beginning, it'll be a long process, they just got to be careful in these opening laps, not to overuse the car, it's easy to overuse the rear tyre particularly, by just trying to be too eager too soon, if you, if you haven't got a clear shot then just look after your car and look after your tyres. Race leaders lap 4, and now Alessandro Pierre Guidi doing absolute best in sectors. He is the quickest man in sector one now that he's got up past the SMP racing Ferrari. But look at the lead Bortolotti has got. It was 2.2 seconds last time. This is what he did at Monza, cleared off into the distance. I mean, it, it did it at Brands Hatch in the sprint yeah. event as well. I mean, whatever they're doing at Grasso Racing and whatever Lamborghini is doing, they have got a, a really outstanding race car on all kinds of racetracks. Monza, very high speed. Brands Hatch, high speed, but much more of a roadside. Silverstone, high speed as well. Now in ninth place in class is Stefan Ortelli there. He's 11th overall because he's got a couple of Pro-Am entries up the road ahead of him, but he's chasing the Stuart Moore-driven Nissan as they work their way over the timing line. The lead gap shooting up is now up to 3.3 seconds as the cars work their way through Cops Corner. So Bortolotti leads, Sorrell is second, Perfetti is third, Pierre Guidi is fourth, there's Marco Giocci who is in 13th place overall in the Kaspersky Ferrari, turning his way out of Cops Corner. Remember, we're looking at pit stops round about the hour mark, so the clock ticks on down, and the team is working on 31 laps within a stint here. Still a very, very busy racetrack. Still drivers trying to use their start to gain some advantage. Others looking to consolidate because, well, that's maybe their best option. And as Jules Gounon said, we are in a race for the Pro-Am category. We're not racing the Pro cars, but it is inevitable. The pace that Jules Gounon has got, he's shown it all season with the Mercedes-Benz, or the Mercedes-AMG GT3s, as they are actually now correctly known as. He's got great natural pace. A drama already for Rover Racing, because Marcus Paltola has made a pit stop already. So that wasn't for a drive-through, that was for a problem. Uh, and Marcus Paltola is down now at the very foot of the times, 55th place, and he's two laps adrift already. So. Not quite sure what it was that struck him early doors, but the BMWs have had a torrid time here. Yeah, I mean, they're, 
in that initial start, which was then abandoned, there was contact in the BMW, or one oh, of the yeah, BMWs, yeah. I did see, yeah, right. completely off track, going through gravel. Now, maybe he picked up something that led to an issue that has now required him to enter the pits and uh, lose so much time. You may be right, it could well have been that car, yes. Good spot, John, thank you. Right, Let race leaders on lap five. Wide goes Giocci. Gap between the top two, 3.3 seconds. Guy Smith has been warned about track limits at turn one, which in old money is cops. And there to the inside line comes Giocci. He's having a go against the number 90. Uh, Eduardo, Marta, Eduardo Mortara Mercedes. That's the car just up the road ahead of him as they work their way now through Luffield. Edo Mortara switching not only from DTM to GT, but also, of course, from Audi to Mercedes for this season. So he comes now through Woodcup over the timing line as an Acker ASP, Jean-Luc Bobelink there in the middle, watches on. Yeah, I mean, that's a strong car, the 90. got three strong drivers, Michael Meadows, as well as Raffaele Martiello. So, again, one of those cars that, right now, it's not running at the very front, it's running down in 12th place, but there's still two and three-quarter hours of this race to go, and... Other than what we're seeing from the 63 Lamborghini, assuming they have a trouble-free run, all the other places so easily can be made up during those driver changes, refueling, tyre wheel changes, and that's where the more structured teams usually gain an advantage. What we're not seeing, David, we're not. Where's the first Audi looking down to see timing and scoring? That's a good question. Uh, 19 French Dippler. Can't believe it's that far down. I have a horrible feeling. Let's have a look. They work their way down towards Stipper is the, 19th indeed. Yeah, down towards the end of Vale. So what a... That's a you know, I'm sort of almost speechless because that's not what we're familiar with, to see how it is that far down. But this, of course, going back to my point, it's not what happens now, it's what happens at the end of the race. There is Stipper turning his way through. And running behind Lucas Ordonian, so 19th he is. The next is going to be Dries Vantor in 22nd place. Now, the battle is taking up for second place, isn't it? Now, Felix Sorales being caught by Front Pereira, who's defected from Audi to Mercedes AMG for this year. He's taking Alessandro Pierguini with him. Gap back, Victor Scheitar comes through. Fizz, Jogunon sixth, Yama Berman seventh. So we've got the Ferraris, which didn't really look that quick yesterday in the free practice sessions, uh, and the Mercedes at the moment doing the chasing against the Lamborghini. But it's, I know we keep saying how well the, the Lambos are going or how well GRT is doing as a team, but actually it's one lone Lamborghini up there with all of these Ferraris and Mercedes chasing after it. Well, that, that is true. In fairness, I think if you took the driver line up, the talent that's in the 63 car, and put it into any of the other Lamborghinis, you would find a performance increase. So while the car is outstanding, I do think that that partnership of, of uh, Mirko Bortolotti Christian Engelhardt and Andrea, Ch uh, Andrea Ciocci is a very, very strong. And you think forward to our next endurance round at Paul Ricard, six hour race, going into darkness, new discipline, looking forward to that. A different type of race altogether. And as you say, going into the dark, another challenge for the drivers. And it's a bit of pre Spa 24 testing. Now, now race well, leaders work lap seven. What have you spotted? Just, just Andy Green in the uh, 17. All the way, Andy Green. Jamie. Down at, sorry? Jamie. Jamie Green, Andy Green, his brothers, Jamie Green. Jamie, all the way down, and 30th, he, don't, he doesn't even know a race he's been in with 30 cars. Well, that's a good point, Matt, because there aren't 30 cars in the DTM, are there? Uh, so, working his way in a moment through Stoke Corner, you're on board with Lucas Ordonez, 18. Uh, he is running 18th place, Lucas Ordonez tucked up behind Andrea Piccini, is there as a challenge. So, in 8.88, Ferrari, as they turn their way through Stoke Corner, David Perel, but why is the man filter... Mercedes dropped so far back in the pack. Down they come towards the end of Vale. David Perel leading the Am Cup at the moment. And a good strong effort this is. Alexander West second in class up from the pit lane. Kenneth Hire in the man filter Mercedes turning his way now uh, through 28th place out of Club Corner. But uh, to be 29th out of 55 starters in an Am Cup Ferrari as David Perel is, that's a mega job, isn't it? It's a very strong job. I mean, there are a lot of talented amateurs out there, and I think Alexander West, who's running second in the class, in the McLaren, starting from the pit, I mean, he's made really excellent progress as well. And uh, to some extent, you have to say that uh, Alexander West in the, this one-off entry for this race, Garage 59, Alexander West, Chris Harris, the journalist, now TV presenter, racing driver, Chris Goodwin, who is heavily involved in the development of the road car product from McLaren. That's, could, that could be a little sleeper yeah, in be. that AM category. I think you're right, actually, yeah. 
So as the race leaders go on to lap eight, we've got 4.7 seconds between the top two, but second, third and fourth is where the battle's going to come from, I think, now, with Sorales ahead of front Pereira and then Alessandro Pierguidi. Now, in terms of the overall situation, is there a sleeper? For example, how is Guy Smith doing in the Bentley? He's 13 seconds back at the moment. Onto the hangar straight, Pierre Guidi looking a bit closer to Pereira than Pereira is to Serrales. Yeah, I think for Guy Smith, he just he's in relatively clear air, and what he wants to try and do is maintain that, but he's got the 22 Nissan. They were literally not on more than a couple of seconds behind. He needs to be aware that about this, the 22 Nissan, he needs to be aware the pace of the Nissan, particularly at Silverstone, has been historically very strong. So he just wants to keep that nice gap, bring the car in, hand it over and then send it back out whether I think it'll be Oliver Jarvis will take that car over and then Stephen Kane as we refer to in the grid will be the last man into the number seven car as he traditionally is in endurance events the start is under investigation because it caused an extra formation lap so the team's being warned that if your driver potentially was out of position uh, then it's going to be looked at and a penalty could come. So the race director and the stewards are going to have a look at the start. And I tell you what, he won't need a white stick to make that decision with, will he? <laughs> and all the drivers now being told about respecting track limits at Turn 1 oh. and not respecting them is the 11 Pro-Am Ferrari from Kessel Racing. And that is Michael Bronizeski who is off the road. That's a stow. How did he get off there? Maybe with traffic. With some speed, I think. Well, I mean, most likely it's been the number of cars, maybe another car trying to squeeze themselves in and difficult to move a car and you don't want to really push in the rear wing because it wasn't designed to be pushed yeah. forward it's designed to have a, a, a vertical load into it not a horizontal load let's look at there we are the idea is that the 17 it was the two, two idea yeah. so that was the that's uh, Rochelle me Rochelle me yeah so uh, well, oh, wow how whoa, did that go what a good bit of well <laughs> reactionary driving for the Lamborghini to split the Audi and the Ferrari the Audi gets away with it now that's the kind of incident that will, in this new curriculum that I've been referring to, will be looked at to see if there was simply a racing incident or whether it was an avoidable incident. So we'll probably get further information. It says now, number two and 11 under investigation at turn seven, and that's immediate. And number two is a pro cut car, 11 is a pro am. So straight away, there is a difference in uh, the driver grading. You've got gold for Richelme, Bronizeski is only a bronze. And the feeling and is that the, the, the higher graded drivers ought to be mindful of the lesser drivers. The higher graded drivers were clearly made aware in the second driver briefing that took place that to give the margin to the AM driver rather than expecting it to be there and if there is contact, expecting right to be on your side. So safety way to safety car, yes, they've got to get a, a snatch vehicle to get that car. It was a localised sector, yellow, but now it's going to be a safety car. So yeah. everybody can draw breath, but actually, also draw actually, close together. Actually, I'm not sure they can, because we don't have an SC board anywhere else. I think that was just actually affixed to the marshal's post. It's still a waved yellow flag. The safety car legend is not on the screen, and there are no safety car boards or waved yellow flags anywhere else. So I think that was purely a board affixed to a marshal's post that tricked us into that. Second, third and fourth have all bunched up. And Front Pereira is going to have a look to the inside there against Felix Serrales. Alessandro Pierguini you think, go on, touch, hold yourselves up, let me buy. And all of this is playing into the hands of the brilliant Bortolotti, who is getting away up the road. The Lamborghini comes up towards Woodcut Corner. As out of Laffield come the two Mercedes AMGs and then the Ferrari 488 behind in the hands of Alessandro Pierguini. And the gap now coming across the line, six seconds between first and second. Clearly the 88 Mercedes hasn't got the pace and in the course of not having the pace it's drawn Frank Pereira and Alessandro Pierguidi right into the draft of the car we saw Pereira having a little look opportunities are few and far between but certainly there are viable ones here at Silverstone and particularly at the end of the Wellington Strait down into Brooklyn is one of the favourites difficult to do it down into Stoke that's the major corner they're going to be coming to at the end of Hangar Strait apart from which there's still a waved yellow flag so no overtaking and you must slow down marginally. Absolutely right. So the drivers get the message. Felix Serranis then in the pole starting Mercedes leads them through Stoke Corner. And there is another investigation for an incident now, which is Bernard Delhay and 89 Mercedes. Who did we put in 89 at the start? Daniele Perfetti. So the stewards, as normal, are going to be kept busy with so many cars. It's inevitable that there's going to be drama somewhere. 
and we've had a lot going on thus far. We've only had really 20 minutes, haven't we, as they come down towards Abbey, turn right, and then flick left through farm. There's the bump in the road, which uh, caused one or two incidents yesterday in other races. People hit the bump and spin. And they're running in second place, Felix Serrales now. The lead gap, six seconds. Yes, but this battle for second place. And really, it's Alessandro Piagrini in the Ferrari, the yellow Ferrari, the third of these three cars. That potentially is going to be the quickest of all three. Frank Pereira knows he's quicker than the 88. Serrales, Mercedes. If one or these two cars get ahead of the 88 car, then they'll be down the road. It's a different story getting past and just... Uh, their pace is now within the control of the second place 88 Mercedes AMG. The race leader has just put 10 laps in the book and Mirko Bortolotti way up the road as over the timing line for second, third and fourth will come Serrales, Pereira and then Pierre Guidi, Victor Scheiter still going strongly fifth, the quick Russian driver and there is Mikhail Brozniewski out of the gravel, he's yes. got damage, he's got a puncture and he's also lost about two laps at least, hasn't he? Yeah, and I mean the tyre is smoking that's uh, against bodywork, one would presume. I don't think there was any mechanical damage to the car, but obviously when a tyre gets cut down in the contact, as we saw, then rubber flails around, catches bits of bodywork, tears bits of bodywork off, and it makes a real mess just in general around the rear suspension. The yellow flag still in situ, coming down into sector two, so no overtaking still, while there there's the, the one of the vehicles, the snatch vehicles that's going back to its station behind the wall. So next lap through, this should be a clear racetrack down in sector two, down into Stoke Corner. Not a corner that I would envisage being a major overtaking opportunity, but if you get it right, and there is the 188, it's pulled over to the side of the circuit. What is going on? That's at Luffield. He's just been tapped into a spin, Alexander West, and he's beached by the side of the road with damage. That's at Luffield. We can just see it out of our window, in fact, in the distance of the uh, top of the circuit, so there's bits of bodywork off the car. And there's flames coming from the exhaust as he uh. tries to, he basically is trying to refire the engine, so there'll be a bit of spent fuel somewhere within the, the system. This is a turbocharged engine, you, you can see it's burning within the exhaust. He open the throttle and try and fire it up is the best way to do that, just... But it's hard to see. He's not actually, he's only got two wheels on the gravel, the left yeah. wheels. So if he can get it fired, then he can get it rolling again, but it's a matter of whether the marshal just look and see, this is the onboard shot, watch for the car to be pivoted around, there it is, the whack from the rear, oh, oh, very nice too, bodywork comes off the Mercedes as a consequence, so now more assistance needed, they cannot get the car, there's resets on these cars to enable them to go back to basics, reset, fire it up again, but not the case for Alexander West. Big shame, because it's got a lap down, and you were right saying it was a sleeper in the AM cut, but sadly, it's having a very long rest at the moment while it's in the gravel. Uh, still, I have to say, the standout driver for me of this first stint is David Perel in the AM Cup Ferrari, 28th overall he runs. He gained a place last lap through against Kenneth Hart. Tremendous effort. So we have a yellow flag out in that last sector, and we have Bortolotti leading by six seconds now. Still the same order, second, third and fourth. Felix Serrano is doing a good job of withstanding the pressure from, from Pereira, isn't he? Then you've got the two Ferraris next up, with their Pierre Guidi fending off Victor Scheitart and the top six completed by the Pro-Am leading Jules Gounon. The next area of you know, thinking a driver has to carry through is how am I using my tyres? The Mercedes, generally people believe, the AM, Mercedes AMG, to get it correct, is generally considered to be slightly easier particularly on the rear tower on this kind of circuit than the mid-engine rear engine cars are on so yeah. we're still just coming up to half distance we don't see any drop-off in performance from the two ferrari we don't see any drop-off performance currently although the gap between first and second has kind of stabilized now around about 6.1 to 6.3 seconds so Mirko Bortolotti has done the hard yards to give himself that comfort zone what he does not want is a safety car but we'll have a full course yellow instead full course yellow is being called for while alexander west's mclaren can be retrieved so 188 is off and a full course yellow but that should not bring down the gaps no the gaps that you have you have a delta between the car ahead of you and the car behind you and you're not meant to gain or lose as the 777 i thought was, yes, everybody's running now at the, the delta speed and this is one of the better solutions that has been introduced over the last couple of years into international motorsport, rather than having to bring out a safety car for something which is, in relative terms, not a major issue, 
to, either they're going to drag it back onto the racetrack. It's only there's the pit lane entrance, so it's not, what, maybe 150 metres, well, let's say 150 yards, I'm old fashioned, <laughs> to their pit lane entrance. So they have to slow right down and they hold station. Of course, you can't overtake, you can't uh, go quicker than the delta speed that is provided and that can be monitored so if you do speed if you don't slow down fast enough soon enough then you can be penalized accordingly let's just see how much gap there is between first and second 6.3 seconds yeah there that's a margin i think shiter has closed a bit on pierre guidi there so 6.2 was the last second gap as the car so bortolotti goes across start finish line the Mercedes follows, 6.2 was the gap, 5.8, so there's 0.4 of a second gain in favour of the 88 Mercedes. So we are under a full course yellow here at Silverstone in the second Grand Pan GT Series Endurance Cup round of the year, and a replay of the start as the lights did go to green at the second time of asking. And the Philip Eng BMW going one side. That was the second start, the yeah, tidier yeah. start. Both BMW, the same BMW, did it on the initial start, and then again very similar. But there's the advantage that Bortolotti had. He needed the wider arc. He could break that a little bit later. In fact, he may only had to breathe it. The Mercedes had to tuck in. It didn't have the space to come over to the left side of the track. So advantage to Merkel Bortolotti. And again, good racing brain. Works it out, knows what he's got and what he can do. And, and, and also trust within his fellow competitor in the 88 Mercedes AMG. So the McLaren still to be retrieved. A full course yellow works very well at not affecting gaps. But a flip side of that coin is that, of course, the cars will always be dotted around the circuit. Whereas a safety car has one long line, it goes past, and there's a lot of time for marshals to work. Now, for the moment, there is clear track space over at Luffield, but not for very long because there's another wave of cars due, so it's a little bit harder sometimes for the marshals to yeah, get I to mean, a car. In, in, the, in the instance of where there's a single car... We've got a safety car. OK, safety car's been deployed. Where we... And in fact, the one I just see looking across from our commentary position, we've got one of the recovery vehicles has now been deployed onto the racetrack and it will pull the McLaren there. We see it still, so a safety car. And that means all that you know, early performance from the 63 Lamborghini will evaporate because he will have the field literally tailing him around yeah, until yeah. this track goes green again. And then he's got to do it all over again. But that offers up opportunities for those three cars we've seen back down. There's going to be four cars battling because they are going to be the ones that will ultimately take the challenge to the lead Lamborghini. So the full course yellow slows everybody down and then that can be converted into a safety car period. The thing that having the, having the, the virtual safety car is that it's much easier for the safety car when it's deployed to pick up the lead car, yeah, which doesn't always happen. It's one of the one of the difficulties of deploying a safety car. Sometimes you need to do it more or less instantly, and you don't always pick up the lead car. But in this instance, the 63 has been picked up by the safety car, so there's no loss at this point. I don't think anybody could say they were disadvantaged. In fact, the only one that could do would be Bortolotti in the 63. Except the leaders are at Village, and crawling through Woodcut is another group of eight cars, which are two-thirds of a lap behind, because they haven't caught the pack. Of course, you, you lose time early on, you slow for a full course yellow, but they are, I would say, three-quarters of a lap behind everybody else. And so when the race restarts, Potentially, you'll have cars going at racing pace. They would catch those cars that are still under yellow flag conditions. Well, what you might do is try and get a signal, is you try and get some kind of message to them to allow them to close up to the yeah. end of the snake or the chain. It's it, it is, but you've got such a large field of what is, in a relative terms, a short circuit. Oh, 3.6 miles is not a short circuit. But you think about Spa Francorchamps, which is a much longer circuit. They've got, they used to have, they may not do this year, multiple safety cars. Safety car is in, they're going to catch these cars. They are not yet going at a, a decent pace. I think they are possibly getting the message now to speed up, but those drivers are going to lose out because the leaders have been released. We are racing again, into the pits has come, the damage McLaren, the incident that put it in the gravel is under investigation. So the majority of the field are okay, but if you're 47th and back, you're in that second group, which is a long, long way adrift, all trapped behind. Uh, Konstantin Lendudis. So we are racing again, but those cars that are, I mean, okay, they're a long way down the order anyway, uh, but they are about to be compromised further. So Bortolotti leads Serrales, then it's Pereira ahead of 
Pierre Greedy. Behind him is Victor Scheiter. Then Jules Gounon. Is Bortolotti going to drive away, or can anybody this time go with him? Interesting. Two of the Mercedes AMGs using a little bit of track space to get more temperature into the tyres, even running behind in that virtual safety car, then the safety car proper. You know, the temperature pressure as they drop away, you want to get the back up as quick as possible. And further battle. Oh, what's that? I thought that was a Porsche. There it is. That's Robert Renault trying to gain places. Down in 27th 27, position. Yeah. So he's got work to do. Uh, got the performance. The car has got good performance, but a lot of traffic. A lot of traffic. He's stepped down the inside, so he's made up one position already. So that sees him up into 26th position. As he turns his way through. Unless that's the Ferrari that's rejoined after it stopped, just looking at the Kessel Racing car behind. Yeah. Still, you've got Nicholas Polo gaining ground as well in that Lamborghini. Race lead is currently lap 14 then after that safety car period. Half a second was the margin when they went over the timing line. Jamie Green, DTM race winner a week ago. Hustles on, number 17, trying to find his way up past the McLaren ahead of him in the hands of Johnny Kane. Well, we've got the field making its way through Woodcut. We've got the leading group coming now into and through Luffield. There is the leader. It's already opened up about a second plus on that last lap. The gap was half a second at the end of the 13th lap. It's going to be one and a half seconds. Well, 1.3 seconds, so he's put up 0.8 of a second on the second place Mercedes, but those second, third and fourth just literally running on each other's wheel tracks. So the lead gap up to 1.3 seconds, Bortolotti again on his toes, isn't he? He's pulling away straight away as the leaders now turn their way out of Cop's corner. There goes Robert Renault, part of this year's Dubai 24-hour winning team, up towards Maggots. He will go in a moment, Johnny Kane with Jamie Green behind him. Then there is the charging Kenneth Heyer. And that's the second of the GRT Grasso Racing Team Lamborghinis turning its way through with uh, Ezequiel Perez Compang at the wheel down in 35th place. Just like at Monza, he does the starting duties. Gets further this time around. And there, Marco Giocchi onto the tail now of Eduardo Mortara. There is a stop and go penalty for number two, Stefan Richelmi, for causing a collision. That was with Ronnie Zeski, wasn't it? So yes, just what we were saying yes. about a pro driver on a yeah. AM driver penalty comes. Yes. I mean, the trouble might be for the pro driver, he might know it's a NAM car or it might be a prom car. Looking inside the McLaren garage, and as they were, no, as, yes, it is, that's the McLaren garage, yeah, yeah. Alexander West car. So the, the reasons why the car would start seem to be. Whatever they're doing around the front of the car, may, that may be incidental to why Alexander West wasn't able to get the car going. There is the 55 Ferrari. Sorry, what I didn't tell you about the stop go for Stefan Rochelle is it's five minutes. Oh, that's that is wow. draconian, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> Talk about focusing. Well, but you could argue the Ferrari was off for two laps, which is about five minutes. I've always believed that if there's an incident between two cars and the innocent party is the victim and the perpetrator gets off scot-free, that's wrong. Yeah. And you know, for a very long time, that often was the case. Maybe it's now going to be redressed, and eventually, you know, the penny, or let's call it the euro will drop. Euro will drop, yeah. So, I think a penny sounds better, because it's, we're more familiar with it. But a, a five-minute stop-go penalty for causing a collision. But well, that, that's actually, two plus laps, or two yeah, and a half laps. Which is what the Ferrari was in the gravel for. So yeah, actually, it does balance out, doesn't it? it now, the race leaders are on lap 16. We have seen the 188 McLaren in the gravel. It's now in the pits, and a frustrated Chris Goodwin can tell us more. Chris, what's the damage, and can you fix it? Well, the, the damage is basically to our race. Unfortunately, having had the biggest talking to by the organisers before the race, no contact. A Mercedes hit Alex in the middle of Luffield. Ridiculous. Um, Damage to the car minimal, punctured the right rear where the first impact was, but then the car spun around and damaged the front splitter. So the team were turning the car around, that's no problem. Alex is going to stay in the car, this is at his first endurance race. So it's all going to be great experience for him, but the damage is to, to, the, to the race itself. We'll never catch up the lost laps. Um, but, you know, you can see they're flat out, it won't be long, but we'll have lost a few laps. We'll keep Alex in the car, give him some more experience and see where we are. Well, good luck, thank you. We hope to see a really good show in the car. Thanks. Number 31 Mercedes, which was holding up that other group of cars, the team manager of that is being summoned to the race director 
immediately. John, you were going to say? I was just going to say, if, if the, the penalty that might flow for the, the, Mercedes, the McLaren being knocked into the gravel, I mean, that's going to take the best part of maybe 15 minutes from the point. So is the perpetrator of the crime going to get a 15-minute penalty in the pit lane? If that's yeah. the policy... Or, or is there going to be a maximum amount of time regardless? We'll keep monitoring the situation as you look there at number 14, Jaguar Stefano Telli, battling with number 90, Eduardo Mortara. Right up behind them is the Nissan, 22 Struenmore. You've got Marco Ciocci and all of that as well. So Struenmore has dropped back a couple of spots on this lap. And he's about to lose a third, I fear. Ciocci tries to get up the inside. Behind them is Fabian Schiller in the 85 HTP. Mercedes as they come out of Woodcut and then behind them Jasmine Jafar. So Ortelli up into the top ten. Katsumasa Chia looking on from the RJN Motorsport pit bunker as the cars now work their way out of Cops Corner for the 17th time of asking. Bortolotti 1.8 seconds ahead of Serrales, but great battles as you'd anticipate going on up and down the field. Chiocci under pressure here in the Ferrari look. Indeed. But Strun, oh, he was the one that looked like he might be vulnerable, but once he got the Nissan, fired up, saw a bit of a straight line. That's the strength that Nissan has got. It really, really does have a load of squirt. And not that the Ferrari, the 488, is anywhere short of it, but that is the strength that, as we look down, there's a battle going on. What's going on? Catching up. The leaders are catching up. This is what's going on. The leaders have caught up to some of the... That's Pierre Guidi yeah, yes, looking 84. for a way past Pereira. Shites are behind him. They're in the traffic, aren't they? Yeah, that's why I'm just getting slightly confused. But third place has swapped over and that Max Book look at the look at his face there we go again coming up into Abbey Corner loads of traffic and this is the consequence of that safety car lots of cars were in the mid back of the field got separated from the the chain but three abreast as they come into farm Ferrari squeezes through it's got the place of the 84 Mercedes that's looking at the 88 and Mercedes AMG and just I mean just traffic jam three abreast again as they come into entry somebody's got to concede and those quicker cars are finding themselves being look Ferrari on the grass the Hillevich car on the grass being forced wide unintentionally but makes the pass anyway so gets past two Mercedes and the BMW which is one of the cars that's being lapped so traffic everywhere it's, isn't it's, it? I don't know where to start because <laughs> whatever you say something's going to change so the BMW is completely out of place with this group of four cars all battling for the top six positions. On board now with Guy Smith heading up towards the timing line. The BMW up the kerb there trying to keep out of the way, which is the Henkeler car. So the leaders dive into Cops Corner. Yama Berman turns through in number four with Jorgun on behind him. We've had a change for the leader Pro-Am out of all of that because Daniel Kylevitz in the green and white Ferrari 333 three, three, there is ahead of the Mercedes. So Kylevitz, you'll see in a moment as they come through the Beckett S's, is into the leader Pro-Am. And Guy Smith running in ninth place is the next driver to have to find a way past the BMW. Yeah, Kylevitz made that pass coming down Wellington Street. He was pushed wide unintentionally by, I think, Jules Gugno then had inside line into the centre of Brooklyn's corner and just stuck there and that's where the pass came. So and in fact it allowed the uh, Mercedes, the Berman Mercedes, yeah. likewise to get past Jules Gunnar. There you might say Gunnar who's impressed me with his speed but he can't always beat experience. Now what could Karlwitz do next? Former ADAC GT Masters champion. He excels in Corvettes as well as Ferraris, so he's a much underrated driver, Daniel Karlwitz. He's wide coming out of club corner. There's more traffic up the road as well as Victor Scheintar goes through on the inside line of the number 31 Mercedes there. That's then doing this at the wheel. And as he tries to keep out of the way, here comes Karlwitz taking Yelma Berman with him. But which way does the Ferrari go? Down the inside. Has to go down the inside. Yes, he does. And Berman will follow him. But Ooh. does the Mercedes... Well, he didn't realise the Mercedes was following through. So he had to turn away from the corner to give... Dominic, uh, Yama Berman. Yama Berman, I beg your pardon. Give him that track space. And this is where it gets really tricky for the AMs and the, the pro AMs. As we go back to, that is the 188 McLaren back out in the race. So I wonder how long in total it's taken. It must be 15 minutes minimum, maybe 18, 19. It's lost six laps against well, the race leader. It. So six times two minutes and a bit. Yeah, it's two and a bit, so it's, it's going to be 15, 15 minutes. minutes yeah. yeah, yeah. So... Uh, it's a forlorn hope, but as Chris Goodwin was saying, they want to give Alexander West the track time now in readiness for the Spa 24 hours. Yelma Berman over the timing line, seventh, hunting down Daniel Kylevitz. 
now we're about 19 minutes away from the hour and it will be around then that people are going to start thinking about pit stops isn't it yeah in the meantime Marco Portolotti has opened up the advantage at the front 4.2 seconds he's had to deal with traffic but the advantage that he's had he's not having to concern himself with what's going on either around him or directly behind him he's had that little bit of advantage where he could be more selective and where he does choose to make his passes so 4.2 seconds has been part of having that opportunity to get through cleanly without having to worry about other cars there's the Bentley number seven we saw Stephen Kane and currently Guy Smith in ninth place and he is just under a second behind Jules Gounon now well it'll be interesting to see if Guy Smith feels brave enough to give the young Frenchman a bit of a working over to get one more position for Bentley getting up to eighth whereas the sister car of Vincent Abril is being shown as down in 45th place and a lap of drift. I think the because the, I was watching out of the window, the car was forced wide in traffic uh, and perhaps didn't cross the timing beam in the right place. Yes, he's been put back in the order into 24th. Now, there is a one-minute stop-and-go penalty to Felix Serralis in second place due to false start and contact. So, a one-minute stop-go penalty to the second-place car due to a false start. Well, I mean, we clearly saw he had the car out of position. There was that very, very light contact, but we are in this new regime. It's a whole brave new world. Whoever wrote that great tomb, was it Aldous Huxley? I'll go with that. That's yes. good enough. I don't get anybody else. Anyway, the ADH is going to have to come into the pits and serve its penalty. And that will be relief for Pierre Luigi, or Alessandro Pierguidi in the Ferrari, that's going to give him a really good opportunity to look at having a pop at Mirko Bortolotti. He's six, just under six seconds behind, currently in third place. But once the, once the Mercedes AMG carries out its penalty, then Alessandro Pierguidi can get on with the programme. Just to recap the point that we discussed at Monza, once a penalty is on the timing screen, you've got two passes of the timing line before you've got to take it. And there is no right of appeal, no. which is the key that every team manager in the pit lane must be aware of. So it is there, it is done, it is decided, and Felix Serratis will come in now. A minute stop go is going to be a minute stationary in, what, 26 for seconds 20, or 20, so? Yeah, 26, yeah. 28 seconds. For, for, for drive time. So it, it's getting on for, should we say, two-thirds of a lap. It's not the end of the world. It's not good, but it's not the end of the world, is it? You could do without it. I agree. You could do without it. But, but it's to, put it, to be frank to, about it, look, two Nissans together, 22, 23, battling. And... Yeah, they are. Yeah. And, and with the Aston Martin, I think they've disposed, the 23 is disposed of the Aston. So 16, that's off a place. Yeah, 16, yeah. 17. I suppose my point about this stop go is you won't lose a lap. And that's key to staying in touch in the race. Isn't it? Wow, is it ever. So there, 22, Stuart Moore. Or Donieth behind him. Ahmed Al-Hafi has dropped back a little bit, but... Staying in touch, third in Pro-Am. And that car's going to be able to do good lap times for another stint after that, whereas it'll be a different driver getting on board for Kyle Vitz and for Jules Gounon. It's interesting when you talk to some of the team owners about the BOP. The Aston, they believe, in terms of BOP, has got a significant amount of horsepower advantage, whereas some of the more contemporary cars, the, you know, the, the Mercedes-AMG, the Lambo, Huracan, uh, the BMW have more aero, yeah. so they offset the aero on the Aston with more horsepower and offset the, the, the cars with loads of aero with more BOP. That is Frank Stippler yeah. up the Slip, inside. Slipped through very nicely indeed, but, one of the but McLarens. That, but that was lapping the BMW, oh, half into the outside, here is the Mercedes. Now, also on the subject of stop-go penalties, the team times it itself, that lap BMW getting in the way a little bit as the McLarens try and dive through. Jasmine Jafar, Rob Bell, arm and a half, he's stuck in the traffic, he can't get across. They're all descending upon the M6 as they dive down towards Cops. Jafar is through, Rob Bell is through. Oh, arm and a half, he gets squeezed out. The BMW exit stage left as well. Yeah, there was contact with the Aston. I don't know which car. Just very, very slight, or certainly if not contact, a, a turn to the left to avoid contact. They've all survived, but that was a bit touch and go. Now, has the McLaren ended up with any damage? No, there's Jasmine. Ja no, he has got a problem. Jafar runs wide. He was sideways in the Beckett's S's. So that brings Rob Bell into the mix yet again was in that, number 58. Is that a left front, or is it just he got 
something on the tyres, but Rob Bell looks like he might feel he's got a bit mm. of speed. But, you know, this is, again, a group of eight, ten cars, maybe more, some other position, but mostly all racing for that top ten, top twenty position. Absolutely. This battle pack is for sort of, where are we now? 19th place back, and Rob Bell is the one who loses out because up the inside there goes Christian Clean. The number 31, the silver Mercedes AMG, is the Lendudis car getting in the way a little bit, so Rob Bell loses out because up the inside there goes Dries Van Tour in the Audi. Rob Bell was on the wrong line, and it's so competitive. I mean, this is like stock car racing. It is absolutely nuts. I mean, you've got a group of, what, 15 cars now, all fighting, some in category, some for overall position, and some haven't got a clue, frankly. Just push, push, push. Lendudis is the driver on this lap terrorised out of the way, up the inside goes Vincent Abril. I mean, he, he just he just wants to vanish. I mean, it's whatever he does, he's being passed on the outside, being passed on the inside. The only thing we haven't had is anybody go over the top yet. That was an, an onboard view from Ahmed Ahafi's Aston Martin as he comes the right way, in other words, on the tarmac to get through the traffic. But look, they're three, almost four abreast. Now, we're getting more drive-through penalties. 55, Marco Ciocci. Drive through for a jump start and 85 Fabian Schiller, HTP Mercedes AMG. Jump Good. start. 55 Chocci in 11th place. Yeah. That's the car that Giancarlo Fisichella will be in a little bit later. So it is being everything examined, discussed, and penalties, if they are applied, are being applied. So this is going to be a, probably for the teams themselves a very difficult race to work out quite what. Runs way wide coming out of out of, out of cops, and that's behind the Porsche. So that would have been that was the Aston Martin running very wide. So Felix Sorales has pitted, by the way, to serve that stop go. The teams time the penalty, not the officials, the teams. But just in case you think, well, they could let it go early. No, they can't because the pit in to pit out time is controlled by the timekeeping, and if it's under, then they will be brought back in. The uh, the speed. Driving. Oh, big off for number oh, 44 yes. McLaren. That's done the barrier a big That's heap a big of no oh, good. That, is it and ever? that was Johnny Kane at the wheel. That is mega. That's up at, is that up at Beckett's? That's coming out of Abbey, isn't it? Yeah. Abbey to farm. That, whatever it is, that is a massive hit on the barrier because you can oh. see how distorted the barrier is and we're going to see certainly in this instance or regular, it's going to be a safety... It's in sector one. I, I wonder if... Beckett's it's, it's Beckett's, I think isn't it's it? Beckett's, I think it's Beckett's. It's the first part of Beckett's, yeah. yes. So that's a big, big impact. You can see the damage in the barrier. I mean, the car has hit that at great speed. Johnny's OK, he's out of the car. That's the best news. Yes, indeed. But, but that's, that's, that's the end of that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, and in fact, it's not just that. This car and the barrier may have to be... I doubt they can leave the barrier in that condition. That's an issue that will also have to be considered. But that is a severe impact. I mean, yeah. I don't know what speed he's hit the barrier, but... Judging by this impact, it's massive. I mean, it's punched the barrier back, oh, hasn't absolutely. it? It's an enormous hit, that. I mean, that, they, these are FIA grade one Grand Prix circuit barriers. I mean, they're, they're not something you'd find in a little country circuit. And that is a big, big hit. Strew and Moore goes wide. And up the inside there goes the McLaren then. So about to gain a place is Jasmine Jafar, winner here last year. But no, Strew Moore comes back round the outside. And way, way, way wide. Can he keep on the... Oh, he's but just gone back. Full course yellow. Yes, I'm That's not surprised. why I think some slowed. And we've got some pitting early. So now, one or two thinking this could be quite a long period. They're trying to take advantage under a full course yellow. It might be that once everybody has slowed, we go to a safety car period anyway. But our second full course yellow is out because 44... Johnny Kane off the road with a sizable impact at Beckett's. Yeah, uh, the, the issue will be getting the car removed, first of all, most importantly, considering the condition Johnny, he had been rattled around. He's, he's, fortunately, he's physically a small person, a, a big guy in a McLaren, would probably suffer more. So Johnny will probably have a quick trip to the, the medical centre just to make sure that everything is fine and he's comfortable. But there's the barriers, and I wonder whether they will have to replace those barriers or will they be able to maybe put a tire bale or a number of tire bales in front of that heavily damaged part of the barrier it's not a part of the racetrack you would expect a car to go off on from the perspective of that camera angle it looks as if he didn't make the first part of Beckett's because if it's on the left hand side then I don't know how we could get there now to get there could it be either contact or a breakage it could be anything yeah, I mean, it's I difficult to, to speculate at this particular point in the meantime, the gap that Bortolotti had built up after that safety car intervention was back up to 6.7 seconds, but he had 
And there's some cars out, as you say. Teams prepared it to... Looks, looks like a bus stop, everybody waiting, leaning out, waiting yeah. for the bus. Uh, of course, the danger is now that so many teams pit at once, there's no room. That is a problem, so you have to try and work with your neighbours on the other side, or if you're a large team like AF Corsa, you've got plenty of cars. The answer to your earlier question on the grid, and well played for trying to get the rotor out of 63, Andrea Caldarelli is going to go second. So uh, They were having fun with me, they, weren't they? They were teasing, John. Oh, they were having fun. <laughs> so there is the McLaren. And wow, that was a that's big a impact. Big impact that, no, that's as, that's a, as big an impact as I've seen a GT car take. And uh, well, the good news is Johnny gonna, Kane's okay. Yes, but and Mirko Portolotti behind the wheel of the Lamborghini again, <laughs> saying all the work that he has done. Don't mention he doesn't blink. Well, he Kids, does. He, he I was going to say because it's a full course yellow, he blinks. Yes. You see, he's not as focused. So I've seen him blink three times already. Normally, Mirko, when he's on it, when he's on a flying lap, the concentration is such that he doesn't blink at all. But now that he's just pootling around under a full course yellow situation, he can blink to his heart's content. You know, he, he wasn't aware of that until I brought it up. Really? Now it's a bit of a joke in the team. <laughs> so now he's Mirko Blinkalotti as he comes yeah, uh, yeah. in the full course yellow. So will they decide to bring him in and make a change? I, I can't see any advantage in staying out because this is going to be, I think, quite a long safety car period yes he's coming in so come in do your driver change wheels fuel get back out and essentially he might he, I wonder if he can do the change I'm just trying to think the, the three lead cars all coming in at the same time for the same reasons fundamentally they have that delta time of course yeah. to adhere to so you can't do it in less than or between uh, 58 and 84 seconds. 58 to 84 is the minimum and the maximum times you have. The, the key to making your pit stop will be where will you slot back in and, and what, what damage will that do to you? Safety car being deployed. So yeah. now that the field have slowed, but unfortunately it actually gets more confusing for the race director now because your leader will change because of the pit stops, won't it? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. That's where it gets for the team and for the uh, organisation. So there's a length of time you have to spend. Wheels, tyres, so you do your refueling, then your wheels and tyres. The driver, of course, there's the Bentley coming in, number seven. So that was at the time it came in, the seven yeah. car was round about ninth position. So this will put into the lead Daniel Kylewitz in number 333 Ferrari. So that's the car that we hope uh, will be scooped up by the safety car. But I don't envy Alan Ad on the job of having to coordinate all of this now. He's staring in race control at a bank of monitors, and that is not the lead car, clearly. No, no, that's but you the, can at least let that train of cars go. So the, the, what was the lead car is just beginning to go down the pit lane there, or sort of midway down the pit lane. But who, I mean, who is the lead car? It's not the, 90, not the 63 Lamborghini. It gave up the lead when it came in the pit lane. Correct. So th on the track, 333 is the leading car, because that was uh, fifth. It stayed out and therefore overtook all the others in the pit lane. So and there it is, there the sixth in line. Yeah, at the back the of fifth the in line of those cars. So and I suppose one might say, would it be correct to wave through those other four cars to enable then the safety car to pick up the lead car, the 333 Ferrari, which in itself will probably having to make a pit stop because you're going to have to make one. You run out of fuel if you don't. It's a question of when you do it, either at the earliest opportunity or... Whatever your team decides, do it on one hour, one hour, one hour. So we are under safety car conditions. It's blasting down the pit lane, number 12 there. Andrea Piccini brought that car in. And the number 19, Grasser Racing Team, Lamborghini now having a new set of boots put onto it. So the safety car brings the gaps down. And let's have a look at how Johnny Kane got to his resting point. Was there contact with Len Dudis? Oh, ever. Let's have a look. A oh, wheel. A oh, wheel. Was that, was that a rear wheel came off? And then, bang. Oh, he had no chance to break there, did no, he? No, no, I mean, the wheel, again, I hate seeing wheels get up in the air. Now, that was a heavy impact and very little ability for the car. Even going through the gravel trap, it sort of skipped across and not helped by the fact that one of its wheels, the rear wheels, was bouncing through the air. So poor Johnny Kane sitting there as a passenger. Unfortunately, in this instance, whether you would say, did the McLaren give the Mercedes sufficient working room or was it just so much action going around that almost that he couldn't really 
Copeland. It's one of those questions that no doubt will have to be reviewed again and again. So the silver Mercedes, you can touch. see on the right of screen, the McLaren would instinctively be coming across as it is, and the Mercedes was on the curb, didn't have much to go, but why the wheel came off? Yeah, that's very odd, isn't it? But did the wheel come off the McLaren or off the Mercedes? I'm we assuming it came off the McLaren. Yeah, because the Mercedes carried on, didn't it? And has completed a lap since. And then some of the damage is done as the wheel hits the car. It tries to go back to where it, it came does, from, yeah. and then bang. Yeah, well, there's a lot of kinetic energy mm. in a wheel and tyre. I mean, the thing probably weighs tyre, wheel, the best part of 10 or maybe 12 kilograms and at speed, squared, whatever. Got to say, poor old Stracker not having a very happy That's start awful. to the endurance season because, of course, there was the Nick Leventis accident in qualifying at uh, Monza, pre-qualifying at Monza. Yeah, and then there was the accident with Boris uh, Hazelman, big accident, mm. broke the car off at Brands Hatch. And Andrew Kirkcaldy, I spoke to him at Brands Hatch, is that a puncture in the 85? Or yes, it? I think the front right's yeah, gone down, hasn't it? it? Uh, Andrew Kirkcaldy was shaking his head, just, I can't believe we've just gone through so much you know, yeah. material, chassis, bodywork, suspension. Expense. Well, obviously that's a, a major concern, but it's just, you can't keep up, you know, it, to manufacture all the parts that are damaged, to keep up with that in itself, and make sure that your spares, there are sufficient spare parts that in the need mm. for them, that you've got them at the point. That was the leader, briefly, Karlvitz in. So now, because he's not pitted, Struan Moore takes over the race lead. So there he goes. Whoa, 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 whoa stop. Slightly confused, letting the, releasing the car with other cars coming down. Now, of course, the officials will have a look at an unsafe release if they feel it merits it. That could be one that they look at. I think that one will probably get away. It, it was released, but it was halted. It didn't, uh, it didn't cause an incident. So I would think that, that there's enough of their plate right now to, to worry about. So we're under the safety car, and Struan Moore technically is the leader. With in second place now, number 66 Lamborghini, which is Bertrand Baguette. But drivers looking for a safety car, and the safety car driver looking for a leading car. So it's always a, a problem for the race director. You throw the safety car and people pit, and the order behind starts to shuffle greatly. But you need to keep an eye on the timing screen as to who is pitting and work out the leader that way because a manual lap chart done at the next corner after the timing line becomes more accurate because that gives you the situation after the cars are pitted. Wouldn't you hate to be the circuit commentator on a day like today? <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> so, number 19 Lamborghini. That was compact, wasn't it, in the first stint? Yes. Yeah. And who's he given away to? Uh, Raffaele Giammaria. Yeah. So 36. 36 position, yeah. Yeah. Where did 63 fall to then? It is 8th. That's pretty useful, I would have thought. Yeah, I would have thought that's pretty good. It's the best of the stoppers, provisionally. We'll have a look at the order at the end of the, the next lap, but for the moment, the safety car has got cars behind it. If the race director is happy, but the, the, he, he can then change... The lead car is, the, again, the fifth car in that chain of cars. Uh, it's Drew and Moore in the yeah. Nissan. So, our car's being waved through, or you know, the cars are going into the pit lane, and the, what is the lead car? There, the red and white Nissan, that's the lead car now. Uh, it's making its way into the pit at the end of the 25th lap. So there are two cars now behind the safety car and 63, which is not the leader, because the leading car now is, is number 90. Michael Meadows yes. is the best of those that have made a pit stop. Been, well, but, but in the confusion, could we have ever worked that out? But I'm hesitating. But my follow that, that car's not had a drive-through for anything, has it? No, but it's made one pit stop. Yeah, so we don't, but not for. We're assuming it's a pit stop, but we've not. Have they had another? I, I can't tell. Well, I'm thinking. You, you, you're right. I'm thinking. Is that stop a drive-through or a routine pit stop? I think it's a routine pit stop. So it's ahead. So it leads. That's the unless we. It is. So well, 88 had a drive-through. We didn't see the 90. We're not aware of the 90. Well, if that if that was if that was a, an early pit stop on the part of the team then they've done a good job. But the, the yeah. car leading right now is the 66, which is the attempt to racing Lamborghini, but that has, it is yet to stop. Indeed, so that will peel off. So pretty the, much at the top 20, the lead car is the only car in the top 20 that is yet to stop. Yeah, so ignore that Lamborghini, ignore that Mercedes, that car is the leader. It is now Michael Meadows at the wheel. It did stop early. I've just gone back through all the race director's messages. 
no penalties for that. So the one pit stop it has made was a regulation, full service, fuel tiles driver pit stop, and it has come out ahead of 63 well, Lamborghini, I mean, which is now Andrea Calderelli. How, how sneaky can you get? <laughs> and that one really slipped under the radar. We didn't catch that at all. But good work on the part of that team to get the car serviced the ACA ASP team to get the lead in the pit stop. There is the second place car. Now the pace that we have seen all afternoon from Mercury Portalotti in the 63 car has been stunning. Now we see change of driver and it's going to be a bit of a challenge because Andrea Calderari is going to be a different different dynamic and yeah. Michael Meadows and Calderari have they ever raced together or raced against one another in fact? We'll have to wait to see how that's so. unfold until uh, Ron Pound this year. Now, of course, although I'm saying ignore that Lamborghini at the front, it is the race leading car, so the safety car does have the correct car behind it, but it will peel off at the end of this lap to serve a pit stop, I'm sure. So it's a, a phony lead, and Michael Meadows it is then who will inherit the race lead because he is the best placed of the pit stoppers behind the safety car following all of this. So by keeping better on Baguette out, what they've done is get the car into a notional lead, but as soon as he pits, he's going to drop so far down the order. And that was the Mercedes that got involved with Johnny Cage. Yes, it is. So it was the left side of the car, but uh, they've taken the car back into the, the garage to work on it so they can use more than the mandatory two people that would be involved in a pit stop in the pit lane. But that also answered the question, was there contact? Yes, because it was well, the left-hand side, no, but down was, on the right of the Mercedes. Contact, yeah. Yeah. So that confirms all that, and it will tumble down the order according to this X-Speed car in the pit lane. Now, what we don't know is how long this safety car period is likely to be. In has just come Bertrand Baguette, and in has come the lapped Mercedes behind. So now Michael Meadows is confirmed as the leader from Calderelli, from uh, passing Lathoris, who is in third place, the very quick tie driver, the silver grady driver, who's uh, not done in relative terms as much racing as some of those, but has done very well in British GT. He's been uh, quick in block pan when we've seen him race uh, in the past in that. So passing Lathoris is uh, an underrated driver and goes strongly with some good co-drivers around him. He's learnt from them. Yeah, and he's in the pound seat again. He's in the top three. Uh, it'll be interesting. It'll be the 84 Mercedes that in effect will be in fourth place, so he's going to be under threat. So that's not going to be Jimmy Erickson behind the wheel, so that's going to be something he'll have to focus on. There's the 88 car. And uh, change tear off being pulled off the windscreen. That was the car that had to serve the penalty for an infringement at the start. We did see that at the original start. The car was out of position. There was mild contact on the left side of the Mercedes AMG with the front row sitting Lamborghini. So now fuel is in, then you can start doing. And this is so well choreographed by all the teams. Two, two engineers allowed to do it. And they spend hours, well, not hours, but maybe 15 minutes, then they're down in the pub. But basically, <laughs> they, no, they do, they have to rehearse. And these, these, they're fit, they go to the gym, they work out of the gym. Because carrying these wheels, tyres, you might think they're not heavy, but if you want to lift one and carry it and run around a car and not slip up and not whatever. So it's on its way. So that is just a boot here. The incident between Kane and Lendudis is going to be uh, looked at after the race. Why do you spin behind the safety car? Treble 7 has rotated. That's Gilles Vanillet, who is an experienced driver. But Gilles, uh, don't drive into the pack, please. I suspect because he got fresh rubber on, we're running at low speeds, and he just maybe ran a curb and just got caught up. But he's sort of stuck in no man's land. He's going to drive into the gravel. Is he going to always ask tarmac around that part of club corner? So he's quite... So he's out of position, and therefore he's going to have to retain the position that he's rejoined the race in, I'm assuming. We always say you can't overtake behind the safety car, but when someone spins ahead of you, you've got no choice, have you? Uh, number 90 leads them. Michael Meadows drives it, and Eduardo Mortara did the first stint. It's sneaked into the lead, rather, and uh, Eduardo Mortara then, who did that first stint, can tell us all. Eduardo, you just sneaked into the lead there with an early pit stop. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a question, you know, to take the right decision at the right, uh, the right time. I knew we were close to the, we were like sort of like in the pit stop window. And uh, when they told me that they were like full course yellow, I decided to come in because I knew that we could uh, gain some lap time there. Uh, we were running like around like P9, P10. Um, yeah, so hopefully, you know, uh, next things will be, will be good and we can, uh, we can finish, you know, on a good position. Now, can you hold up the Lambo? Yeah, I mean, 
we have, um, I think we have good chances because we have like good tyres. Um, yeah, my teammates uh, that uh, qualified the car, you know, at the front. Uh, so Rafael, I guess, will uh, finish the race. At the moment is Michael. They are both very experienced. They both uh, showed that they were, uh, you know, on a good pace. So um, I mean, if we can defend from the Lamborghini, this we will see. But at least, you know, we are at the moment leading, and uh, it's cool already. Thank you. Good luck. Racing again, safety car is in, green flags fly. So Michael Meadows leads, Andrea Caldarelli runs second, third is passing Lathoris, and right on his tail now is Jimmy Erickson in 84 Mercedes. That's suddenly come into the mix. But the 8 Bentley likewise has come up to the mix. Suddenly we're seeing yes, that yes. right up at the races. So Andy Suchek. Yeah, Suchek behind the wheel. So suddenly that car had been running outside the top 20 has made its way up. Again, clever use of safety car and a good timing in the pit lane. So, Michael Meadows leads the pack. Michael, double Carrera Cup GB champion. Son of Mercedes uh, Formula 1 team manager Ron Meadows is there. Andy Suchek comes to the outside line of Miguel Molina down to the end of Vale, but the Ferrari fends off the Bentley. Fifth and sixth they run, and there is a one-minute stop-go penalty being applied to the number 32 Mercedes for causing a collision. That was against Alexander West, I think, up at... Uh, Lafayette, as we look at the race leaders going now into Abbey, Andy Suchek on the tail of the Ferrari. So this rather Iberian battle, Miguel Molina versus Andy Suchek, Ferrari versus Bentley, nose to tail now. So Suchek trying to get the undercut as they come through farm, and he goes now <gasps> up to try and get the loop, then again trying to get alongside the Ferrari, but can't quite get the traction. There's the lead Mercedes AMG. And the Lamborghini, which is right, well, not literally under the rear wing, but not very far away from it, thinks to have a look, a look down the inside into Brooklyn, looking to me at the minute to be the quicker of the two cars. So it'll be a little bit of defensive driving from Michael Meadows until he gets his eye in and gets comfortable behind the wheel. But this is going to be a fascinating duel, this, because we know Michael is good, but uh, in his previous Rompan GT outings, he's kind of been swallowed up by the field because of pace of his co-driver or whatever it might be but here we're seeing him leading a race for the first time in this championship and it's going to be a real test of him he's new to the mercedes this year but michael a good character unassuming driver and he leads the way calderelli up behind it passing Lathoris running third yes he's holding station running behind the lamborghini so doing a good job at this restart there is the view from the 63 lamborghini the engine v10 screams away whereas the the V8 in the Mercedes AMG, different kind of engine pulse. But the Ferrari is the one actually, it looks like it's going to be. Well, it's getting out of the, the draft of the Lamborghini, just maybe wanted to keep a little bit of cooler air. Is Calderelli being held up by the Mercedes? Possibly. Michael Meadows leads. Calderelli can't find a way past him, but because he can't make progress, passing Lathora's closing. Now, uh, catching up is one thing. The BOP is such, of course, that the cars are quite evenly matched. Overtaking is not that easy, as Calderelli is discovering as well. Yes, Lamborghini looks slightly more effective through club corner, closed on marginally on the exit. Shows the nose, hasn't got enough straight line squirt just to get up alongside Michael Meadows and the Mercedes AMG into Abbey. So next opportunity is going to be round as we come into farm, but too far behind. So I mean, the place that everybody's going to look at is down at the end of Wellington Street into Brooklyn. It's a wide entry into the corner, and even if you go slightly offline on the entry, you can consolidate and principally keep the competitive car that you've been racing with. So now this is where we have to see Calderelli. Can he do anything? Straight line difference between the two cars, marginal, a bit of slipstream, and oh, he goes down the inside, but not far enough. Oh. Needs to avoid contact because with this new regime, contact is not permitted, well, not tolerated, let alone permitted. Absolutely. So, Calderelli on the back of Michael Meadows, passing Lathoris, staying with them. And actually, Jimmy Erickson, fourth, has got somebody else in his mirrors because Andy Suchek is up into fifth place. Watch the leading cars go through Woodcut. There's the Bentley in the background. So Andy Suchek's car that was, what, 24th, I think, before the stops, now up into fifth place out of Cops Corner. Michael Meadows hangs on to the lead, but Andrea Calderelli, watched on by Mirko Bortolotti, there is 0.279 of a second back. The Thoris is third. Fourth is Ericsson, fifth is Suchek, sixth is Monitor. Seventh now is Stuart Leonard going great guns after the draft, the uh, great result he had at Brands. Eighth, it is Lucas Stoltz. Ninth, Gustavo Jakimem. Uh, Maxi Martin's BMW out of nowhere is up into 10th. You know, the race will come to certain driver-car team combinations. They didn't maybe get a successful qualification, 
but again, this is where experience and teamwork works, but the battle for the lead. Mercedes AMG, Lamborghini, I mean, barely, you know, was it less than half a second? Yeah. Showing two tenths of a second when they came across start finish line at the end of their previous lap, lap 29. This is lap 30. Now through club corner, let the car go out, then back, make your apex run wide in the exit. Don't get all four wheels completely off because that's a bit of a no no. And then into the very quick, big, big commitment corner at Abbey, the bump there. Oh, and Pathoros just a bump checking the car from running too wide in the exit. So Michael Meadows leads the way. It was two years ago here that Michael and Stuart Leonard, who is running currently in seventh place, had a class win in Pro-Am in an Aston Martin. The third driver, Paul Wilson, we very sadly lost on Friday morning. He uh, lost his battle with cancer at the young age of 41. And our thoughts and best wishes to Paul's family. Meadows leads the way to the inside line. Looks, Caldarelli can't do it. They turn their way through Brooklyn's nose to tail, the top two, and passing Lathoris. Kind of holding this watching brief in third place, but he too now is coming under renewed attack from Ericsson and Suchek. So the two leaders getting away a little bit while Lathoris has to defend. There he is, look, the train of cars starting to close on him in third spot, but Lathoris hanging on in there, doing a good job still in that third place. Yes, he has, he's done very well at this restart. But as Mirko Bortolotti watches the progress, so Mirko focused as ever, deep, deep, I mean, I mean such, depth of now, such depth of concentration. A little blink. So, Mirko Portolotti watches on. Andrea Caldarelli slipping back ever so slightly. Only a tenth, but the gap has just widened a little, hasn't it? It's very difficult to follow very closely behind her. Another car, your temperatures get affected. You will lose a bit of front end grip. That can damage your tyres. And looking further back, the, the yellow Ferrari, Jimmy Erickson in the 84 Mercedes. Again, Caldarelli closes up, under brakes into Stu, runs a little wider on the exit. Breaking down into Vale, it's always a possibility, but it's not an easy place to do it, and easy to defend. So really the best shot, keep repeating it, going to be down the run, Wellington straight into Brooklands. This group of three cars comprising third, fourth and fifth, all covered by, well, just about a second. So on board with Calder Alley now as he turns his way through the right-hander of Abbey, then flick left at farm, Andy Suchek inching up onto the back of Jimmy Erickson with a good track record, Jimmy, in GP3 and GP2 before, like so many, he decided to give up on a single-seater career where you spend money to try and earn it in a GT car, and he's on the tail of Passin Lathoris. Now, Passin has done a good job thus far in this stint. He's under attack, he's going to be a real test of him now, but he should be up to it because uh, we've seen him in the past in things like British GT and Blancpain doing a good job. And look, he's not cracking under the pressure, is he? He's fending them off. Ericsson flashing the lights, trying to unsettle him. The leaders have caught traffic as well now. They've got the Zack Speed Mercedes ahead. This Which is, way does Meadows go? Well, this is a chance that Caldarelli's been waiting for because Meadows is being delayed. Now, the Lamborghini can have a little bit more flexibility or option. So. The two Mercedes AMGs come out through, but no quarter given. Watch for the Lamborghini. Can it split the two Mercedes, or is he caught in no man's land? I think he's actually Whoa. caught in no man's land. He almost and touched. Still, still. So Michael Meadows now, one goes one side, though both are going to go on the right-hand side, but again, up into his danger zone, up into the beginning of the Beckett. Watch for the Mercedes to cut across the Lamborghini. It gets, wow! It's great news for Meadows because the lead builds, but so frustrating for Calderelli who cannot get past that slower car. Well, I mean, he would say, I'm driving at the pace, but he's got to stay on racetrack. He's got to do the best he can. But frustration, you can see how much that's the 32 Mercedes. But you need a catch here at the wheel of it. Well, and that's one of the AM Ferraris. Very, very quick car. So now Calderelli has got through. He's got to now regroup maybe get over the disappointment. But the third, fourth and fifth place now I've got to contend with the... Mercedes now got sort of the message and uh, maybe just wasn't aware. Suchek goes yeah, through. Just, just Suchek slides, he's, he was watching yeah. what was going on ahead. He didn't want to get involved, he wanted to hang back a little bit and get the, the best option available to him. What part of the racetrack did he want to make his overtake on? So Suchek goes by, Passin Lathoris made short work of that, and of course that brings him a little bit closer to Calderelli. He was two and a half seconds back, he's not two and a half seconds back anymore. Ericsson still runs fourth, Suchek is fifth as they turn their way up towards the loop this time. We're on lap 32, we've had 
two full course yellows converted into safety car periods and the most recent one has really shuffled the pack so Mirko Bortolotti watching uh, Andrea Caldarelli who is in second place the gap has opened up if he were Caldarelli where would he attack Mirko now you're, co you're catching up to Michael Meadows but where would you overtake well that's a good question to be honest uh, yeah well it's a shame actually that we are as as the race started, uh, it's a shame that we are in the position that we need to try to get past. Uh, we were unlucky with, uh, with the safety car procedure because when I pitted, it, it was full course yellow and then apparently it, it switched to safety car and uh, Mercedes were, was having a clear half a lap and gained a lot of time and managed to jump us uh, in the pit stop. So at the moment we are second, but Andrea is doing a great job. He's uh, putting uh, the leading Mercedes under pressure and. I hope we can find uh, the right spot to get past it, but I don't know where you can where you can actually have the position to pass it because you have to drive the car to know it. Okay, thank you very much. Car 85 Mercedes was given a drive-through earlier on. They serve that under the safety car period, which you're not allowed to do. So they're getting another drive-through for doing their drive-through, but at the wrong time. So they contravened a regulation. There's a second drive-through gate for number 85 Mercedes. Yeah, you have to understand. The rule book. Oh, cameraman's panning round, and then there's so much to look for. Yeah, just looking to see. I mean, he just he just followed the cars through still, and he was panning yeah. back. And um, normally we don't see that. But there we are. Can I get all excited oh, about Lathoris? It's 32. 32. Catchier is in the gravel. Yeah, that's uh, uh, corner. Passing Lathoris is still there in third place, despite all the pressure being thrown at him. He's doing a very impressive job, and that all looked rather oh, self-induced. Two. two Mercedes. Yelma Berman's car, Lucas Stoltz at the wheel, was in eighth place, and that was the other one going wide. But. Benjamin Acaccia is in the gravel at Cops Corner. And will that be again a virtual safety, full course yellow, or a safety car? The car difficult to move from then. Again, it's going to need a vehicle to tow it away. There's this battle for second, third place, in fact, between the Ferrari, the Mercedes AMG, and the Bentley. Andy Suchek looking to have a little, little nose down the inside, and Jimmy Erickson sort of isn't quite sure whether Ericsson is going to give him the ground or not, but now the lead battle has rejoined. Calderelli has managed to close back up to the, the rear of Michael Meadows in the lead Mercedes AMG. There, Lathoris is under attack. Here comes Jimmy Ericsson, and he's heading to a yellow flag zone. He's got to get the job done midway down the pit straight. If he goes through at Cops, then he's going to be in strife. Yellow flags are waving, and the position has changed. Well, was he ahead when he got there or not? When those. This, it, it doesn't impress a race director when that happens when you've got four or five marshals trying to remove a car. The question was, was he ahead of the Ferrari at the point he came upon the yellow flag? That's a difficult one to read from our perspective, yeah. looking at it from a TV position. Now, Andy Suchek looking to go the long way round the outside of Chapel. And he's taking uh, one and a with it. Absolutely. And he's going to be the beneficiary because he's going to, Suchek having to go defensive coming down he saw the Ferrari right under his rear wing but Thoros is having to be very careful because this is a tricky situation easy to get contact he took the long way round and then came back so he's lost one spot to Suchek Jimmy Erickson clearly doesn't think he was in the wrong does it because he's not giving the place back he's away up the road Suchek going after him we'll try and get a replay of that overtake down towards Cops and have another look but passing Lathoris having lost one place then kind of caught off his stride a little bit, losing another one to Andy Suchet, but he's regrouped, he's fending off the uh, Miguel Molina Ferrari there, number 72. Up front, Michael Meadows still leads the way, Andrea Caldarelli chasing after him, now on lap number 34. And this is the view from on board the Lamborghini. So here we are, status quo, back to where we were a few laps ago. Michael Meadows driving very consistently, lapping at 2 minutes 0.3s. Best lap for this car, 202. The Lamborghini last lap, 0.67 of a second quicker. That's why the gap is down to just under half a second. But it's the same old story. You can catch, you can get under the rear wing. There's one part of the racetrack we've seen Calderini having a little look. He's never given it 100% commitment because he himself didn't feel he was sufficiently far alongside the number 90 Mercedes AMG to be careful. That first waved yellow is midway down the pit it straight. It definitely is. Uh, we'll have another look in a few minutes at that overtake, but there's so much going on at the moment. Molinar is ahead of Lathoris now. There is Maxime Martin running um, in seventh place. Yes, suddenly he's made progress. Yeah, he's up ahead of Stuart Leonard. 
down to eighth. Gustavo Jakiman is ninth. There are the two Ferraris running together. So it is Muel Molina up ahead of Passin Lathoris. But as long as Passin can keep the car in that leading group within 10 seconds or so, uh, then uh, they've still got a chance coming oh, yeah. the last stint. He's not dropping too much time at all. No, I mean, Michele Ruggolo is going to be in the car for that final stint. And if that car is anywhere inside the top six, ideally, then it's, it's a, a, an opportunity, for certainly for the 50 Ferrari, to look at a podium opportunity, podium position. There's Maxime Martin. Good to see him again back in Blancpain GT Endurance. And he's lapping quicker than the next couple of cars ahead of him as the leaders come through club corner. Doesn't he always? He's one of the quickest guys oh, in absolutely. the GT car. Yeah. He's not yet on the pace of the leaders, but he's had traffic to worry about. But I suppose what I'm saying is he will close up in this stint as there, Gustavo Jakerman in ninth. ninth place has now got Lucas Stoltz behind him. Oliver Jarvis 11th, so the other Bentley. It was better placed than eight in the first stint, but it's not out of the equation yet. It's 17 seconds down on the race leader, Oliver Jarvis 11th. And then behind him uh, in 12th place is the number 12, Michele Beretta on the racing Lamborghini now. This is Calderelli's view once more, and it's the same view. It's still the back of a Mercedes. Yes, it is, and it's still the same part of the racetrack where he thought he might have a little look, but again, Meadows just goes to the left to check any prospect of the Lamborghini moving down the inside. So Michael Meadows showed, showed his hand maybe more than he's done previously by taking that more defensive entry into Brooklyn, but the outcome remains the same. Still leads probably by just about that half second it's been over the last number of laps. 0.384, if you want to be accurate about it. Now the race leaders go through Cox. Now have a look here at the overtake. Here it starts at Luffield. Jimmy Erickson on the inside of Passing Lathoris. Now, they're heading for a yellow flag zone. Remember, there's waved yellows at the corner. There's waved yellows before the corner. Is he ahead? From that angle, marginal. I would say he was... Yes, I, I would agree with you, but it's a, it's a, a very oblique angle to see. But they've so, certainly got past one. But, but the, the, the point that I would maybe make, did any of those three cars go through that yellow flag zone slower mm. than their previous best? Good question. Didn't look like it, did it? Not to me. No. I mean, that would be the issue I would have. I would bang them all to rights, all three of them. Turn them back in the pit lane. Sit there, you know, behave. You've yeah. been warned of telling you what you're going to do. There are marshals trackside. I'm, I'm a hard man. Uh, you are, but um, we wouldn't have you any other way, it says here. Now, <laughs> down towards the end of Vale, passing Lathoris. He's in sixth place now, just to make the point. The race order is Michael Meadows, Andrea Calderelli, Jimmy Erickson, Andy Suchek, fourth. Miguel Molina fifth, Placid Lathora sixth, Martin seventh, Leonard is eighth, Jakerman is ninth, Stoltz is tenth, and I'll give you Oliver Jarvis eleventh because he's in the Bentley. And the pole car, now with Danny Juncadea at the wheel, 28th, remember after its earlier stop go. I mean, how. I mean, I don't know what was in the mind of Sir Ayers when he decided to do that, but to lose that pole position advantage, the potential lead of this race, and now having that penalty dropping down into 28th position. That's in progress. There is the. Well, car was driven by Anthony West. That was one of the cars that brought out the safety car. So Chris Harris now picked behind the wheel. Chris, Yesterday's yeah. 50th place, and he's just lost out to uh, Edward Sandstrom, who's taken over the much penalised 85 from Mercedes. Last time I saw an onboard of Chris Harris in a race car was at Goodwood Revival. He's driving a gorgeous little 3A Porsche 356. And he ragged it all round <laughs> the Goodwood. And the thing loved it. The car responded. Anyway, let's get back to more contemporary things. That Chris Harris, this car, Chris Goodwin, and Alexander West will be driving it in Spa 24 hours. So this is an opportunity. They couldn't, the driver lineup couldn't do, I believe, the six hours at Paul Rico because that would have given them experience of not time racing prior to Spa. So they had decided this is where they would come. So, track is now green all the way around. Incident, car 32 and turn one under investigation. So that, I think, were the two Mercedes that we saw a few moments ago. The gap, first to second, well, it's still hovering around that half a second. Further back, we've got Jimmy Erickson within 2.6 seconds of the second place. And this is further down with the Ams. Out of Stowe, on that 37 we're on. An hour and 34 minutes of the race still to run. 
Gustavo Jakerman with a real queue behind him. Lucas Stoltz moving from a Bentley to a Mercedes this year. Oliver Jarvis next in the queue. Then there is the lapped Ferrari, number 11. Remember, that was in the gravel at Stowe early on. Andrea Rizzoli is now behind the wheel of that. But it's a long, long way down the order. It led, of course, Pro-Am until it got Adamed uh, late at Monza when Johnny Adam came storming by. But here it has given away, what, four laps, really, by being in the gravel earlier on. So big, big frustration. These endurance races, uh, really the current definition of an endurance race is a long sprint because if you lose laps, it's very hard to make them back Stolt up. Stolt Stolt makes the move. Yeah. That'll, that'll work, when it? That gives him the place. Yeah, I mean, it, it was almost as if he gave the position up. So Jakobin either was, didn't realise how close Stoltz was, but certainly the opportunity was opened up and it wasn't really defended once the nose of the Mercedes AMG got to the apex, that was it. So, slightly easy pass, I would have to say, in this instance. Now, Andy Suchek will be thinking, well, will I get such a generous opportunity or am I going to have to work a little bit harder again? Through goes Jakobin. A little bit of flapping bodywork there on the left front corner. Goes over the timing line. So Lukas Stoltz gains one spot out of all of that. That puts him ninth. Uh, what we don't have at the moment is a terribly high-running Pro-Am car. The leading Pro-Am is to be found now in 21st place. It's the Gunnar Bobelik car. Second, Martin Kodrich, having taken over from Adrian Amstutz. And Ahmad al Harfi, who won at Monza, is about, what, sixth, seventh in class at the moment. Quite a long way down. Now, I'll grant you we can all shuffle around with an hour and 33 minutes to go, but it's very much I, dominated I have, by Pro at the front. Am I missing something? Are oh. there any Audis in this race today? Because I'm looking down again, timing and scoring, and I'm well, struggling. Eighth, eighth is Stuart Leonard. OK. He's the best. Good, good. That's the best one. Yeah. In eighth place. But, just on the subject of who is where, um, 488, which is Renault Mastronardi, leads the AM Cup. Now, I said David Perrell was doing a good job when he was 28th or something earlier on, but Mastronardi is 20th, an AM Cup car, 20th out of 55. Yes, I know, safety cars, safety full cars, yellow, position, do shuffle whatever, whatever. but that's not bad going. Position, position, position. And, I mean, a great effort by an AM car. I mean, in a field of 55 cars, to actually get into the top 20, to get onto page one of the timing and scoring is unquestionably a great effort. 777 Lamborghini... See, well, that's in 43rd place. That's just <coughs> made up a position. As uh, there is 333. Now, that was Daniel Karlwitz. He has given that car over to Renat Salikov, and it is third in the Pro Am contest. So, 333 is 24th. But we've got all the Pro Ams behind the leading Am, would you believe, at the moment? Quite a turn up, this. There's Adrian Amstutz's car now with Martin Kodrich at the wheel. 89 goes through behind, which is the Daniele Perfetti Mercedes. Number two Audi through, a long way down. Of course, that car had to serve a very lengthy stop go earlier on, didn't it? So, 48 it is. There is 488, 20th overall. That's your leading am. Reno Astronardi, they led at Monza, remember, until an engine problem badly delayed the car. So, hoping for better fortune here. And he's on the back of the 19. Giambaria, yeah. So, it's it's a sister, great sister, effort. Sister, yeah, the sister car to the winningest car, the, the 63 Lamborghini. So, Reno Mastronardi in the Ferrari. A Rinaldi racing car yeah. through Cops. So, Rinaldi he do a really good job with these customer 48, four, four, five, eights and 488s. Four, eight, do. Eight. do indeed. And for some reason, they just love that lovely fresh green colour chasing the 19 Lamborghinis. It's interesting to compare the performances of the, the two Grasso Racing Lamborghinis, the 19 and the 63. And just in case you were wondering, because it's an Italian car and it's Rinaldi Racing, it's actually a German team that elected to, to use the, the name of Rinaldi Racing. So it sounds all very Italian, but it's a, a German team. You're, you're going to tell me Castle Racing is an Italian team. <laughs> <laughs> so Mastro Rinaldi hustles out of snow. Working his way down through Vale. We're almost at the halfway point here. As there, up the inside goes number 14. And under attack because he just gained and then lost the place back again. So through goes now Raffaele Giammaria, moving himself 18th ahead of Lawrence Frey. And Mastronardi tries to squeeze up the inside as well. Yeah, he didn't have the momentum or the track position. The Jaguar was always going to come back, swing across the apex, ran wide in the exit, but nevertheless consolidated. So the lead am car, you know, don't get too greedy, you're doing a great job, you're running in top 20, in 20th position you know, if, if the position is offered up to you then take it, but your race is to win your category 
So now Mastronardi tries to find a way up past Lawrence Frey. This, in the meantime, is the view from Andrea Calderelli. They're both running wide, aren't they? The two yeah. leaders coming out of Cops. Need to be careful because if you run all four wheels right off the exit of Cops, that again is something that will be observed. It's easy to do because it allows you to free the car up on the exit and get better exit speed. So you, you want to maximise what you've got in Cops Corner, particularly if you're being pursued by a car, which potentially, if it was able to get ahead of you, but it's the 84 Mercedes, Jimmy Erickson. He's the he's up there, isn't he? Yes, he's, he's closed right up to the back of the 63 at Lamborghini. We're also getting a report that 86 is losing its bonnet. 86 being uh, the Hunter Abbott Mike Scheme Mercedes that Damien Faulkner is behind. Let's catch up though on more AM news. Down to the pits in Dakota. You're currently leading AM and 20th overall. Absolutely amazing. Yes, we are doing very well, like we did the Monza, so hopefully the engine will stay. Do you think you can keep this pace up? Well, because we know in the car, yes. When I go in, it's going to be a little slower again. And when do we expect you in the car? In about 30 minutes. Let's see what you got. Good luck. Very experienced driver, Pierre. Been around for a long, long time. Um, it's very self-effacing. Well, I, I like that because he doesn't pretend to be a you know, youngster, you know, 55 kilograms ringing wet. He's just a regular guy who loves his motor racing, and he does it very, very well. So, you know, he, he just accepts his ability and the restrictions, limitations. But it's great to see a car that you're going to step into. It is currently, by a country mile, 33rd is the next car in that category. That's the number three WRT ID. Oh, for the lead to the outside line goes Calderelli. Sorry, John, but that was his yep. best chance yet. He had a real go on the outside line. Michael Meadows hangs on to it as across the timing line behind them. Third is Jimmy Erickson. And now Michael Meadows does really have to go defensive down towards Cops. Was yeah, that more than one well, change? I, would, I wouldn't want to see any more because if you start going defensive and making a blocking manoeuvre to prevent what might not have happened, but in the mind of Michael Meadows could have been a possibility. He didn't want to have it, but then he came back again to get onto the line he would like. But again, Jimmy Erickson is the car that's sitting there waiting to pick up the pieces and the 84 car right now, these three, looks to be the quickest. Now, if the Lambo can get past the lead Mercedes AMG, maybe that circumstance will change. But this is a three-way battle for the lead, and it is any one of these three cars at any point which find itself in the lead. So Ericsson now applying pressure to Calderelli. That's what Meadows needs, really, because if Calderelli has to start defending, he might be able to build that lead. But Calderelli doing a good job of attacking and defending at the same time. He's in this invidious position of doing two things at once. Coming now through club corner. Runs it a little bit wide up over the curb, but Michael Meadows has gapped him by another length or so, but it's still very tight between these three. The two Mercedes both into the mix now, whereas they weren't really in the first stint. The constant has been that Lamborghini. So. Further down the field, just for those fans of Giancarlo Fisichella, he's in the car and he's making further progress up to 12th position in the 55 of Ferrari. There we see coming out of the loop. And then the quick flick, it's just flat out. Again, you can use the outside, the AstroTurf. Remaining stuck down is the 7 Bentley. Still Ollie 11. Jarvis, he's involved in that battle. Yakiman just ahead of him. So he's not managed to do what the number four, Lucas Stoltz, Mercedes AMG, achieved a few laps earlier. And even the Ferrari looking, well, they got, this is Fisichella directly behind the Bentley. So that's going to be an interesting little battle between former Grand Prix star and a, a driver who would love to have achieved that accolade. And then on the back of Fisichella is the badly delayed Ferrari number 11, which is, of course, the Pro-Am entry, it's Andrea Rizzoli at the wheel in 46th place, but it's got the pace to live with these cars. Well, more than that, he's got the, 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 the flashing headlights yeah. to say, you know, I'm, I may be out of the, the game, but I want through, because I'm quicker than you, and you, and you. Right, Lucas Stoltz, who was involved in the incident at Cops, is being given a five-minute stop-go penalty for causing a collision. Remember, Benjamino Caccia ended up in the gravel, well, we Stoltz did. is deemed to be the guilty party, Five minutes stop go penalty for number four. At this very part of the racetrack, Cops Corner. So the contact was in the entry to the corner, and that spun the one of the Mercedes AMGs into the gravel. And Lucas Stoltz has been deemed to have been the guilty party, and that's a five minute stop go, effectively just over two laps. 
That's going to have a little bearing on uh, the battle for the top six, because that or top eight, because Stoltz is currently in eighth place. He's going to drop down minimum two laps. Yeah. And Oli Jarvis is about to gain the place, is he, at the expense of Gustavo Yakuman? He has a look to the inside. And he keeps on coming. Yakuman tries to close the door. The big Bentley right there behind him. Fissy Keller looking to try and squeeze away through as well if he can. Down into Vale. Have a look, Ollie. Oh, I'll stick it down the inside, Ollie. Now here are the leaders. And they are three oh, for the lead. And Ericsson it. goes second up on the inside line. No Job done. No surprise about that, but the undercut, the Lamborghini's gonna come back. And Ericsson dived on the inside. He had to run high on the exit of the loop. But this is our real battle. Michael Meadows has been absolutely peerless and managing to keep the Lamborghini behind him, but Jimmy Erickson getting impatient now. You can see the reaction to being overtaken, albeit for one corner. From Andrea Calderon, he's now decided, I've had enough of looking at the rear of number 90 Mercedes AMG, I need to get on with the programme because I could be under threat. I've been overtaken momentarily, got it back again, but yeah. I don't need that distraction. But fourth is Andy Suchek, and he's closing, because while these three are holding each other up by squabbling or perhaps being held up by the Mercedes, discuss. Andy Suchek has got pretty much clear real estate ahead of him, so he's lapping in the two-minute twos quicker than the three ahead of him. So Bentley number eight fourth all of a sudden becomes a dark horse here. Bentley number eight started on the 14th row of the grid. I mean, it's... Do what? <laughs> yeah. so, it again, shows how you can make the pit stops of the safety cars work for your advantage, doesn't it? Exactly what Bentley had done. There is the number four placed car. The Bentley comes into sight. An ID behind it, and that is the 72. So through Stowe, That's lap the 43, they come, and Andy Suchek is closing up. We're going to have a four-way fight for honours pretty soon. As they work their way down through Vale. Number five Audi, Will yes. Stevens has been in the pits for a clutch problem, we understand. Well, it's a shame, because that was Dries Van Thor, started that car, so... Oh, sort of really a, not a great day. No, big frustration. Stuart Leonard's still ninth, and he's about to be eighth, isn't he? Upholding the honour about it, because ahead of him, Lucas Stoltz will have to serve his penalty. And Maxi Martin has made a further position up now to sixth place. So Passan Lothoros drops down from sixth to seventh. He's had to so, come to the pressure from the BMW. Now, we were sent a tweet a little while ago by Alan Prosser, who is watching the coverage, and he reckons, and we're going to try and see what Alan sees, that a wheel nut goes flying off Johnny Kane's car. Now, have a look to the to the right-hand side of the screen, because as they go through Beckett's, is it a wheel nut, is it debris after the impact? Let's have a look. There's the moment of impact, and bits go flying. No, I think that's bodywork, that's bodywork. Is body there a wheel nut in there? No, that's bodywork, I, okay. I would say. It looks like there was no wheel nut to be honest, because we didn't, we, that was a bit of bodywork. Uh, I, oh, there's a nut there, there's a wheel nut. I, no, that's bodywork as well. There's something skipping and jumping and bumping. I don't know where the wheel nut got, or whether it may still be attached to just the, the rim has failed. Don't know. Yeah. The team undoubtedly would have a better idea when they get the car back into the garage. But good thought, Alan. So yeah. we've had a look, well, and you know, you're the, right. Well, thank you for spotting the debris yeah. flying, but... We, yeah, it was uh, certainly an impact and certainly a big, big hit for Johnny Kane. But uh, the um, photograph that Alan has sent is the screen grab, and he's highlighted all these little bits flying. So he was asking the question, is one of those a wheel nut? I think we've probably answered that for now, hopefully, but good call. Hopefully it was bodywork. It had the look of bodywork. Yeah. A wheel nut would um, probably, its trajectory would have been slightly different. There's not a huge amount of energy in a He's all down the inside, he squeezes through Michael Meadows, makes the pass, he needed to do that. Jimmy Erickson gets through as well, so now we've just got the idea ahead. And again, look how close the Lamborghini is. Never really a possibility to pass up into Abbey, and Michael Meadows is going to have to be a bit defensive because he knows that this is a potential problem area. It was very tense, very tense indeed goes to the middle of the racetrack to deny the Lamborghini any opportunity. So again, Calderaldi were looking to place his car. He needs, it's, it's, it's where you position your car to get the best off the corner. And again, behind Jimmy Erickson, he's thinking the same way. So these drivers are both racing are close. This is going to be interesting coming down into Brooklyn. So Mercedes AMG of number 90 goes clearly to the middle of the racetrack. Audi is still there. 
Can the Lamborghini sweep round the outside and get track position into Luffield? Not Jimmy quite. Erickson sits there and thinks, ooh, although up the inside. Well, wow. How about that? If there's no gap, make a gap. Absolutely. And I think the Bentley might have slipped through as well. I think Andy Suchek <laughs> might have slipped up there. Hello. First time I've seen him smile all weekend. No, it wasn't. It, the Bentley, Bentley still Bentley falls, but it's hunting him down. Right. So now, can Jimmy Erickson do to Michael Meadows what Andrea Calderani couldn't? In other words, find a way past him. That was always the issue that Calderani would have had. He was trying to get past the 90 Mercedes AMG, but he had the 84 Mercedes AMG directly behind him. And you, you get wrong footed with traffic yeah. and you, you're trying to find three cars going into Brooklyn. You go one way, yeah, I've got it. And then suddenly you realize that option has been shut down and you're being overtaken by the 84. Marco Portolotti stands to have a drink of water. His car led, it was second, it's now third. I mean, it's not a mile back, is it? It's less than a second away from the leader. Suchek hunting down the three leading cars. Mercedes one and two, but two different teams operate these cars. The Aka ASP car leading of Michael Meadows. Second is the HTP Motorsport car in the hands of Jimmy Erickson, who goes to the outside line at the end of Vale. Is he going to be able to drive around the outside? No. Now, can he get up the inside oh. coming through club? Michael Meadows slows the pace right down. Calderelli almost into the back of Erickson. Three for the lead after an hour and 40 minutes of racing. Fantastic stuff. And Andy Suchek is almost there. Here comes Calderelli back up the inside, has a look, pulls back in. No way whatsoever into Abbey, but I thought there was almost contact between the, the lead Mercedes and the second place Mercedes. Jimmy Erickson got so, so close. You can hear the brakes squealing in the Lamborghini as they break down into farm, then up into the loop. This is so a real no satisfaction corner. I don't know why, but it's a key corner to getting onto the straight through Aintree Flabber. Now, Ericsson, you've done the hard yards to get ahead of the Lamborghini. Did it very successfully indeed in Luffield Corner. Slipped up the inside. The door was opened up. It wasn't a mistake on the part of Calderelli. He just opened the door. And beside him, before he could save, Jimmy Ericsson, there was the 84 Mercedes AMG. Well, the Ericsson family having a good spell at the moment. Jimmy has always been good in single seaters and proving the point that he's still very quick in a GT car. His uh, younger brother Joel, currently the championship leader in FIA Formula 3 European Championship races. He's had a couple of wins, one of which was here, in fact, a month ago. So the Ericsson family doing well, whether it's in a closed car or a single seater. Out of Cops Corner goes Ericsson. He's half a second back from Meadows. We're about 17 minutes away from the next round of pit stops. And Lucas Stoltz has just pitted in order to serve that stop-go penalty. Now, how is the Bentley getting on? Number eight, Andy Suchek, two seconds back. There is Andy Suchek, and coming onto the hangar straight. Look, he's almost with that leading group. Suchek is almost there, and Maxim Sule to do the last in. That's still a very well-placed car. Oh, it is. I mean, a Bentley have come alive, and it's, ironically, it's the number eight car that is in the position right now. And we know the Bentley won here two years ago. A great, memorable day for the mark. And it was a great fight. In fact, Maxim Sule was, in a sense, the star in that number eight car on that day. Interestingly, the cars in fifth and sixth, the Ferrari in fifth and the BMW in sixth, are lapping quicker by the best part of over half a second. Number seven, Bentley, about to be tagged into a spin. Yes, physical. Yeah. Now, what happens there, pro on pro? Yeah, and that was probably, you know, oh, oh, that was unpleasant. <laughs> I think that'll be judged to be a racing incident. The Ferrari, I mean, okay, it wasn't fair and square alongside, but it was sufficiently up in my view that you have to allow a car working room. OK. So but the stewards will look at it and make indeed, a judgment. Indeed. Lucas Stoltz currently serving his five minutes stop-go penalty for putting number 32 in the gravel as you ride on board with the Lamborghini. Andrea Calderelli still on the tail of Jimmy Erickson, who's so busy defending he can't fully attack the Mercedes. And Andy Suchek fourth is almost there. There's more traffic up the road. Ahead of the leaders, there are three more back markers. So Michael Meadows in a moment will go, oh no, I've got to get through this lot as well as defend. He's almost on the traffic. The first back marker is Chris Harris, actually. And the 188 McLaren, he's going to have to negotiate him first of all as they go over the timing line. 46 laps in the book, 15 minutes to go really before we get to the next round of stops. Yes, and the key to Michael Meadows is, is not catching, but where do I catch? And sometimes what you want to do, instead of catching somebody in a, in a difficult part of the racetrack, is momentarily just breathe the engine a little bit earlier don't quite break so late as you normally do and focus on where your strengths are going to be and build to then achieve that 
So it, it doesn't help to get under somebody's rear wing and then lose your momentum and, and hand that advantage over to your pursuers. A flash of the lights from Michael Meadows to say, I'm the leader, get out of the way, please, give me the room. But Chris Harris has to turn into the corner eventually, so is Michael Meadows through? Not yet. So that brings the second and third place cars even closer as they drop down to the end of Vale. To the inside of the back marker goes Michael Meadows, he's gone through. Jimmy Erickson follows suit and Andy Suchek is almost on the back of Calderelli now. The two Mercedes AMGs, one and two, absolutely together. Yeah, and they got through quickly and cleanly. The Lambo was very marginally compromised, but obviously Chris Harris has got to go somewhere. He just can't vanish. And Giancarlo Fisichella, a drive-through penalty yep. for causing that collision. Yeah, it's a harsh judgment, but... Oh, whoa, whoa, Ericsson up the outside, coming into farm. Can't do it there, but can he get up the inside, going into the loop? Michael Meadows fends him off. Calderelli wants to try and dive-bomb them as well, if he can. Here comes Ericsson to the inside line, in towards entry now. If he stays tight up behind, he might be able to make a move at Brooklands, but Michael Meadows also having to focus on the traffic up the road. He can't afford to be any hesitant at all with those back markers ahead of him, but equally he can't afford to commit and get himself in strife. To the outside line goes Ericsson, but look at Calderelli up the inside. Ericsson's going to have the inside, is he for Love Field? No, he's got to drop back in as Michael Meadows switches sides, gets through the traffic. Back marker on the outside, Calderelli trying to buy into this as well. Un unbelievable, I mean this is, you, you can't get closer motor racing. Absolutely stunning. Michael Meadows calm under extreme pressure and particularly that pressure from the traffic that he was having to negotiate through now he can momentarily catch his breath Jimmy Erickson's thought oh what have I got to do I've done everything I can and Calderelli finding looking to find a way to regroup and get that 63 Lamborghini back to the front of the pack 12 or so minutes before we anticipate pit stops but remember everybody stopped early yeah so just thinking about fuel and how far they might be able to go as we look at the back of the Ericsson Mercedes AMG, slight advantage coming onto the straight for yeah. the number 90. It's got it, and now it's the 84 is under threat. And Andy Suchek directly and all over the shop, one side back again. And you've still got the Lamborghini trying to get out of the way, the Pro Am Lamborghini. Down through Vale they go. Just to go back to John's point, they did stop early, but of course they carried on with safety car lap, so that will have Maybe brought the pace down, it's yeah. offset it a bit, I would propose. Yeah, you're looking at second, third and fourth, Michael Meadows, whoa, he's got a gap for about the first time in, what, 40 minutes? Yep, it's just the traffic management has worked favourably, and those pursuing have had to deal with it, and it got very messy. Coming out of Luffy, I thought, we're never going to see all these three cars make it through Woodcut, but we did. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've little faith. Well, it, it, it's... It gets so intense, the, the yeah. degree of concentration, almost, you sort of explode in terms of there's only so much pressure, stress, that you have got the capacity to deal with. And it's almost like you have a, a, a white out or something. Hard to explain the emotion that you feel. But that's where being ultra fit, mm. not just fit, but ultra fit, pays dividends. It enables you to have that capacity, that mental capacity that you need to draw upon in those kind of situations. And mentally fit as well. Now, Oliver Jarvis, after his spin in number seven, down in 17th place, so what was looking fairly promising, now I'm afraid he's looking a bit bleaker for number seven, so Bentley hopes are on Andy Suchek, who is almost there, creeping up onto the back of Calderelli. So it's Christian Engelhardt who will take over the Lamborghini. It's going to be Maxim Soule to take over the Bentley. It'll be Maxi Buch in the 84 Mercedes, and the number 90 uh, Mercedes, Eduardo. Raphael in Marchiello. Oh. Yes, it is. Yes, Raph, yes. So that is going to be well, I mean, a, a stellar lineup. Absolutely, for the last you've got three great drivers going into the three leading cars, and I mean, the, hopefully, we'll not see the pit stops determining the outcome of this uh, final hour of racing. Katsumasa Chio in the Nissan is currently 12th, and this is traffic. He's trying to find a way past. His next target is Andrew Watson, who is 11th, and we have warning of debris on the track at turn two but off the racing line so the leading cars go by and turning into Cops Corner, Katsumasa Gio 14th he is. The sister car the 22 car dropped way down to 30th position Matthew Sims behind the wheel of that car I don't know why, because at one point it was ahead of its sister 23 car but might all mean to do with when they pitted and how the pit stops worked for them or worked against them maybe but there you've got Captain Masaccio still pressing on to try and get himself up the order. 
His next target is going to be the Kelly Barretta, just ahead, in fact, in the red, white and blue Lamborghini. There, Andrew Watson in the McLaren running 11th, tries to make a move up on the inside. One of the McLarens that's lost out pretty badly in all of this, seemingly, is 58, which has gone way, way down the order. The Rob Bell, Cole Ledegar and Van Barnico car. So Andrew Watson did have a look into Stowe, but being on the inside, you have to back out of it a little bit earlier. And Yuckerman in the Lamborghini wouldn't be prepared to give that up particularly easily. So this group of cars, this is the 10th battle through to 15th. And it is no less intense than the battle we've been watching, pretty much fixated to for the top position with the second and third places. Almost swapping by the lap, if not sometimes by the corner. So the McLaren, Andrew Watson comes out behind the Lamborghini. Lamborghini maybe a little bit more initial squirt. McLaren, still a great race car, but they never really found the sweet spot and saying they can't quite get the sweet spot of the tyre to work in their favour, particularly in qualifying when it is so sure. important to, to gain the advantage of that new tyre to get your grid position. Not, they were out of position, like many teams were this weekend. This is the fight for 10th then. 10th is Jakerman in the orange Lamborghini, 11th is Andrew Watson, 12th it is Raffaele Giammaria, and then 13th behind as they work their way over the line is Michele Beretta, 14th Captain Masaccio. So all in the line there, turning into Cop's corner. This is a genuine battle pack for position. And we are looking at about eight more minutes before cars head for the pit lane. Now there's another incident under investigation. It is between Audi number three and Ferrari 53. Number three has at the wheel Nicky Mar Malhoff and 53. I need to try and find him. Where's the it is Louis Machiels yeah. in 39th place. Right, you're riding on board with Alex Bunk, no, you're not, Katz Masaccio, forgive me, in the Nissan, and he's going to get up the inside of Michele Beretta in the Lamborghini. The Nissan's going to go through there. Was that One a touch place or gained. It looked like a minor touch between the McLaren and the Lamborghini. Possibly so. Side by side out of Stowe they come. You're on board the Nissan, but the Lamborghini gets back up on the inside line there to the outside. There's traffic around them as well. Chio can't find a way past the Ombra Racing Lamborghini, which in turn tries to get up alongside the GRT car. So bear in mind, we've been racing for nearly two hours. This is for 10th place. This is fantastic stuff. There's no success ballast, there's no DRS, there's nothing like that. It's just pure racing. And what a fight it is turning out to be. And Gustavo Yakerman, sponge-like, soaking up the pressure. He's still 10th with the Northern Irish driver, Andrew Watson, right on his tail. Then it's Raffaele Giammaria, the man that won the first ever Blanc Pan Endurance race for Porsche at Monza. Behind him is Michele Beretta who was reloaded here in his quest to try and gain ground and fend off 14th place, Captain Masaccio. And now it's time for Christian Engelhardt to get ready to take over 63. Yep. Well, it says on the lid, you're going to watch motor racing. This is motor racing. I mean, you can't get any more, you know, in terms of and Maxi Book just walking out of the uh, HTP garage as well, you can't get any closer. We've had battles like this all the way from the front to the middle to the back. And we're just focusing on this one now for outside of the, the top 10 down to 15. And Andrew Watson looks to make a move coming down, pitch straight. Hasn't got the speed where it counts. Has to draw back in again, get in behind the Lamborghini to get the optimum entry point into Cop's corner. And further back, the 19. GM Lamborghini sitting again, just holding station, watching the, his younger, younger compatriots, contemporaries. Now that is Stuart Leonard in, and he will give way to Jake Dennis. So that's the first of the next routine stops. And interestingly, 55 has not yet, I don't think, served that drive-through penalty. Has he? Jack Carlifisi Keller's penalty is still shown on the screen. Anyway, we look at 10th and down towards Stowe Corner. Yakerman fending off Watson, who's now got Jamaria tucked up behind him once again. There are the leaders. Michael Meadows hanging on to the advantage. Jimmy Erickson behind him. This is going to be an amazing last stint, isn't it? We've got four cars still, all with the chance of winning the race. Fifth, Miguel Molina is getting in touch as well, look, because he, in the background, is creeping into the mix. So make it a five-way fight with just over an hour to go. So who will be first in? I suspect it's the 63 because 
Christian Engelhardt looks like he is ready as the Lamborghini peeling <laughs> off and they all peel off all three leaders into the pits at the same time or oh, five so, leaders oh, five, oh God. in they come so there they are one two three four wait for the Ferrari five that is the battle that's the race so we'll see now in what order they leave because if the order shuffles you know that somebody has either made a bad pit stop or somebody has been under on the regulation time Andrea Calderati detaching all the, the cables the radio Whatever else, he takes the seat insert out, he's slightly shorter than Mooka Bottolotti or Christian Engelhardt, so the Mercedes 84 comes up to its stop. And Jimmy Erickson, who's had a great stint behind the wheel, gets he'll get out as you look at Engelhardt getting attached to the the various to the radio and you sometimes they have a drinks bottle, they've got other attachments in the car. So this will put into the lead of the race now the number 42 Alvaro Parent McLaren, but only because he's yet to stop. It's not there on pure pace, with respect. Uh, Patin Lathoris has come in as well, as has Maxime Martin. So, seven out of the top eight in the pits. Gustavo Jakerman will be in as well, so he bails out of that 10th placed fight. Now, GRT, you're looking at, have to be careful when they release the Lamborghini, but go, go, go is the indication. So, he's rolling. Now, the Mercedes getting its right side wheels fitted, the Lamborghini rolling down the pits. But they can't release it because two more cars are coming down. The Lamborghini is behind. Still, is it coming down? That's the Lamborghini now. And they're delaying it, delaying it, delaying it. That would go... Oh, that's like... They've got to go. So the Mercedes 90 is behind the Lamborghini and the 84 will be behind the 90. So Lamborghini gets the lead on the pit stops. It came in that third was, and it's now leading. That was key. They had to find a way. They, they couldn't... Is he adjusting the steering column there as he was moving? I thought, I wonder if it was an adjustable fore and aft steering column on the, the Lamborghini. It looked like he was actually adjusting it to bring it further forward. So Christian Engelhardt in 63 leads. Raffaele Marchiello is behind. So was that because it was a slow pit stop from Aka ASP or was it slightly too quick from the GRT team? Well, the pit stop times will be analysed and if it was under the regulation uh, times, then a penalty will come. We'll wait and see if that pans out in a negative way for GRT. Now, what's happening behind Michael Meadows? It is in third place now, Maxi Book. So third in and first out, number 63 Lamborghini. Where is the Bentley out of all of this? It's dropped a long way back There's and it's lost a yes. place, I think, as well. Is it 72 behind ahead? Behind the Ferrari, we yeah. think. So, so it looks the, like Davide the Lamborghini is... slides through some of the lap traffic. Davide Rigon fourth, Maxim Sule fifth. Yes, we've had that change. So the Mercedes, we understand... So this is the 84 Mercedes. Yes, was a stop of a minute and 26. 24. The maximum time is a minute and 24. Yeah. So it was two seconds slower. So it was a minute and 26. Yeah. Yeah. So those extra yeah, two, two seconds, seconds delayed yeah. it. But what about number 90? Because that has also been bugged. So it looks at the moment on the evidence that we have that it was a very good stop from GRT rather than it being under the regulation time. So there, look. That's where a couple of seconds are lost. Yes. So he's waiting. But then then he goes. Yeah. And, of course, that then is the reason why. And he's got 59 and he gets the McLaren, which is a car that Maximilian Book wants to get around at the quickest time. He's going into the pits anyway, so he's cleared it. But um, you know, any time you lose behind a car, you can see there's more clear air between the first and second, second and third cars than probably at any point, almost in the last hour. As the pit lane gets very busy, as the field from further down the top 10, the top 20 makes their way in. So the 19, the Lamborghini, the left side tyres come off. So the, the gunman pulls the wheel off, the additional one puts them on. Run by the car, off the jacks, but look, you're going to have to push the car back in his stall. Can he get clear or not? No, they should have pushed the car back in the first place. They shouldn't have let it roll forward. Now he's rolling. And that is one of the issues, one of the difficulties with such a large field is that there's no pit lane big enough in the world to get everybody in with space around to work. So that's why you have to talk to your neighbours. There is the McLaren. So that was the car that went Lamborghini. You can see the right rear body workers well and truly chewed away. I don't know what would have done that, whether that was contact or... We don't think that car had a tyre problem that would have shredded the rear of the car, but clearly part of it meant just another ka for the spares department at McLaren Automotive. I've just been looking at pit stop times. The 
time that you have to hit is a minute and 24 seconds in the pit lane. That was achieved by number 63 at 1 minute 24. It was 1 minute 26 for number 84, as we'd seen, and it was 1 minute 27 for number 90. So that explains why the Mercedes have dropped back. They were slightly slower on the release than was the, the Lamborghini. 63. Yeah, the Lamborghini had almost the first pit box yeah. as you come in. So they were able to get in lined up and they didn't have anybody ahead of them. So they were able to do their work and they did it really, really efficiently as they have done really since the start of the season. The 63 car has been the winningest car uh, this part of the season to date, either in sprint or in endurance. So what we now have is a fight to the flag between Christian Engelhardt and the Lamborghini and Raffaele Marchiello, as you see the Nissan is in for Alex Buncombe to take over number 23. And then behind Marchiello is Maxi Book. Behind him is Davide Rigon and then Maxime Sule. So it's the five cars we had before the last pit stop in a shuffled order. We get a, a really good indication of just what's involved in these pit stops. And choreographing it to ensure that they're, and they're now the right hand side has got to go on. Same principle, less room to work because you're closer to the watch this. Look at this. Right. The Shuffling Aston, going on back and forward. Yeah, the Aston Martin has got Johnny Adam behind the wheel, so get ready to be amazed. But he's got work to do, Johnny, this time. He's third in class, but let's see what he can do. In fact, he might or already have got second. Let me just double check what's behind him now, because yes, he's ahead there of 87, so the Aston Martin is second. He's just got past the 87 Mercedes, which has now got Nico Bastian at the wheel. So there, Johnny Adam up to second in Pro-Am, and he's got 58 minutes to try and catch now. Number 67 with Clement Mathieu at the wheel, the Attempto Lamborghini. You well, ready? Uh, no, I mean, all I'm doing is thinking back to Monza yeah, when God. Johnny Adam got behind the wheel of that Aston Martin there, the 55 Ferrari which had to suffer a penalty for the contact with Oliver Jarvis's number seven Bentley a little earlier. And that car yes. now is down in 16th place, number seven Bentley. Stephen Kane has got behind the wheel of it, so that's also going to be one to watch. So the race leaders currently are on lap number 54. More serve their next regulation stop. You have to make two pit stops in a three-hour race like this. It's in the regulations, but you'd have to anyway for fuel. Interestingly, the 88 car, the pool sitting car, which then got the penalty, not because of Daniel Juncadella, but Juncadella's in the car currently as it comes into the pit lane, up to second place. But of course, once the pit stops cycle through, it'll be further down the field. Disappointment for the 88 car, which Juncadella particularly was expecting great results from. Indeed so, as the leaders then are currently on, as I say, that 54. Now, with some peeling off, it gives the lead back to Christian Engelhardt, and he is now four, uh, four tenths of a second ahead of Raffaele Marchiello. Maxi Book is a further two seconds back. And Marchiello's last, sorry, Maxi Book's last lap, quicker than the two ahead of him. So it's Constantinering up again. Number 50 Ferrari, Michele Rugolo at the wheel, is now where in the pack? Nine. Seventh if you take those that have pitted out of oh, the way. Oh, I take the, yes, yeah, So, yeah, yeah. seventh, seventh yes. of those that have made their final pit stop. Yeah. Right, there's your leader in the green Lamborghini. That is Christian Engelhardt. Behind him, Raffaele Marchiello. 88 has pitted then, so Denny Junkadea into the pit lane. Another of the quick Acker ASP cars blasts away. It's good to see Acker ASP now fighting for overall wins, not just class wins, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I mean, it just indicates just the strength that Mercedes-AMG have with this car, that they've got two separate teams Effectively, they're both quasi-factory teams, but they're both running and capable of competing against each other. Um, you know, the, 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 AMG, the AM, Mercedes AMG has turned out to be one of those really outstanding, what I would call turnkey GT3 yeah. cars. Go along with that. You go along and buy it, the factory, or maybe you buy it through your local dealer, and uh, get the spares package that goes along with it, and hey-ho, you can go motor racing. Absolutely. Now, Domenia Rigon there tries to get up the inside of the traffic. Treble 7, Mike Sturzberg at the wheel of it. Experienced VLN racer. We used to see Mike in the Harry Bow Porter, if you remember, many years ago. It's especially around the Nordschleife. Good to see him at Silverstone for a change. As the leading gap, I reckon he's opening up a little bit now. Engelhardt's getting away, isn't he, from Raffaele Marchiello? It'll not come easy to... The 80 or the 90 Mercedes, if that's going to be the case. Marcello is a very feisty racer. You see the 8 Bentley with Maxime Soule behind the wheel. So making up some time with the background. Because there is the lead car, the second base car. Third is actually just about to overtake the Ferrari, but can't get it done. Maximilian Book 
You can hardly see him, he's so small, sits so low in the car. But he will get up alongside and will take... Well, he didn't, I thought he was going to take the position away and he'll be frustrated by that because he does not want to lose contact. If he lets the 90 Mercedes AMG get three or four seconds, it's going to be slightly more difficult to get back into contact, such as the closeness of these, these cars. Now, number 90 Mercedes second. It was a great middle stint done by Michael Meadows in that car. Let's hear from him. Now, Michael, unfortunately, the Lamborghini has overtaken you, but let's talk about that defending. He has a mega over defending. Yeah, it was tough. You know, about halfway through, I was struggling with the tyres and, you know, but it's Silverstone and my home, so I wanted to at least give the car over in the lead. And, um, but I don't think we really have the ultimate pace of the Lamborghini, so. We had to be a bit robust, and especially when we got in traffic, it was difficult because once I was offline, I couldn't be quick where I needed to be. I was a bit of a sitting duck on the straights. Now, Raffaele is in the car now. Do you think he can catch up? I hope so. We've given him the best chance. We saved, you know, we saved the new tyres for him and everything. So hopefully he can go out there and, uh, you know, hopefully he can get the win. But if not, it's it would be nice if we can get on the podium at, at my home race. Hopefully he'll do me a favour. Good luck. Thank you. I certainly during the course of his stint, but it is good to see Michael Meadows reminding people of his ability by fighting for outright wins. Yes, and he had to drive what I would call an intelligent stint because he was always under threat. He was having, he didn't drive aggressively, defensively. He used what he had to his maximum strengths, and it was a tough stint. You could see, looking at his face, the depth of concentration that he's been required to invest in. You know, he's tired mentally. He's tired. So now the pressure is on Maxi Book, but he's not catching, is he, for the moment? He has dropped back a little bit on this lap, I fear, for Raffaele Marcello. We'll see what the gaps are. But 84 Mercedes, winning car here last year, is two and a half seconds back. That was a slow lap, that was a two minutes three. Where's the traffic that would have impeded him? Uh, he's just got to let him settle down. He's okay. not really, when he began this stint, he was always going to have to battle through some of the back markers. Now he's got, relatively speaking, clear air and they've not, they've not a great prospect of catching up to any large group of cars that will be lapped, so maybe he can, just, but it's going to be tough because the 90, yeah. driven by uh, Raffaele Marcello, is, is, he is a, a strong, strong competitor, and he's shown that True. pretty much since the start of the year. Certainly, I was impressed with his feistiness in Mazzano when he passed Dominic Barman in the second of the sprint races, I think it was, on the Sunday. A little while ago, we talked about 85 Mercedes having a drive-through for taking its earlier drive-through when the safety car was out. Well, it's now been given another drive-through for going through a red light at pit out. The team manager of number 333 Ferrari, the Salikov, Maxwell, Kyovitz Ferrari, is now being summoned to see the race director. And there is a drive-through penalty for number 86, which is the Hunter Abbott Mike Skeen Damien Faulkner Mercedes for causing a collision. Oh, well. But that's been, there's been so much action on track, we haven't had a chance to catch up with a lot of these incidents. There is the second place Mercedes, AMG coming out of the loop. And Max Pocus, he's not, in my terms, making progress. The gap looks to be pretty static around that two plus seconds between second and third. Whether the 90 Mercedes as we heard from Michael Meadows, it, it doesn't have maybe the straight line performance, but it's a pretty effective race car. And of course, it will maybe come down to the, the final where you catch the traffic. Mm. So, Raffaele Marcello do the single seater thing and, and be ultra aggressive, or we don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Well, Marcello's last lap is a personal best, so he's brought the gap down to 1.4 seconds. That is the Attempto Lamborghini 66 at the end of Vale. So that car is now in 20th place. Marco Mappelli at the wheel. Marco, who has the fastest lap around the Dorch Lifer in a road car, a road game Lamborghini. There is the Pro Am leader. Now that is Patrick Kuyla. He leads Pro Am. And guess who's second in Pro Am? It is Johnny Adam. So Kuyla to Mappelli, eight seconds. Mappelli to the next car is a further four. And then it's two back to Johnny Adam. So he's got to make up round about, let's say, 12 seconds. Well, he's got 50 minutes in which to do it. And what we saw at Monza was remarkable. Mm. You know, one of those special events um, when a driver really outperforms his equipment. And uh, whether that's going to be available to him today or not, different situation, circuit, strengths, plays to that of the Aston, plays to that of the 
So there is the Aston Martin, third of those three cars coming down the Wellington Strait. You can see the 02 on the top right hand part of his windscreen indicating second in category. That's the Pro Am category. Trouble is, here he's chasing Patrick Kuehler, who is very quick as well, and they're both doing lap times in the two minute twos. And also, bad news for Johnny Adam, he's stuck in traffic. You're on board with him now, the TF Sport run car, Tom Ferrier's team. Johnny Adam, Aston Martin factory driver, he's got this program, WEC, British GT, he's a busy boy. Been doing 202s. Two in fact, there are a number of cars doing 202s two in that 22nd position down to where Johnny Adams is. So they're running actually at the pace of the leading group yeah, of cars. Right. It's the bit from 10th down to about 20th that are outside of the pace of uh, it's interesting just to read what's going on. We're not seeing it there as the Aston Martin just going through the picture followed by the 87 which of course is not in this particular race, this group of racing. So Johnny Adam hunting down the, the traffic at the moment. The next target for him in terms of gaining a place, he's going to be number 59, Dean Stoneman, who is 21st. You'll see the orange McLaren head down through Vale in a moment, as there it is. The Aston Martin closes, closes, closes. Jonathan Hershey, meantime, has just gained a place. He's up to 14th in number 114, Emil Frey Jaguar. And there, Number 97 accelerating its way, the Aston Martin out of club corner, but even with 48 minutes to go, it's going to be tough for Johnny Adams, yes, because I mean, Patrick Kuehler is a very quick driver as well. But what he's got to watch is the 87 directly behind him, Nicky Bessian, mm. so that will be something that he'll have to keep one eye on the mirror, because as he will come into traffic, he doesn't want to find himself getting wrong-footed, and you know, the pace of the Mercedes-AMG in general today has been very strong indeed, all the way through Pro, Pro-Am and Am. But it's the Lamborghini that has the advantage over the second place. 19 Mercedes AMG. It's less than a second that gap, so this is not a done deal by any means. So Nico Bastien, the German driver, turns his way out of Brooklyn's and he's staying on the back of Johnny Adam here. And this is the other thing that Johnny doesn't really want to have to do, and that's start defending. He wants to concentrate on what's ahead. He doesn't want to have to start defending. But the Mercedes, which is a good car around here, giving energetic chase. It's Lamborghini, Aston Martin, and then Mercedes 1-2-3 in Pro-Am as they work their way now into Cops Corner. And Nico Bastian is creeping back up onto the tail of Johnny Adam. Yeah, he was about a tenth or so of a second quicker on the last lap. So he's just bit by bit drawing himself up to the rear wing of the Aston Martin. And, of course, Johnny Adam, 22nd position, looking forward to the Lamborghini 77 in 19th position. So there are eight seconds, but, yeah, about 16 or so seconds behind the lead Pro-Am car. The overall lead battle has just crept up again, but there is traffic to have to factor into all of this. Maxi Buch, though, is being caught for his third place by Davidi Rigon now. What are we looking at for the chances of number 19 Lamborghini well it is now Norbert Siedler at the wheel of it and behind look it is number 14 Albert Costa so this is the fight for 16th and 17th places both for big cats in the top 20 yeah and they got Hirschman in 14th position so Jaguar Brun uh, Emil Frey racing happy to have a strong performance and even showing its nose coming down into Brooklyn's and you can't get closer than that and squeezes his way through that's the position, that's 13th for Hershey. Yeah, it doesn't run the Lamborghini off the track, gives it sufficient room. And that is a good clean overtake by Jonathan Hirschman. So, up one place goes Jonathan Hershey. Now, without looking, John, who has done the fastest of anybody in the first sector? Don't tell me 9-11. No, Matt Parry in the Nissan, who is down in 29th place. But Matt Parry was one of our little heroes at Monza. First time out in a GT car and did a stonking job. Well, he's unlocked something in the Nissan. OK, he's a long way down and it's only one sector, but Matt Parry on his toes and he could be one to watch to gain a few places before the very end of the race. As there, number 14, Albert Costa, tries to get himself onto terms with Norbert Siedler. We never really find out what happened to the 22 car. Why did it fall so far down the order? It was certainly comfortably inside the top 12, top 15 in the opening hour. This little battle further down with the second of the Jaguars trying to find its way past. And can it go the long way around the outside? Not ideal because the track comes back, so you've got to check and get in behind. But 
under brakes. You can see the Jaguar really moving around, trying to avoid running into the back of the 19 Lamborghini. Alex Buncombe is about to get a drive-through penalty, a driving stint infringement. Oh. So I'm assuming Captain Masaccio stayed in for a bit too long, and there's a drive-through penalty for number 333, the Kylevit Salikov Matchel Ferrari for an unsafe release. Yeah, it's done in 31st place at the minute, so maybe a little bit academic and certainly out of the podiums for the Pro-Ams, as we see the Jaguar looking to come the long way around the 19 Lamborghini, can't really get it done at farm, but he's going to squeeze up the inside into the loop, he's forced it through. So again, in relative terms, a fairly easy overtake on the 19 Lamborghini. So Jaguar, one more position. Laurence Frey looking on, pretty happy with all of this as the two Jaguars, again, showing reliability. OK, they're not the fastest cars on the track, but haven't they moved on a pace over the last few years? From Quite often you'd see them in the bronze test and never again because there'd be a mechanical problem and that would be the end, but they have really moved the game forward. Michele Beretta then heading up towards the line. Sorry, it is now Stefano Gattuso having replaced Michele Beretta in number 12 ahead of Fabrizio Crestani in the orange Lamborghini. And the Lamborghinis have kind of taken over from where the Audi R8s were, haven't they? As the, 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 the go-to, you can argue, yes, it's an Audi R8 under a different name, I know, but uh, they have become very popular and easy for private teams to run. Yes, I mean, it, it is both within the Super Trofeo, which is the one-make formula that is so successful on a global basis, but in GT racing in general. And it, as I said, I think in one of the broadcasts earlier this weekend, maybe this is where the R8 V10 will ultimately become on the mirror of the Lamborghini Huracan. Certainly, the Audis not having a good weekend here at all. In fact, looking further down the field, Maxim Soule in fifth place. The 72 Ferrari of David Rigo has got through, and uh, so that was the Bentley at one point in fourth, now down to fifth. The race leader is still Christian Engelhart. We're on lap 61 and we've got 43 minutes in the race to go. He leads by only seven tenths. The lead gap has come down again uh, against Raffaele Marciello. Maxi Buch is a further nine tenths back, so two and a half seconds are covering the leading four at the moment. There is Norbert Seedler, 17th as he turns his way through. Pro-Am is still Patrick Kuyula. Am's still being headed by Pierre Arret from Jack Driver. And then Henry Valkenhorst is third of the Am's at the moment. So that's the leader, and look how close it is behind. Well, that's, I mean, this is about the, the quietest period we've seen in this already, what, just under two and a half hours of motor racing at Silverstone. What's happened to Maxim Soule? Because he has well, dropped yeah, a whole heap of time, hasn't he? He's, he dropped back, he's dropped out of fourth place, the yeah. Ferrari 72 of Daniel Rigo, David Rigon's got through. He's losing quite a lot of time. The last lap was about half a second, three quarters of a second, but in two laps it's gone from just over five seconds to just seven seconds. So this eight Bentley clearly has lost pace in relation to the cars that it was battling with before the final round of pit stops occurred. So the 63 Lamborghini wants to get through coming into Abbey, it's going to be a tight. But the 888 decides it's four eight, the 488 I beg your pardon. So again, look at look at now, how close are you going to get? Traffic is the cause. So, so three for the lead in village. Yep. That marker Pierre Eret trying to keep out of the way. Christian Engelhart still there. Davidi Rigon is almost with them as well. Fantastic stuff, isn't it? As the leading three plus a back marker plus fourth now blast onto Wellington straight. Here comes Rigon. And we're sort of giving up with Maximilian Book in third place, but there he is, right back. Can't get any closer to second place than he is. Turning their way now around Brooklyn. So Raffaele Marciello has to start defending. And as he does defend, so that gives Engelhart the chance to break away. But having to work for this, unlike Monza, where it was a pretty comfortable run for GRT Grasser Racing Team. Now the fight's on for second and third. The two Mercedes boom past the pits. Davide Rigon fourth there, inching up onto the back of them as well. Book thinks about the inside line, and Marciello dissuades him from that idea. He Peter ain't, Cox. He ain't going to be a walk in the park to overtake. No, Not by never. A sister car. And in the course of doing that now driving in a defensive mode rather than an attack mode that's going to give Christian Engelhardt all the clear air takes the pressure off him all he needs to do is just continue what he's done since he got behind the wheel of the 63 to, went back out after the round of pit stops effectively took the lead so the battle second and third but it's the fourth place Ferrari 
that really is going to be the one that I think everybody's going to have to keep their eye on because David Rigo has got momentum. He's been quick. His last lap beginning to sort of be checked by the pace of the two Mercedes AMGs directly ahead and the gap between first and second on that lap was just a fraction under a second between the Lamborghini and the 90 Mercedes AMG. So what can Buk do here about the second place Mercedes as they work their way now past the wing? It's still Engelhardt leading the way. It was 9 tenths at the start of the lap. Davide Rigon there, fourth, closing, closing, closing in the SMP racing. Entered Ferrari, got those two Mercedes ahead of him, and of course Lamborghini leading the way. Maxime Soule is still fifth, but having lost a huge amount of time. And it's Alexander Sims, sixth, seventh Michele Rugolo in eighth place now. It's the number 42, Craig, uh, Lewis Williamson rather, driven McLaren. Ninth is Jake Dennis upholding Audi Honor, and Stephen Kane is back into the top ten. Yeah, well, Stephen Kane, we know when he gets into a car he'll deliver ultimate performance, maximum performance. Sister car, Maxime Soule, has actually just given us his fastest first sector time on lap 63. So the number eight Bentley, which has fallen away from the 72 Ferrari of David Rigo, he's not giving up. He's 7.2 seconds behind. Personal best in first sector. You can't do an awful lot better than that. Through go the race leaders, the gap up again, 11 tenths, effectively between Engelhart and Marchiello. Book is next, but Davide Rigon is getting there, isn't he? He's just chipping away, lap by lap by lap by lap, and he's almost up with Book. This is lap 64, 38 minutes and change still to run. Maxim Soule fifth, and he has kind of responded, because on his last lap, Maxim Soule, he did his personal best in the first sector. Yeah, he's, he's begun to pick up a little bit of pace. We don't know why, because sometimes... When you make a driver change, you put on another set of tyres. The tyre, there's always a marginal amount of variation between sets, and some drivers are more sensitive to that than others. And if you don't feel what your body wants to feel compared to when the last time you were in a car, which may well have been this morning in qualification, again, when ambient and track temperatures are totally different. Now, Johnny Adam is still hard at work. He's second in Pro-Am but is he going to be able to repeat that Monza victory? He's going to do his best, he can guarantee that. What are the thoughts of his co-driver, Amada Harfi? Um, I'm currently running in P2 in Pro-Am, but you're catching. Do you think you can repeat the victory you had in Monza? Um, to be honest, coming out of the car and us being in P2 is, um, is great by the team. It was extremely difficult in our session, and it's a long race, 37 minutes to go, and anything can happen. We've seen it in the past, and Johnny is, uh, is doing a really good job at the moment. Well, let's see how you go. Thank you very much. Good luck. Well, Johnny on board with him coming through Woodcut, uh, but he's got the 87 Mercedes literally glued to the rear of the Aston Martin in 22nd place, just 0.6 of a second. The difference between those two cars battling for the top three honours in Pro-Am as we go back to the battle at the front, there is the fourth place Ferrari, David Rigon. There's the lead Lamborghini. There's the second place Mercedes AMG, third place AMG Mercedes. And there we go, their fourth place Ferrari, covered in total by 2.3 seconds. I mean, the difference is really, you get, get an awful lot closer. You just hope that at some point there's going to be probably a bit of traffic that might work favorably, might work for your advantage. But any one of the three cars following the lead 63 Lamborghini is going to be sort of trying to roll that dice whenever the opportunities arise and they go back up into Beckett's Lamborghini. Mercedes AMG, Mercedes AMG, the Ferrari 488. Amazing. All these cars completely different in concept and manufacture and design, balance of performance, producing. I mean, it's amazing the equality that we've now got with this BOP, enabling us to see different brands fighting for the top three places. So lap 65, and it remains. The Lamborghini up front, about a second and a half now is the margin that Engelhardt has over Raffaele Marchiello. And because Raff is having to defend, so that gap is going to increase, isn't it? Yes, it is. So that's going to be the name of the game. And for Engelhardt, he's going to be sitting one and a half seconds now. And that's gone up in the last lap. It was 0.9 of a second. So he's benefited by 0.6. His last lap was, well, just over half a second quicker than the second place. 90 Mercedes AMG, there we see Maximilian Puck bouncing his way through Farm Corner up into the loop. It's 
the top four cars as they came across the line at the end of the last lap was 2.7 seconds. It's probably going to be much the same, but Christian Engelhardt does have that benefit of being the lead car and not having to concern himself with anybody behind, pressurizing him, and nice situation to be in. He can pick and choose the part of racetrack he wants to place the Lamborghini Huracan in, and uh, believe me, that makes a difference. And the interference that the second, third, and fourth, the aerodynamics of these cars does have a, it's a small effect, but it's a frustrating effect because you wouldn't maybe have quite the, the initial bite and turn in that you would like, and you're having to just hesitate because you're not quite sure if the grip is going to be with you when you make that turn. Now Engelhart creeping away, isn't he? We're almost yep. into the last half an hour, and what was 10th has become 1.8. Black flag to number 33, Alexander Matchell, for not respecting the drive-through penalty. So 3-3-3 is going to be given a black flag. And so, remember we mentioned a while ago it was an unsafe release. It was on the screen for a number of laps, and Alexander Matchell did not take it. So it's going to be black flag. It's not exclusion. The black flag means come in, driver, go and talk to the race director. It's up to Alain Adam to see whether he feels he can let him back into the race. But there is the guilty party. Yeah, and in, in effect, you're going to lose minimum two, maybe three, or possibly four laps, depending where your car is in the pit lane before you get down to where the race director's office is as we go back on board the 333 car, pulling well over and, and, and letting other traffic go through. He knows, in effect, that the penalty has spelt the end of any opportunity for that car to... Currently, it was, well, it was in 30th position, but was well outside the top three in terms of the Pro-Am category and, and just simply just getting out of the way. Whereas the other car from Rinaldi is still leading the Am category. There it is, Pierre Arret in 29th now. Gradually, the car has fallen back a little, not surprising, given... Uh, how many other fast pro-am combinations there are but Pierre Erat is after a class win and the self-effacing German driver was saying wasn't he that it's quick when Renault Mastrodani is behind the wheel it's not as quick when I'm driving it but he's well clearing the class ahead of Jack Driver in fact he's got a lap up on him so as long as the engine holds together unlike a Monza Pierre Erat should be on for a class win yeah and he's got clear road ahead he can just choose the part of racetrack he wants to drive on he's got other cars coming up behind who are going to put him a lap down as well so as long as he makes good use of those nice fluorescent mirrors on the 488 Ferrari and, of course, the mirror internal, but it's just not great rearward vision. You've got to look over the engine bay and try and look under or over the wing, mostly under the wing. But just being aware of, of what's going on around you and knowing which cars you've got to compete with and other cars which you can let go. You don't get, need to get involved. You don't need to race every car that's on the racetrack. It's not in your race. There's the 333 coming into the pit lane. And so... He was black flagged, so he comes into the pit lane. Are there any officials to greet him? No, he has to go to his garage, stop, and then walk back. Walk back. He can run if he wants. There's no regulation saying that unless he exceeds the 50 kilometer pit lane speed limit by running, which I think is probably unlikely. <laughs> go up, see the peak, get referred to the steward. Sorry. If and that's Albert Costa making a move for a place, and he's about to gain it, I think, because that gives him 14th ahead of Fabrizio Crestani coming out of Luffield. So another of the big cats making progress forward. We've seen Jonathan Hershey get up to 12th, and now Costa is up to 14th as they head over the line. Yep, good clean pass in Luffield. So once you've done all your... Go up and get told off for what you did yes. or didn't do, and then get back, you might decide, well, what's the point? because you will have lost certainly four laps, if not long, if not more. 19, Norbert Seedler in the second of the GRT Lamborghinis, running in 16th spot. Of course, that car a long way down on the opening stint when Compank was driving it, but has made progress in the second and third parts of the race. As down towards Stoke Corner comes Stefano Gattuso in the Ombra Racing Lamborghini. I think I'm right in saying this is about the most solid run we've seen out of the Ombra Lamborghini. But bit by bit, the team has learnt and improved and made progress. And there it is, running in that leading gaggle. Under pressure, though, from the hard-charging Albert Costa behind. The Spanish driver, former Formula Renault Euro Cup champion. Indeed, he was on the podium presenting trophies to the latest intake of Formula Renault drivers early on in the day. He comes out of club corner behind him. Fabrizio Crestani under attack from Norbert Siedler. Yeah, runs very wide on the exit of club corner. Just keeping an eye on the number eight Bentley, currently in fifth place. Still dropping back on the fourth pace Ferrari, but still recording for some reason. Sector one, 
personal best time yet again for Maxime Soule, but the lap time, 2.03, well, it's in the ballpark with those that are around him, but the reality is, hasn't got the outside pace of the top four. Out of Aintree then comes Stefano Gattuso, Albert Costa is behind him, he's close enough to make a move at Brooklands, the Jaguar almost hidden, does he commit to the inside? He thinks about it, but is there a gap? There's half a gap, but even if he takes it now, he's going to be on the outside for Luffield. So he needs the switch back, doesn't he? From the outside to the inside as they work their way through Luffield. But Stefano Gattuso hangs on to the place. Yes, and, and couldn't get the nose of the Jaguar inside the Lamborghini at the critical part of the corner, but still very good exit. Still thinks about maybe having a look down the inside, thinks the better of it, decides to pull back in. Make your corner get through cops quickly and cleanly. And difficult to see how you would ever think of doing anything up into Beckett's it's such a quick entry in here and then the switch turn right carrying at so much speed then a loss of speed back to the left then the slowest part of that three corner complex the exit which then leads into Chapel Curve and then back on and great let's bring up the sandwiches boys having a lovely time <laughs> Stefan Otelli enjoying his motor racing yes love it Stefan Christian Clean looking on as well uh, we've got one or two little spots of road on our window, but I don't think that's going to come to anything, as there you see Catuzo turning into Stowe, still with Albert Costa right up behind him. Why not a little spot of rain? They've had everything else. True. So, you know, if you want to really throw the dice and add confusion to a really a great motor race, two and a half hours, this has been pretty much non-stop. We'd be unkind, really, but, you know, as they say in the adverts, one more take, yes, let's do it. Right. Well, we did have rain at two or three corners in an earlier Lamborghini race this morning. But as the race leaders are on lap 69, the lead gaps come down a bit, down to 1.3 seconds. And on the last lap, Raffaele Marchiello did a personal best in the first sector as there Costa gets stuck in traffic a little bit. So Gattuso fends him off on the inside line. Crestani is keeping Cedar at bay. Albert Costa tries the inside line. Needs to force for Lamborghini got wide. Got it, but he hasn't got the drive off the corner. He's a, a more acute exit and you tend to spin up a wheel or certainly get into the traction control, depending how you've dialed that in. So again, looks to make a move down into Luffield, but covered by the Lamborghini, but this time side by side, he's got the nose of the Jaguar in front of him. Can the Lamborghini run alongside as we cut back into the, and he's done it. And he's not only done it, he's made it stick. And that's what he's been trying to do. Look at the joy within the Jaguar garage. So clear. So one more position up to 13th place. Race leaders then on to lap 69 now, and Alexander Sims hunting down Maxime Soule, Albert Costa then up into 13th. And now that the Jaguars are going strongly, there's a very happy Lorenz Fry watching all of this in the pit lane. He's with Dakota. Well, Lorenz, the, both of the Jaguars are looking very strong at Silverstone. And that's really good, all British. Yeah, it's definitely good. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't bring out the performance at the beginning of the restart of the safety car period. My tire pressures in the front were definitely not there, so I lost a bit of position. Uh, at the end now, the cars are running uh, near top 10. I really hope we will cross in the points, uh, the finish line. So we will see. We are now really crossing our fingers that we can bring some home uh, back home some points from Silverstone. Good luck. Thank you. So the two Jaguars, 12th and 13th now, with Jonathan Hershey ahead of Albert Costa. We also have a report that Norbert Seidler has had a spin and rejoined. Remember, he was at the back of that little group behind Crestani, but he's had a spin and rejoined uh, from turn 13. That's where he had the off. Yeah, that's probably around the farm loop, part of the racetrack, lower speed. As we see the 55 Ferrari, the car that got penalised for contact with Oliver Jarvis earlier in the session. James Calado behind the wheel, lapping the 2-3 middle two threes uh, but down in 24th so the disappointment for the 55 a car that again was always one that you had to put into the mix of being a potential podium certainly top 10 finisher but any penalty and James Collado weaving around again is that because he hasn't got what he wants from the temperature from his tyres or something else we weren't aware of as we go back to this leading group now once again the lead Christian Engelhardt enjoyed evaporating with traffic and he's going to have to be on his toes because it oh, runs way, way wide, trying to maybe go around, around the long way around the, the Barwell Lamborghini and makes a, a, an error, which must have been absolute manner from heaven for 
Raffaele Marcello, and he now thinks yeah. I've got an opportunity. If I keep my oh. momentum up and pop it up, well, he went the, the, the long way, tries to make the undercut coming back to Christian Engelhardt under real threat, and again, the Lamborghini. Of Oh, but Maxi Book oh, could be the oh, beneficiary, oh. couldn't he? Because he's up the inside this for second place. Book versus Marciello. The two Mercedes absolutely side by side. Maxi Book on the inside line as they come down Wellington Straight. The grey and orange Mercedes alongside the red car, but Marciello is just ahead as they break. But Maxi Book is on the tighter inside line. He's going to go second. He's done it. He's gone through. And he's right on the tail of the lapped Lamborghini now, which needs to get out of the way. So it is still just Engelhardt in the lead of the race. Now Book is trapped in traffic, and here comes Marciello to fight back in the red Mercedes into Woodcut. Still, look, the Lamborghini is on the racing line. Maxi Book up the curb. He's desperate to get past without any more loss of time. Through they come, down towards Cop's corner and Book still can't find a way past. So now Engelhart is able to get away because second and third are trapped for the moment behind the number 78 Lamborghini, which has got Richard Abra at the wheel of it. Indeed, and Richard Abra driving the wheels off the Lamborghini, but unaware that he's holding up a battle for the pull. And look above, goes up the inside, 90, tries to squeeze by Maximilian Book, but Book has got the advantage, just carried a little bit more speed in the exit. But nothing given between these two respective teams and drivers. And then you've got Davini Rigon in the Ferrari right at the back of it. But look, they've been stuck behind Abra for over half a lap and still they can't find a way past him. Coming through Stoke Corner, looking to see a blue flag as well because of course it's a back marker in 28th place who's certainly now affecting the lead battle because the lead gap is extending. It's great to watch what's going on second, third and fourth, but it's all triggered by a back marker in the way. Richard Abra trying to drive his own race, admittedly, but shouldn't somebody be saying, just let them go? Well, I would have thought his pits should have said, look, there's the battle for second and third position, third, fourth position for that matter. These are not in your race. You don't need to race them. Just step aside, lift off a little early, let them go through, because it's always a shame when you see a car out of category or out of position trying to slip through. So they're still stuck behind. Just like we had a lap ago, look, there are now two back markers between first and second, so the leader is getting away, and Maxi Book, understandably, although he's gained second place, will be mightily frustrated that the back marker is not letting them through. Now, there's a blue flag, excellent, but Richard Abra carries on thinking, well, I'm doing my race, you've got to find a way past me. Well, the only thing is if he continues to ignore the blue flag, which is being waved at him as he gets a wheel off the track, so now 84 gets through, the 90 might try and go the long way around, needs to be careful, as the exit the Lamborghini, so he cuts back to the inside, but the Ferrari behind David Rigo, he's the one that thinks, I've got an opportunity. Looks to go round the outside and Woodcut, and he has gone round the outside, but can he make it stick? Because the Mercedes is on the inside, they're coming into cops, he's got a back out of it. But the lead gap, 2.78 seconds, while they were stuck behind Abra for nearly a lap, so that gap has really shot up. So Christian Engelhardt now has a golden chance. Now, granted, it was traffic that brought the gap down a little in the first place. Richard Abra, hugs the inside line and now through finally goes through Raffaele Marciello, Davide Rigon is the next one and more news from the pits, the number 333 Ferrari, Alexander Matchell disqualified for not respecting the drive-through signal. Now, look, the Lamborghini is almost defending there from the Ferrari, Richard Abra finally I think lets Rigon go, the Barwell team hopefully on the radio say just let them go, let them go, you're impeding but they've gone through now. Yeah, I mean sometimes it's hard to understand that there isn't better communication, maybe the reasons why, but there were waved blue flags, and you have to have a sense of awareness that when lead cars are catching you, and particularly if they're involved in this a titanic battle for victory, not just victory for the, for the three podium positions, that you don't need to be a part of that battle. Now, having been released, can Maxi Boot do anything about Christian Engelhardt? The answer seemingly is yes, because he's obviously all fired up, He's frustrated because of having lost the time, but also it's the first opportunity he's had in second place. So in the first sector, he's quicker. Yes, but their last laps, two minutes 04 for Max Book, two minutes 05 for Marcello. That's how much they lost mm -hmm. struggling to get past the, the Lamborghini, the Barwell Lamborghini. So that's given Christian Engelhardt breathing space just under three seconds, and he'll take that all day and say thank you very much. And so the gap up to 2.7 seconds, and now Maxi Book has got 20 minutes of hard work to try and bring down that gap. Johnny Adam, by the way, is still pounding on to try and catch Patrick Kuyula, but the gap 
is still around about 14, 15 seconds. I think it's going to be a Barwell Lamborghini to win in Pro-Am today, with all due deference. Johnny Adam a bit too far back when he started the stint today, unless Creola has a problem. There, 14, is Albert Costa running in 13th place. So how can Maxi Book bring down this gap? It's three and a half seconds. The last lap was slower again, even though the first sector was slightly better. Well, hopefully he's got, in relative terms, he's just got the idea just ahead to worry about, and let's hope that will be more compliant in terms of enabling this battle to continue. So there is the, the third place Mercedes running behind what is the 10th place ID. 10th in category, I should say. Still not able to really make any progress as the two Jaguars having their own little private team battle for 12th and 13th position. And about to swap over, aren't they? Costa up the inside of Hershey. Jonathan Hershey in 1-1-4. So as they come now up over the line together, to the inside line goes Albert Costa. On the outside line, Jonathan Hershey, and Costa goes through. So the two Jaguars switch around, and Albert Costa potentially now to make a bit more progress up the order. So as they turn towards the Beckett's S's, lap 73, the race leaders are on. Do you know what's been happening to the leader of the race? Christian Engelhardt is really, really getting the hammer down. Yeah. He's done the last lap 202, which is, again, over half a second quicker than the second place Maximilian book, the gap up to three and a half seconds. So he has used this clear air that he's enjoying to really, really consolidate the advantage that he's got and pulling away and that'll be a frustration for Max Book because he can really not do much more than what he's doing. To the end of Vale comes the Audi that was Stuart Leonard's car, Jake Dennis on the wheel of it now, 10th, Tristan Vautier is behind him and then you've got the Jaguars, Albert Cost and Jonathan Hershey, so this is 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th we're looking at as they come now up towards Abbey. Still the lead gap hovering around the three and a half second mark with 18 minutes to go, but yet again, fast circuit Silverstone, tight circuit Brands Hatch, Sprint Racer Endurance Race, the GLT 63 Lamborghini, the car to beat is there. Costa has a go against Vautier. Albert Costa could yet get into the top 10 by the end, couldn't he? The way that he's going, he's got these two cars to pick off and 18 minutes in which to do it. Well, I think you'll have a trouble getting past the 88 because that's the car that was the pole sitting car, Tristan Vautier behind the wheel. Currently in, in uh, 12th place, Costa in 13th. But, uh, no, so it's a Hershey car in, in 12th place, Costa in 13th. Oh, well, this so there's Costa up the inside. Tristan Vautier looks for a way past. Through they come. Remember, the Jaguar switched around at the start of the lap, and now that he's been released, Costa has got right onto the back of Vautier. Would you ever imagine pole car and the Jaguar there battling out? Oh, look at the way he goes one side, back again. I mean, this has been one really feisty endurance race. Yeah. It's looking very grey. This is one of the pleasures of coming to Silverstone as you get localised weather. Usually, if it's fine up here at the pit complex, it can be a little bit overcast and potentially rainy down at the far end down at Stow. So, as you're driving your car, it's always helpful, as best you can in an enclosed cockpit, to keep an eye, especially down this end of the track that we're coming to now. As there, Albert Costa makes a move up the inside to try and get past Vautier. Jake Dennis only just up the road ahead, so 10th, 11th, 12th, Audi, Mercedes, Jaguar running together. To the end of Vale they will turn, they've got a back marker ahead, which is Pierre Eret, still leading the AM Cup, of course. Patrick Cuyola still clear in Pro-Am in 77. So Barwell's yellow. Master, uh, Lamborghini rather, heads the Pro-Am category. Johnny Adam second, still fending off Nico Bastian. And in fact, Johnny Adam and Nico Bastian, when we last looked about half an hour ago, were almost nose to tail. They're still almost nose to tail, so uh, there's big pressure on Johnny Adam to hang on to second place. There is Mirko Bortolotti watching on, and he sees Christian Engelhart leading the way still by 3.6 seconds. Yeah, I mean, he's had a, a real purple patch when he's had clear racetrack and even he was catching back markers or cars that were going to be lapped. He was catching them individually, not as a, a group of cars, which is sometimes what you get in an endurance race. You get maybe four or five cars all driving around very closely together, and that's something that he's managed to avoid, and consequently he's used that to 
use his speed, the speed of the Lamborghini, consistently now lapping in the low two minute, two seconds per lap. Book's last lap virtually matched it, but at the same time, the, the, the lead is extended out to 3.6 seconds. Currently a personal best for Maximilian Book in sector one on the lap that we're on, that's lap 75. So Christian Engelhart, the race leader, made his name in Porsches, but has adapted to Lamborghinis very impressively indeed. And former Carrera Cup champion in Germany, turning his way now through the loop with 15 minutes on the clock and a cushion of 3.6 seconds. So a few laps ago it was tenths, and then he took full advantage, didn't he, while his opposition was stuck behind the traffic to really push, push, push and build an advantage, and that he has done. There in the background is Maxi Book, who took two tenths out in the first sector and four tenths out in the second sector. So Maxi Book having a real go here, so Book second, closing on Engelhardt. Let's just keep an eye to this. It was 3.6 seconds at the start of the lap. Let's see what it is coming over the timing line now. Yeah, it was slightly strange because Engelhardt had stretched that advantage, but on this last sector, sector two, on this last lap, as you point out, for nearly half a second, he gave up. We didn't see any obvious reason for that. So the gap as they come across the line, 3.1 seconds. So that's the half a second that was lost pretty much in sector two. So Maximilian Book back on a charge. Again, looking skyward, but getting dark over the far end of the circuit. Probably not going to be a factor. We've only 14 minutes in this race to go. There's the young German um, pushing, pushing as he only knows. Can he get closer to this? More traffic up ahead for Christian Engelhardt to concern himself with. So to give Book the switch over in terms of advantage. But eventually he will then catch those cars himself fastest first sector of anybody number 90 this car here purple so Raffaele Marciello in third place closing on Maxi Book who is closing on Christian Engelhardt so we are not done yet are we no, and five and a half seconds covers first to third but that is going to come down and that's on lap 76 okay these tires have not done 76 laps but nevertheless that's pretty impressive see purple coming up at this stage with only what 13 minutes now to go before the chequered flag. So through they turn, Marciello drifts it through Abbey, up through Farm. So he's the fastest man in the first sector. The second sector ends when they come out of the loop. Is Engelhardt going to be caught there by the charging Mercedes AMGs behind? Still got Davide Rigon in fourth place as well, who's not totally out of the hunter. So the lead gap is down by, gosh, seven tenths in the second sector alone. Book is closing, closing. OK, there was a back marker that Engelhardt had to get past that time around. Marcello loses a little bit of time in that second sector, but it is still very close between the leading three, just about four. Rigon is still just about in the mix. And it's going to be closer at the end of lap 76 because the gap currently 3.1 seconds to first to second. And as they come across the line, we wait to see what that gap is. It's two point something. Five. Two point, yeah, two and a half. And so the gap second to third is 2.3 seconds, so it's a pretty equal distance yeah. first to second, second to third. So 3.6, 3.1, 2.5, if it carries on like this, then Book will get close enough to challenge. The black clouds loom over Maggots and Beckett's, but I think we'll probably miss any rain they might have in store for us with only now 12 minutes of the race remaining. So there is Book, managed to get through the traffic. Raffaele Marciello is the next man to have to sort out the back markers, but there is Book, and ahead of him, is the race leader, and there's nothing better to spur you on than seeing the car that you're physically chasing. To Stoke Corner they come, another two tenths pull back in the first sector alone. When you're catching somebody, it's very, very satisfying. That's what Maximilian Book is doing right now Indeed. on lap 77, just over 11 minutes of this race to go. There's the third place, Raffaele Marcello in the 90. He had that fastest overall first sector a lap or two ago. So he has not given up the charge, but probably going to struggle to run down. Certainly the 63 Lamborghini, but the 84 will be very much within his sights. There's number 90 then. So through goes Raffaele Marciello, 11 minutes and counting. So sector one, the lead gap was down again. There is 86, which is currently fourth in Pro-Am. That's Damien Faulkner in the Black Falcon team sorry, HTP teams, uh, Mercedes AMG. So a pro-am car, but they're going to miss out on a podium, sadly. They're in the two leaders, and the gap is down by another three-tenths in the middle sector. It was two and a half at the start of the lap, so 
Uh, half a second has been pulled back in the first two sectors by Maxi Book. Can he get close enough with 10 and a bit minutes to go to challenge for the race lead? They're coming out of Luffield now. Last year it was, of course, the Mercedes leading and being hunted down by charging uh, Lawrence Van Thor in the Audi. But the Mercedes hang on to win this year. Maxi Book is the chaser and two seconds. He's managed to gain half a second. Momentum now swung towards the 84. Maximilian Book on the charge. That last lap was just four tenths of a second. There you can see on screen last lap, 77.4 tenths of a second, six tenths the previous lap, a half a second. That's a lot of time to take out in the closing laps. Wonder why, where's this pace come from? But Engelhard has, well, he's trying to respond, but whatever. May possibly the 84 car might have had a, a new set of rubber to, you know, so you have to sort of try and second guess what teams might have had but there's obviously a clear reason behind it, but the pace is coming from the 84 Mercedes at the latter part of Maximilian Book's stint. In the early part, he looked like he was being wrong-footed and he got shuffled back. Now, for what Guy Smith was saying to me at lunchtime, the tyres have a, a good window to use, and then they start to, to lose their edge. And I just wonder whether Christian Engelhardt, when he tried to attack and pull away, asked too much out of those tyres, and now he's suffering a little bit. Anything's possible. Yeah. The thing that Engel Engelhardt had was he then he was making that big push. He was able to do it in relatively clear track conditions. So unlike the two Mercedes AMGs following, where they're having to battle through cars and having their own personal battle. And as we go back to the battle further down through the field with the, the 19 down in 19th position, ironically. And there ahead is the Pro-Am leading Lamborghini, Patrick Kuyula, ahead of Norbert Seidler. So this is the car that's the centre of Pro-Am attention today. For Barwell Motorsport, it's going to be a, another British team to win in Pro-Am. TF Sport at Monza, Barwell Motorsport here, if all stays according to plan for eight and a bit minutes. Patrick Kuehler, along with uh, Adrian Amstutz and Martin Kodrich as the driving force. And Johnny Adam is still there second with Nico Bastian right on his tail. In fact, six tenths apart, those two. It's a very, very tight fight. But Patrick Kuehler a long way up the road now in, in the... Uh, charging Lamborghini. So, Maxi Boots, we understand, on new tyres, but we were being told that uh, the Grasser Racing team have kept a set in reserve as well. They only used one set in Q3, whereas lots of other teams used two. So, Maxi Boots' tyres are helping him. Uh, we'll get to the bottom of whether Engelhart got a new set for this stint or whether they were a scrubbed set out of qualifying this morning. But there is the gap. It was down from two seconds to a second and a half at the end of the previous lap. So it's coming down half a second a lap. There is time for Book to close, but then he's got to find a way by. Correct. And closing is most satisfying, but overtaking and leading <laughs> knocks that into a cocked hat. But as we have seen, the when you get close to one of these two cars, either the Lamborghini or the Mercedes AMG, the, 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 the difficult bit is then to translate your closing speed into a clean and effective overtake. So Max Book is doing everything he can. He's dragged performance out of the 84 Mercedes and dropping the Acker ASP number 90. That's down 3.8 seconds. As we look at the lead car in AM. So Johnny Adam there is the second ab. Third behind him is Nico Bastian. I told you they were close. There it is. Absolutely nose to tell. And they've been like this for the bulk of the hour, really. Last time we saw them, they were tight. And they are still together. But Johnny Adam is defending. But because he's had to defend, of course, he's never really been able to bring the gap down or do quicker lap times than Patrick Kuehler up the road. Six and a half minutes remain. The cars work their way through Cops. And the lead gap was a second and a half last time. We'll see what it is this time through as Engelhart then has the advantage over Maxi Book for the moment. Meantime, Johnny Adam manages to put a slower car between himself and the class opposition, turning their way down through Beckett. And as I was saying earlier on, new tyres for the Lamborghini as well is confirmed from the pit lane, so they're both on the same amount of good rubber, if you like, both on fresh tyres, and now turning their way from Beckett's to Stowe, second and third in Pro-Am. So, lead gap is a second. Another half a second has just been pulled back as they go over the timing line. Maxi Book closing, closing, closing. It could be that the Lamborghini loses out right at the very last. There's traffic up the road as well they're going to have to sort out. Five and a half minutes to go. Maxi Book is nearly there. 
So has he been a little bit kinder to his tyres in this stint? There's certainly something that has been unlocked late stint and he's chipping away, itching up onto the back of the Lamborghini. At GRT, the faces are not full of smiles anymore. They might just survive, but it's going to be tight. We have seen, though, in previous races that you can catch, but finding a way through is not that easy because the balance of performance is such to equate the cars that you might be able to get through traffic, you might be able to storm on in clear track space, but then when you're running together, it's not an easy dart past a slower car or a car ahead of you. So nervous faces in the Lamborghini camp. Optimistic, expectant faces perhaps at Mercedes as there. Maxi Buch in the first sector, this time only pull back hundreds. Christian Engelhart is trying to respond, but the two leaders are together now. They work their way out of village, and as one, they work their way onto Wellington Strait. Wide goes the Lamborghini. Maxi Buch, another four tenths closer. So he's almost on the back, and there's traffic up the road as well, which he might be able to take advantage of. They turn their way now down through Brooklands to Lafield this time, lap 80 and the Lamborghini has the advantage, such as it is, but what was a five-second cushion has disappeared, and it's going to be perhaps half a second even when they come to the line this lap through. Through goes Engelhart, there behind him is Maxi Buch. Four tenths of a second, that's all, starting lap 81 and four minutes to go. It's going to be two more laps, isn't it, of the race, and the way that he's gone, Maxi Buch now should be on, could be on, for a race win. Traffic up the road might help or hinder, we'll see. Engelhart now tries to respond, he's on the limit through Maggots, up towards the Beckett's S as they go. Ahead of him you've got the Santilock Audi. Christopher Hasser at the wheel of it, another of the Pro-Am cars. Down in 36th place as he comes onto the hangar straight, the two leaders. And then don't forget Raffaele Marchiello, he's in touch just about four seconds back. And if these two were to really delay themselves, he might be able to close. But I do feel he's too far back to challenge for position now. Out of Stowe they come, down through Vale this time around. Is it going to be a further close of the gap, or can the leader get through the traffic? Well, for now, the gap comes down by another length or two. There'll be another lap to ring out of it at the end of this, I reckon, as they come through Club Corner. Hard at work is Christian Engelhart, who can only do his best now. Try and be smooth, consistent, not crack under the pressure, but he's got to be mindful of that traffic up the road and make sure that he doesn't get caught up behind it. through they come then now towards the right at village and he's found three back markers at exactly the wrong moment he can't get through on this next corner either and so Maxi Buch is almost there now he lags back a little bit which way does he go to the tight inside tries to go the Lamborghini Maxi Buch goes wider gets the power down gets the momentum one back marker drops back behind them, so Mike Sturzberg falls back behind the two leaders who run down Wellington straight now. They're not nose to tail. Engelhart gets past Hasser on the inside line. The next car they need to sort out is Kurm Ledegar, last year's endurance champion, of course, but having a pretty lean time of it at the moment in the McLaren. As you go on board briefly with Engelhart, the Maxi Book is right on his tail. A flying lap at the moment is a two minutes two. They might even get two more laps out of this. Let's see, because as they cross the timing line now, it's with, what, two minutes and four to go. It's going to be oh so close, this, for the last lap. But Maxi Book right on the back. It is declared the final lap, though. We might be a second under the three hours, but it won't be much if we are. So through they go. It's the last lap of the race. Heading now up towards the Beckett's S's. Just up the road ahead is Kerm Ledegar. So are we going to have a change on the last lap? Maxi Book has thrown everything at it in this stint. Christian Engelhardt has done his level best to try and withstand all the pressure. The HTP Motorsport team equally nervous now. GRT Lamborghini versus HTP Mercedes. Down they come with half a lap to go at Stoke Corner. That's an opportunity for Maxi Boot, but he's not able to take advantage. Is he going to be good enough, tight enough through Stowe to challenge through Vale? Still come Redegar is ahead. A flash of the lights from Engelhart. The McLaren trying to drive its own race, but not yet bailing to one side. The two leaders behind, nose to tail, really only a handful of corners to go. Can Christian Engelhart hang on in there? It's going to be a very, very close finish, there's no argument about that. Book flashing the lights at Engelhart to try to distract him. Engelhart is still stuck behind the McLaren. This is what happened to the Mercedes earlier when they got caught in traffic. Now the shoe is on the other foot as Book tries to come out round the outside of Engelhart. He goes one way, he goes the other, side by side for the lead on the last lap of three hours of racing. Traffic in the way, leader gets through, Engelhart goes ahead of the McLaren. 
now. Maxi Boot goes through as well. He's got Wellington straight in the stadium to go. Can he find a way through? Christian Engelhart timed that well. Able to hang on to the race lead. Maxi Book right up behind him then. They've got Brooklands, Luffield and Woodcut to go. It is now or never for Maxi Book. He's got to throw it up the inside if he can. He breaks desperately, desperately late. Now he can't do it there. The inside line at Luffield is perhaps the last chance and then the run through Woodcut. Engelhart covers the inside line. Book right on his tail. It's going to be a winning margin of hundreds of a second this. Unlike Monza where it was about half a minute because Engelhart is still under attack but it's going to be a win for the GRT Lamborghini as they come through Woodcut corner. Christian Engelhart hangs on, he comes over the line and there's no chequered flag. No chequered flag shown but the clock has hit zero as they come across the timing line. Now there's no flag. So they go through, the clock has hit zero, but they're going to carry on racing, aren't they? Because no chequered flag was shown. It was very marginal, as I said at the start of the last lap, as to whether it would be the last lap or not. So both of them are going to carry on pushing. There's still no chequered flag, so whether this lap is going to count, we'll wait and see. Onto the hangar straight they come. The leader crossed the line at 2 hours, 59 minutes, 57.645 seconds. So I would propose that it shouldn't have been declared the last lap. And this one is going to count. The clock has hit zero now, of course, because we've had the three hours elapsed. So Maxi Book has got to keep on pushing. And has he got a chance? There's now consternation. The, the screen said final lap, but I don't think it should have done because there was just, as you can now detect, three seconds to spare for one more lap. And this is that lap. Book, however, is not actually as close. He's still pushing, so is Engelhart, but the gap there you can see is a wide one. It had gone up a little bit in the first sector. They come now in towards Abbey. So the chequered flag not shown because there was time enough to start one more lap. Maxi Book finds himself in a similar situation. Close at Village, hard on the brakes as they turn now into Aintree, coming out of the loop. Now we're on the final lap, so here's what we prepared earlier. And Engelhart accelerates through the traffic. Here is Maxi Boot getting himself up close as well as they head down towards Brooklands. So he had a go last time. This is the final opportunity. Lamborghini leads the way. Maxi Book needs to try and get himself up the inside at Luffield if he can. Engelhart will cover that line. The Mercedes tries to squeeze up the inside wide through Lafield and now Maxi Book has got to sort of launch it towards Woodcut Corner but he still can't do it so the extra lap completed and it's going to be a win for Christian Engelhart, Andrea Calderelli and Mirko Bortolotti, chequered flag is waved second across the line Maxi Book in the Mercedes after a great stint and fair play to Christian Engelhart for fending him off under huge pressure what a race the margin at the end 0.344 of a second that's all well done, Christian Engelhart. Yet another win, but boy, did he deserve that. And the Grasser racing team starts to celebrate. Gottfried Grasser and his merry man have yet again proved that the Lamborghini Huracan GT3 is the car to have. And Christian Engelhart has proved how good a driver he is, fending off Maxi Book, Raffaele Marchiello coming home behind them for third spot. And then fourth, Davide Rigon, fifth, Maxime Sule, and sixth over the line, Michele Rugolo. But Oh, catch your breath, a superb end to the race. It's a shame that there was the confusion about what the final lap was. As I said at the time, it was going to be marginal, and the track officials, timing it with their stopwatches, reckon there was time for one more lap, hence they didn't wave quite rightly, the chequered flag. And with three seconds to spare, there was that extra opportunity for the lap, and it was seized by Maxi Book, but he still couldn't find a way by. Now in Pro-Am, it is going to be Adrian Amstutz, Martin Kodrich, and Patrick Kuyula that come through for the class win. Just being mindful of the traffic up the road, though, there, because as the cars dive down towards uh, Brooklands, the back markers are still all busy battling. And as they turn their way through, you've got Johnny Adam behind, and all of a sudden, he's got himself to within one second. So what was a pretty healthy advantage earlier on has been whittled away, and almost Maxi Book like he needs another lap. But Johnny Adam is almost there. It's going to be Patrick Kuyula who comes across the line. Barwell wins in Pro-Am, TF Sports second, Another excellent performance put in by Johnny Adam and third behind is going to be Nico Bastian in 87 Mercedes after his excellent stint in the car as well. And by the way, on that last lap, there was the last warning to car 63 for a track limit abuse. So Christian Engelhart got away with that, but he was on his last warning from the race director for exceeding track limits. What a race, one of the most enthralling races we've had in the Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup and the drivers will in a few moments 
come to Park Ferme and catch their breath. So will we before they all go to the podium. So number 63 Lamborghini wins and of course the top, how many? 19 all in the Pro Cup. Pro-Am won by the Barwell Lamborghini 77. Aston Martin second, Mercedes third, and in the Am Cup, Pierre Eret and Bruno Mestrinardi, the winners, ahead of number 888 Ferrari and then the 36 BMW. So there, Christian Engelhart, he was given a black and white driving standards flag for track limits, then a last warning, but the three hours was up before he needed to worry. Three hours and two minutes in the end we got, so uh, it was very close indeed and that was how he came across the line to see the chequered flag and relief as much as delight I think because that was a very demanding last stint to have to deal with all the traffic and deal with all the pressure from behind if you're wondering why he's going off the track like that it's so he picks more rubber up, up on the tyres and therefore adds to the weight of the car to make sure it gets through scrutineering okay so uh, he collects the pickup brings the car nice and slowly again why so slow on your inlap to make sure you don't use any more fuel than you need to because the car has to have at least three litres in it for fuel sampling at the end so you don't want to come storming in and run out of fuel or not have the amount left for uh, checking. So as the drivers now work their way to Park Ferme, Christian Engelhart responding to the applause from the marshals and the fans and he's ready to turn his way to the Park Ferme area. Maxim Sule just going ahead of him, finishing in fifth place in the Bentley. The sister car of Stephen Kane, ninth at the end. Good job done by M Sport, turning around what was looking a bit bleak for number eight early on, but clever use of the uh, full course yellows and the safety car periods, helping them out. That's all part and parcel of endurance racing, of course, these days. So as the drivers come to Park Ferme, there is Maxi Book. But a great reception for Christian Engelhart, who takes the race win. Mirko Bortolotti and Andrea Calderalia there to welcome him home. Raffaele Marciello gets out of his Mercedes for third place. We'll have the Pro-Am and the Am drivers there as well in a few moments as the winner's caps are distributed. Out gets Christian Engelhart. That's crazy now, he says. Not wrong. What a race, what a stint. The car having dropped back to third in Andrea Calderelli's hands, but it comes home victorious in the end. And the GRT engineers very, very pleased with yet another win. They've had a great 10 days in the UK, haven't they, with wins in the Sprint Cup last week at Brands Hatch, the Endurance Cup here this weekend. It's two out of two in the Endurance Cup, if you think back to this car winning at Monza as well. <laughs> and Gottfried Grasso over the moon. Christian Engelhart has certainly adapted well from Porsches to Lamborghinis. And takes the congratulations of everybody that's there. But for years it used to be the writer engineering team that you linked to Lamborghini. Right now it's the Grasso racing team doing a fine job, helped admittedly by the advancement that the Lamborghini Huracan has had over the elder Gallardo and also some blessing from. Uh, Lamborghini Squadra Corsa, but a great effort being done. Let's hear from the winners with Watty. Christian Engelhardt, how tense was that last hour? Yeah, it was incredibly tense. Not easy with the traffic here. Uh, not easy to get by because they have nearly the same pace and you're not a lot quicker and then you don't get through. So then you lose a lot and the car behind you closes. So I had a lot of pressure at the end, but uh, I must say a big thanks to the whole team. We are the guys that are allowed to sit behind the wheel, but they've done such an amazing job in the last test before the season. We were really struggling in the beginning, and uh, then in the last test before the season, we made such a great car. And uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome well, to drive. I mean, a great team effort by everybody. Let's go first. Andrea, you did the middle stint. It was from the lights going out, this was a hard, hard race. Yeah, it was a tough one. To be honest, it was, uh, with the two Mercedes, it was really difficult to fight. We had some, uh, also some overlap guys that uh, didn't help, to, to be honest, but uh, it was really tough. But uh, to be honest, we deserve because we were quick all weekend and, uh, and all the team deserve this great, great job. Great job. Mirko, you took the start, you built up a lead, then you had the safety car intervention, all that hard work fell away, but you were able to pull away comfortably. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I did. Uh, really happy about it. Uh, again, we had a, 
a really we, take, we took a really uh, big gamble in, uh, in qualifying. Uh, we saved all the sets uh, of new tires for for the race. We had each each of us had a, set, a new set of tire for for each of uh, of the stints. So that obviously helped us a lot. And so I managed to, to have a clean start, get the lead um, into the first corner, open up a gap. As you mentioned, the safety car didn't help at all, considering that uh, when I went to the pit, uh, we had the full course yellow, and then they switched to safety car. So the, um, the red Mercedes got a big advantage uh, because of that, and we lost the lead. But at the end of the day, our crew did a massive job in the second pit stop again, and we took a fantastic win. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. I want to dedicate this win um, to our lead engineer, uh, Wim Everards, uh, who is not here because uh, he has some troubles. But uh, we are waiting for you and uh, hope you, you come back soon, man. Well, congratulations. The green machine marches on. So the next stop for the Endurance Cup is going to be Paul Ricard, another different form of race, six hours. Uh, there, the Pro-Am winning Lamborghini from Barwell Motorsport. Barwell has had a great weekend here, Mark Lambert's team, because uh, not only a class win in this race, but yesterday, John Minshaw in a Barwell Lamborghini won both of the Blancpain GT Sports Club races. So three out of three uh, this weekend for Barwell. Great result for Mark Lambert's team. And uh, Patrick Kuyler there, and he's back to us, the guy without the cap. Now with the cap. Adrian Amstutz is the other side of that uh, barrier in the bullpen. Martin Kodric there, the other driver of the uh, Pro-Am winning car. Now let's hear from the uh, third placed team. Raffaele Marciello brought the Mercedes home. Back to John. Eduardo, you took the start. Tough, tough race. Forever. Top three cars never were separated by more than, well, you could tell me. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, with, uh, we did uh, the race in front, especially at the beginning. Uh, we uh, did uh, the right decision. We had the right decision to come in uh, a little bit earlier than everybody when uh, when there was like full course here on. That paid. Uh, so we were running. Who, at Edward, whose decision was that? Yours or the team's? Uh, both mine and uh, the one of the engineers. And everything uh, went like very well. And then it was like uh, trying, you know, to stay uh, in the front. We were battling against, uh, you know, HTP and uh, the Lamborghinis, and they were really quick, but uh, we are very happy with P3. Great job. Michael, you had a tough, tough stint. You're under pressure all the way through. I mean, concentration, I could see at the end of the day when you just got out of the car, it was hard. Yeah, it was really hard. It was, to be honest, in, in clean air, it was okay. I could maximize the first sector and then hold on for the rest of the lap, but if I got traffic, then it was a disaster because Lamborghini had too much straight lines, so then I was on the defensive and couldn't get an exit, so. You know, it is what it is, but it was it was good fun, you know, it was, it was all clean and made it interesting, at least, the TV. Made it fresh for sure. Now, Raffaele, you got a chance, there was a big battle between you and the 84 Mercedes AMG. Swap positions, but once he got ahead, once 84 got ahead, nothing you could do? Yeah, I tried, like, to, to win the race with the Lambo. I said, like, P2, P3 is quite similar. So I tried to, to overtook the, the Lambo, take a gamble, and didn't work, and so Mercedes passed me. The 84 then was, like, just to wait if some lap car was blocking each other because we were like quite similar to the pace. So it was difficult to, to overtake and we finished P3. I'm still happy, but when you are so close to win, like a bit sad for Mr. Mr. victory, but it's okay. Anyway, you should be happy you entertained all three of you. Fantastic drive by you. Great. Well done. Great advert for GT Racing, wasn't it, that? Because it was in doubt as to the winner right the way to the end of three hours. And so the drivers are now making their way up the steps. Smart Lemmer there in the cap with uh, Ahmad Al-Hafi and Johnny Adam with their backs to us, but Mark will go up there, I suspect, as the representative of the winning team in Pro-Am of uh, Barwell. Well done, Mark. And uh, today, Johnny Adam missing out by, what was it, one second from Patrick Kula. So, close, but not quite. Another lap, might have done it. Now, let's hear from Maxi Book and Frank Pereira and Jimmy Erickson next. Our second-placed drivers before they go to the podium. We've got hold of them. Frank Pereira, you took the start. This is a, a, a nuts race. I've never seen such a competitive GT event. Yeah, it's a really, really tough race, especially for, for the start. It was also very, very tough. I tried to, to keep in front and try to, to overtake the Acre car, but when you left, the, the, the driver was so difficult, really, really difficult to, to fight, to overtake, to also defend to the left people. They were quite dangerous. So, yeah, it was a really difficult race, but each driver made a perfect job, and the team did, again, a perfect job, and we are, again, in the good position. And, you know, the championship is long, so it's good to keep on, on that level and keep good points. And, and we will see we will see on this one. Jimmy, you had a great stint as well. It looked like you're back as a single-seater racing driver. It was that kind of race. 
Yeah, it was quite tight. Well, I mean, after the pit stop, I was P5 on track and uh, had some good battles with some drivers and uh, I put the car in P2, uh, close battles and that was a really good stint. Max Book, you finished the stint. I mean, I, I mean, I can't, just madness. The whole thing was madness. But halfway through your stint, suddenly the car seemed to come alive. Was that just us or was that the reality of the car? Did it pick up performance? Um, I was struggling a bit in the beginning, to be honest. Uh, I was overdriving a bit. Uh, the tire pressure went a bit too high. But um, yeah, when I was a bit ad adapting the driving, the fuel was coming out more. Uh, the car, the overall balance felt better and um, it was much more consistent, so I could push more and close the gap. So it wasn't anything to do with that 90 Mercedes giving you a hard time, was it? Yeah, but this is racing. I, I was having a good time in the car. It was uh, pretty pretty tough to race with the other guys. They were pushing and we all have been in the, at the limit. But I enjoyed it really a lot. It was all fair and uh, yeah. I think that's the big thing. It was a clean, clean race between all three of you and a great race to watch. Thank you very much. So a fabulous race won in the end by Christian Engelhardt, Marco Bortolotti and Andrea Calderelli with three tenths of a second being the margin to number 84, which was the Jimmy Erickson, Maxi Book and Frank Pereira Mercedes ahead of Michael Meadows, his first outright podium in the Endurance Cup, Edo Mortara and Raffaele Marchiello behind. Victor Scheitar, Miguel Molina and Davide Rigon fourth from Vincent Abril. Andy Suchek and Maxime Soule fifth in the Bentley ahead of Passin Lathouris, Michele Rugolo and Alessandro Pierguidi. Then the BMW of Alexander Sims, Maxime Martin and Philip Eng. The best McLaren, eighth. Bentley number seven coming home in ninth place. Jaguar, tenth and twelfth with Tristan Vautier between them. Uh, in the end, Stuart Leonard, Jamie Green and Jake Dennis fell to 13th ahead of Nicky Pola's uh, Lamborghini. Number 23, Nissan after a drive through 16th. 20th, the winning Pro-Am car, but only just because it was just over a second between Lamborghini and Aston Martin. And then a further few tenths back came the Mercedes in the hands at the end of Nico Bastian. But number 78, Barwell Lamborghini ending up in 26th place. Uh, number 59, McLaren 29th of last year's winner, Jasmine Jafar. And looking further down the order, 35th is where you find the AM Cup winners, Pierre Arret and Rino Mastronardi. 55 starters, one excluded, and one or two of them retiring to the pits, one or two retiring with damage as well. Uh, we had a clutch problem, for example, for number five. The Black Falcon Mercedes had that lengthy stop-go penalty and was withdrawn. There was further drama for the Garage 59 McLaren after having been in the gravel earlier on. And then after the top 48 in the timing, Nathaniel Berton was another one badly delayed after a stop-go. Number 32 ended up in the gravel, 48 fell out of the reckoning. Number 75 disappeared relatively early, really, after a decent first hit by Frank Stippler. Johnny Kane had his big accident and we're glad that he is OK. The number 16 Mercedes was a retirement and triple three excluded for ignoring that black flag. And so it's going to be the uh, AM Cup drivers that step forward first of all. Number 36, third in class for David Scheitz, Henry Valkenhorst and the third driver of the car, Matthias Henkeler. Then for second place, the uh, Kessel Racing Ferrari combination of Marco Zanottini, Jack Driver and David Perel. But with the winning drivers about to make their way forward in the AM Cup, it's a win for Rinaldi Racing for Pierre Eret and Rino Mastronardi. The two driver combination defeats the three drivers and Rinaldi Racing victorious in the AM Cup for Pierre Eret and Rino Mastronardi. So the winning drivers in the AM Cup on the podium and Rino Mastronardi and Pierre Eret making up really for the disappointment of Monza where it was an engine problem that uh, cost them a chance of a finish and so the trophies go to Henry Valkenhorst, to Matthias Henkeler and to the third driver of the car which is David Schweitz after uh, a good drive to get on the podium. Nice variety as well, having the BMW in the AM Cup, rather than it just being Ferrari dominated. Uh, then Jet Driver gets his trophy 
the, uh, the spectacled Belgian driver for third in the Ancup. Great first hit by David Perel in that car. And uh, Marco Zamatini will receive his trophy as well. And then you've got Reno Mastronardi and the stockier frame of Pierre Arret on the top step of the podium. Reno Mastronardi doing uh, a very good job in that car to build up a healthy advantage early on. But first of all, there is the team's award that goes the way of Rinaldi Racing. And then the winning drivers will receive their trophies as well. And of course, there is also the uh, money, the checks that go to the season long entrance. There's the Rompan clock to the winning team. And now the trophies go to Reno Mastronardi and then to Pierre Arret, the winners of the AM Cup in the second Blanc Pan GT Series Endurance Cup race of the year. And after not being able to get to the end, having led for so long at Monza, this must be a very sweet result indeed. And so now the checks are presented by Sophie Pera from SRO, and the checks will be held aloft. And 15,000 euros to one, and 10,000 to another. As I say, season-long entrants get the uh, money rather than the one-off entrants. And now, as befit gentlemen racers, they sprint away rather than take each other with the champagne. Except if you're a BMW combination where you're on the podium perhaps unexpectedly, and there is some fun to be had. So from the AM Cup, Pro-Am will be next. So the podium is now dressed ready for the uh, Pro-Am drivers. And again, British teams doing very well, just as they did at Monza, uh, with uh, a 1-2 for British teams. And very shortly, there will be the Aka ASP Mercedes crew for third, the TS Sport Aston Martin crew for second, and the Barwell Lamborghini team for the top step, with the trophies being made ready. And the engineers receiving their cars at the end of the race once they've been through uh, scrutineering. I have nothing else to do at the moment, so they might as well go and stand at the foot of the podium and get ready. There, the Silverstone wing that looms over Club Corner, which is used, of course, for some events, including the Grand Prix. But the traditional start and finish area is preferred for Blanc Pain. As far as Pro-Am Championship is concerned, uh, despite the exclusion today, Alexander Matchell and Daniel Karlwitz lead, taking into account the sprint and endurance races. Uh, then you've got Jules Gounard ahead of Jean-Luc Bobelic and Mikhail Bronizewski. Pity Veron Bakhti and Carlo Van Dam that we see really in the Sprint Cup only. They're next ahead of Ahmad Ahafi and Johnny Adam, who we see in endurance only. Then Giacomo Piccini next from Jean-Philippe Belloc and Christophe Bure. Different drivers, even though it's the same teams, but a number of different drivers for Sprint uh, compared to endurance. But disappointment today, Alexander Matchell, Daniel Karlwitz and Renat Salikov being excluded after ignoring that black flag for ignoring a drive-through penalty. So, we have for the Pro-Am podium, out first, Nico Bastien in the Aka ASP Mercedes, joined by Jean-Luc Bobelic and Jules Gounon. We have for second place, Ahmed Alhafi and Johnny Adam, and we have Martin Kodrich there, Adrian Amstutz and Patrick Kuyela, the winners in Pro-Am. Pro-Am honours Silverstone to Patrick Kuyla, Martin Kodrich and Adrian Amstutz as Mark Lemmer there representing the winning team. Bauer Motorsport stands on the far left of the podium. The trophy is presented then to Jean-Luc Bobelic, Jules Gounon and Nico Bastien. Third in the end in Pro-Am. Jules Gounon, all smiles, very quick driver in German GT racing as well. And it is uh, Nicola de Wilton, the Blanc Pound brand manager of the UK, who hands over the trophies. Then Ahmed Ahafi and Johnny Adam take second this time out. Pro Am winners Patrick Kuyla, Martin Kodrich, and Adrian Amstutz.
The Blancpain clock and team trophy goes to Mark Lemmer and to the three winning drivers. The trophies are about to be brought forward, but an excellent job by Barwell today and yesterday, as I said earlier on, two race wins in the Blancpain GT Sports Club yesterday, so Barwell can go away from Silverstone very happy indeed with its weekend's work. Adrian Amstutz, who drove with Patrick Kuyela last year in Lamborghini Super Trofeo, new to the championship this year. So too Martin Kodrich, who was one of the rivals to uh, Adrian Amstutz last season. But it's all gelled very nicely as uh, Patrick Kuyela, part of Lamborghini Squadron Corsa's factory programme, installed in the car and takes the win. Now checks being presented. 15,000 goes to Acker ASP. Anybody else for any money? I think that's it for the season-long entries across both championships. You see, that's how you get the loot. And Ahmad al Hafi scarpers from the podium as the celebrations can begin. But what a race, John. So competitive across, well, not just every class, every position. I mean, I think it's one of the most combative, exciting, just, and, and the traffic management really being key and, and trying to thread your way through the back markers. But just some of the close wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing and bearing in mind, drivers are under the cars this weekend to behave and understand that we, we can't just drive into cars, be them AMs, pro-AMs or pro-cars. And I think everybody did an outstanding job. There were a couple of moments, but fundamentally, yes. a great, great event. And anybody who was here this weekend at Silverstone has to say that was fantastic. GT racing at its best. And... Uh, Christian Engelhart, Mirko Bortolotti and Andrea Caldarelli will shortly make their way to the podium. The flag flies atop the British Racing Drivers Club's clubhouse as we confirm how we stand in the championship now. If you take both endurance and sprint together, Mirko Bortolotti and Christian Engelhart having the advantage over Maxi Buk and Franck Pereira at the end of what has been another superb race in the Blancpain GT Series here at Silverstone. A win for Lamborghini at the end of three hours of non-stop action. So the drivers for the Pro Cup, or the overall podium, effectively, will be now making their way forward once everybody's in the right place. Regulation Pirelli caps adorn the heads. And so number 90 Mercedes for Raffaele Marchiello for Michael Meadows and for Eduardo Mortara. The drivers will step forward on cue. Out they come, led by Raf, Raffaele Marciello, Michael Meadows and then Eduardo Mortara. For second place overall, Jimmy Erickson, Maxi Book and Frank Pereira in the HTP Motorsport Mercedes AMG GT3. And then yet again, the top step of the podium I've actually got a gold card account with it now from so many victories this year for GRC Grasser Racing Team, the Lamborghini Huracan drivers of Christian Engelhart, Mirko Bortolotti and Andrea Caldarelli will step forward. Race winners overall at Silverstone. Out come the winning drivers. Christian Engelhart richly deserves the big cheer that goes up having withstood all of that pressure in that last stint. And so, so close was it. Maximilian Book at the end of the race, 0.344 of a second behind. I mean, I was down in the waiting in Park Ferme and I heard over the radio, it came across the line probably with just maybe a couple of seconds, and there's one more lap. It had been announced on the screen that it would be the final lap, but it was a bit previous that. There was time enough for one more, and Maxi Book had another chance, but it was not quite enough to uh, wrestle the lead away from those drivers Andrea Caldarelli, Mirko Bortolotti, and Christian Engelhardt. Winners at Silverstone. The Grassa Racing team has done it once again. And Andrea Caldarelli doing a good middle stint. Mirko Bortolotti handed the car over in the lead and Christian Engelhart brought it home. Great teamwork from the three young drivers. Yeah, I mean, I think that the overall standard of GT3 racing in the Blancpain Sprint and Endurance Championships is just, just every season getting better and better. And if you look at the podium, every one of those drivers is outstanding and they all did a great job. I mean, pressure for all of them at every part of the three-hour event and I just really respect mm. the level of commitment and the pace that they, they delivered throughout the day. The trophy is handed to the drivers 
and the winning team representative as well for Grasser Racing Team. There's going to be the trophy, there's going to be the Blancpain clock, and lots of cheers for that from all of the GRT engineers in the pit lane. And then we'll get to the winning drivers. Victory at Silverstone to Andrea Caldarelli, to Mirko Bortolotti, and Christian Engelhart. Trophies presented, and when Christian gets his trophy, now they can hold them in the air, receive the cheers. Winners of the second Endurance Cup race. Three hours of non-stop drama. We've got six hours next, and then 24, because it's Paul Ricard and then Spa, the next two endurance rounds. Now Sophie Perra arrives, having uh, taken over Czech presenting duties from Elsa Camilleri, and the money goes to the third, the second, and the overall teams because they are registered for the whole season in both sprint and endurance, and that's how you get these bonus checks. So that'll just about sort out the mechanics bar bill at the end of the night, I think, after a staunch effort from the GRT engineers. I mean, they've done a brilliant job. I mean, they are the dominant car team driver pairings and I mean I just how long can they continue to do so the next round will be a sprint round in, in uh, Zolder the beginning of June and that's on a, a circuit an old school circuit not mm. dissimilar in many respects to Brands Hatch the next round for the endurance championship will be in June at the Paul Ricard circuit and that's a day nighttime race charismatic fantastic atmosphere and of course perfect preparation for then going into at the end of July the Spa 24 hours, that unique GT challenge, toughest GT challenge event, in my view, in the world. Can't wait for that. Paul Rickard's going to be good, and Zolder is a sprint venue looking forward to as well. Well, what a race it has been. Three hours of non-stop drama. We don't promise you three hours of highlights, but there's an awful lot to leave out because so much happened. Let's look at the best, best bits. It all started with 55 cars pouring their way out of Cops Corner after an extra formation lap for a slightly untidy first attempt at the start. But the battles raged. Mercedes versus Ferrari. Drama early on. Michael Bronizewski being knocked into a spin by Stefan Richelmi. Just getting through the middle was Giorgio Maggi, but that resulted in a five-minute stop-go penalty for the... Audi and further drama, Alexander West, who started from the pit lane anyway, ended up uh, in the gravel and that brought out a full course yellow that was converted to a safety car. Battle rejoined after the green flag with Mirko Bortolotti pulling away, but it wasn't long before we ended up with another interruption to the race. Another full course yellow came, but in the midst of all of the dramas, Bat Marcus had to get out of the way, faster cars pounding through traffic everywhere and some fabulous racing. Ahmed Al-Hafi, for example, getting caught a little bit at Cops, just wasn't room to turn into the corner. But then there was this drama going through the kink at Maggots towards Beckett's as Johnny Kane went off. There was contact with the Mercedes and a huge impact into the wall. The best news being that Johnny was OK. Full course yellow then became a safety car period. And depending on when you pitted, the race order shuffled greatly. When we got back to green flag conditions in a big hurry was the charging Jimmy Erickson. He'd taken over from Frank Pereira. He worked his way up past the spirit of race Ferrari and then set about Christian Engelhart's uh, Lamborghini then at the time being driven by Andrea Caldarelli. He squeezed up the inside going through Lafield and set off in pursuit of the race leading Mercedes of Michael Meadows who was doing a fabulous job of withstanding the pressure no matter who threw it at him. The cars ran together still picking their way through traffic battles all the way through the field and the leading five cars in one long line all came in to serve the last stop at the same time but an excellent pit stop by the GRT team put the Lamborghini into the lead and it dropped 84 Mercedes down to third place they were a couple of seconds slower on that pit stop so what could happen in the final part of the race well one aspect was the Jaguars of the Lawrence Frey team working their way up the order another was Raffaele Marchiello chasing down Christian Engelhart but then Maxi Buch got into his stride and found a way up past the red Mercedes diving into Brooklands and having done so he set off in pursuit of Engelhart they turned their way towards Luffield but then Book lost chunks of time stuck behind the second of the Barwell Lamborghinis. That gave Engelhart breathing space, but it wasn't long before Book chipped away and brought the gap right down as they worked their way up towards the timing line. The chequered flag flew with three tenths of a second between them. Lamborghini victorious at Silverstone in the second Endurance Cup race of the season. A wonderful GT race here at the home of British Motor Racing. Thanks for your company for now. From John Watson and David Addison, bye-bye.